Well, thank, uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Kelly Oskvig. I'm a senior program officer for the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academies, and um, and I'm the study director for this study. Um, let's see. I think we can do next slide. Um, okay, so. Uh, for virtual meeting participants, um, the logistics here are to mute, your, mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, we had a few more sound issues there. Um, and uh, to use the raise hand function um, for Q&A in the Zoom to ask questions. Um, and we ask everyone to you know, have your camera on when you um, are speaking and um, kind of support an inclusive community with those of us, those that are joining us remotely. Um, next slide. Let's see. Okay. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with the National Academies or our processes, um, I'll give you a one minute overview. So we're a, a private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the US to solve complex problems and inform public policy and decisions related to science, technology and medicine. Uh, we were first established um, by Abraham Lincoln in 1863. Um, so today's the second meeting of the Committee on the Evaluation of Hydrodynamic Modeling and Implications for Offshore Wind Development for Nantucket Shoals Region. This work is sponsored by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, referred to as BOEM. Um, and we've assembled a committee of nine volunteers who were chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task, which you'll hear more about in a few minutes. Um, next slide. Um, and to accomplish this work, the committee will hold four meetings for the purposes of public information gathering, like today, um, deliberation, report writing, and, and response to our peer review. The result of all this work will be a peer-reviewed report uh, representing the consensus view of the committee. The report is expected to be released to the public in the fall of 2023. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. Um, we do have a, a public project website um, that includes information about past and upcoming events, um, and I'll post a link to the website in the chat in just a minute. Uh, next slide, please. And so before we begin, we want to have a brief safety moment. Um, this is easy for the people um, that are joining us in person. Um, we are on the, the first floor of the Keck building. So um, if there is an emergency, you exit exactly the way that you came in. <laughs> so just go down this hallway, take a right. Um, and then our, our meeting place is um, in, the, in the lawn of the building museum across the street. And you'll see um, masses hurting that way. Um, and then also, if you need to use restroom, it, that's on your way as well. So just take a right down the hall and there's a ladies and men's room. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So hybrid meeting uh, logistics again. So this is a true hybrid meeting. Um, many people are here with us today in DC and several people are joining us remotely from uh, wherever they happen to be. Um, so in order to promote an inclusive environment, we are asking everyone in the um, and in the DC office to turn on their Zooms um, and use their camera when they're speaking. Um, please uh, turn off your audio when you're not speaking. Um, the folks in the room, uh, you need to make sure your computer audio is off, which I think we've got <laughs> we've got down now. Um, and then virtual participants, you know, we ask that you also mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, and all participants, please just use the raise hand function again, like I, I said earlier. Um, and I think that's all I have. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's jump into the meeting. So I'll introduce our committee chair now, um, sitting next to me, uh, Dr. Eileen Hoffman. She um, is a pr professor and eminent scholar in the Department of Ocean and Earth Sciences and a member of the Center for Coastal Physical Oceanography, both, uh, both at Old Dominion University. Her research interests are in the areas of physical biological interactions and in marine ecosystems, environmental control and transmission of marine diseases and descriptive physical oceanography. Eileen has served on several committees at the National Academy Academies, um, and we are very pleased to have her leading this study. The floor is yours, Eileen. Okay, that works. All right, so we're all lined up here. So anyway, thank you, Kelly. 
And um, it is definitely my pleasure to welcome everyone here and thank you for making the time and effort to be here. This is an important uh, committee and the task of this committee is shown here on the slide. Um, so the objective of the study is to understand the potential effects of offshore fixed bottom wind turbine generators on marine hydrodynamics and the resulting impacts on marine mammals specifically the North Atlantic right whale prey. Um, and the three focus areas for the committee are shown on this slide here. I'm not gonna read them to you. You can, you can look at them and they're available on the website that Kelly um, mentioned earlier. So I hope everyone had an opportunity to look at the agenda for the meeting. Um, so this, this meeting uh, is structured to provide inputs to the three focus areas shown on the slide here. And what we're going to do, we're going to start with the current state of understanding of hydrodynamics and prey resources in the Nantucket Shoals region. Um, we're going to get inputs and lessons from our European colleagues about their experiences with offshore wind energy um, development. And then uh, next we'll have an overview of the models that are used to simulate hydrodynamic conditions and, uh, and look at the effects of turbines on the wind field. And then we'll end with a perspective from our industry partners. So we have a real packed agenda to get through today. And um, so we'll go ahead and get started. But before we do that, I'd like to um, have the committee and members uh, and the invited speakers for today introduce themselves as well as our sponsors. And I think I'll start with the people on the Zoom, uh, Zoom um, on, on Zoom here. And if I can do that, um, should I turn my camera on to do this? Yeah, um, okay, so what I'm gonna, yeah, there we go, now I can see. All right, so what I'm gonna do is ask the people on Zoom to please introduce yourself um, first, and then we'll introduce the people sitting in the in the room here. All right, so uh, if we start here, um, all right, I'll just look at people on my screen here. Um, um, Ariana Zampolo, please, which if you would briefly introduce yourself. And I'm just gonna ask you to say your name, your affiliation, and maybe less than one sentence about your expertise. Okay, because we have a lot of introductions to get through. Okay. Yes. So hi everyone, um, I'm Mariana Zampolo. I am from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, the UK. Uh, I represent Professor Brett Scott Group um, and I did my PhD in um, like investigating the effect, effect of offshore wind farms on primary production in the Scottish Earth Walking. Hey, thank you. Um, I think Goran, Goran Barstrom. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Jaron Brostrom. I'm a professor in physical oceanography at the Department of Marine Science in the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. I do work on uh, uh, wind. I have worked a little bit on wind farm and uh, that it might create uppling. Otherwise, I work with uh, near shore dynamics and also surface waves is some, some of my interest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff mm -hmm. Runge. Hi, I'm Je Jeffrey Runge. I um, am a professor in the School of Marine Sciences at the University of Maine. Um, my, I guess my research specialty is in zooplankton ecology. I, I worked with uh, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada for many years in the Quebec region and um, before coming to the University of Maine. Um, and I've um, spent a lot of my career studying um, the dyna population dynamics of, of uh, copepods, and especially Calanus species. And um, I'm uh, presently a science advisor for the Niracruz Integrated Sentinel, Sentinel Monitoring Network time series stations, which I'll report on um, later today. Hey, thank you. Um, Nick Record, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Record. I'm a senior scientist at Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, which is up in Maine. I direct the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting there, and I'm an ecosystem modeler mainly. I do work on a wide variety of things, including right whales, their prey, and underlying physics. And I'm also a member of uh, the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Team at, at, 
of uh, the NOAA convenes or the fisheries fishery service convenes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see who's here. Uh, Tom Kilpatrick, please. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not on the panel, but I'm on the committee. Um, I work at BOEM. I'm, my background's in uh, it's like physical oceanography, satellite, um, working with satellites and with models. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let's see, Ute Dawa. Dawa? Yeah, hi. Um, Ute Dewe. I am from the Heimatzentrum Hirion in Germany. I am uh, working in marine ecosystem modeling on all kinds of problems, um, lower traffic levels, but also higher traffic levels and level fish drift. And lately, I've been working quite a bit on human use impacts on coastal marine ecosystems and among others, also offshore wind developments and how they affect the physics and the ecosystems in the um, European waters. And I will present that later today. Hey, thank you. Um, York, Bro yeah, Brokama. Oh, you're here. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm getting confused here with names. So, um, Ole uh, Peters is here as well. Yep. Okay. So, I think we've hit everybody on Zoom. I think. Have I missed anyone? Okay. Then I think we'll start here. And will we start at the end of the table over there to just introduce yourself and go around? Okay. First of all, I, so my name is Jeff Carpenter. I'm not on the Zoom because I'm. It, I guess. Um, would, you, would you please turn on your microphone so the people can hear? My name is Jeff Carpenter. I'm a physical oceanographer from the Helmholtz Center Herion in Germany, and I specialize in um, smaller scale ocean physics and especially turbulence. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jorik Broekema. I'm a senior researcher at Deltaris and a team lead of our offshore engineering uh, market team. And my own primary expertise is on uh, local hydromorphodynamics, mainly related to sky or sky protection. Good morning. I'm Jim Chen from uh, Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, I'm a professor in, of civil environmental engineering, doing uh, coastal modeling in general. Uh, good morning, Seth Kaplan. Let's do, do the polite thing, turn on my video. Uh, Seth Kaplan, uh, Director of Government and Regulatory Affairs at Ocean Winds, with, uh, which Ariana will recognize as the folks with the projects in the Firth of Moray in Scotland. Um, and uh, I uh, previously was at Conservation Law Foundation for uh, almost 20 years and um, now with uh, Ocean Winds, which is uh, a offshore wind developer working on both coasts of the United States and many places around the world. My name is Hang Sun Chen, come from University of Massachusetts. So I have been working on the offshore wind farm since 2014 for the bond, you know, funded the project. Uh, we had a Northeast forecast system operation for US Coast Guard. So we also get a NOVA supporting working on the offshore wind farm modeling. Yeah. Len Gorkowitz, I'm from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and I'm a physical oceanographer. Maybe. Welcome. Um, I'm Mary Boatman. I'm with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. I'm also the contracting officer's representative of Government East for this particular effort. And I want to say thank you, a huge thank you to all of you for your time and your effort and your energy in this. I know it's fast paced and we're asking a lot and I appreciate that you're all doing this voluntarily. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Yes, I'll keep going. Uh, Brian Hooker, uh, also with BOEM, and echo Mary's uh, thanks for being here. Hi, I'm Julia Singer. I'm a marine scientist with Oceana who works on North Atlantic right whales. Hi, I'm Jackie Schaff. I'm a Knauss Fellow at the Marine Mammal Commission, so just here observing today. 
Hi, my name is Emily Hildreth, and I'm with the policy group in BOEM's Office of Renewable Energy Programs as an observer. Thanks. Hi, I'm Joe Brody. Uh, I'm a physical oceanographer and meteorologist, and I'm with the environmental consulting firm AKRF. Hi, I'm Erin Meyer Gutbrod. I'm from the University of South Carolina, and I research the impacts of changes in prey availability on right whale demography and distribution. Hello, everyone. Uh, Laura Morse with Invenergy. I'll be speaking um, toward the end of the session and developer session. Hi, I'm Kaus Raghu Kumar with uh, Integral Consulting. Uh, my, my background is in ocean acoustics and physical oceanography. Uh, most recently, I've been working um, uh, on uh, effects of off floating offshore wind on upwelling circulation in California. Good morning, everyone. Josh Kohut with Rutgers University. I'm a physical oceanographer, and my research is really applying ocean observing technologies and models to uh, understand dynamic habitats of different species. And is that live? Okay. I'm Richard Merrick, and I, by training, I'm a biological oceanographer. Uh, I just, I retired in 2017 from NOAA Fisheries as the chief scientist, which I was there here in DC for five years. But prior to that, and one of the reasons I moved to Woods Hole from Alaska was to deal with right whales. So for the last, since 1997, I've been working with North Atlantic right whales. I'm also on the large whale take reduction team which is really focused on right whales, and I'm co-chair of the Lank Scientific Review Group, which is the MMPA acquired body that reviews all marine mammal stock assessments on this coast. Right whales have been a major focus of that group, but other species that are affected by wind farm are also of interest. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tom Johnson. I'm a Chief Operations Officer for the Americas for DHI Water and Environment. I'm the uh, project manager for uh, the ongoing project for BOEM, looking at uh, looking at the cumulative impacts of offshore wind farms from North Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina border up to uh, New York Bight area. And I was also the project manager on the previous study, um, which was focused on the Massachusetts, Rhode Island area. We did the hydrodynamics and then also looked at uh, impacts on sea scallops, silver hake, and uh, summer flounder, and we're continuing that kind of work with this new study. My name is Ole Sønstrup Peterson. There's an echo somewhere. My name is Ole, Ole Svensson Peters and I come from DHI or Danish Hydraulic Institute. It was in the old days. I'm principal engineer in the our wet ocean department uh, and I've been working with offshore wind for the last uh, many, many 20 years or so, uh, mainly as a as a modeler, development of models and application of models. And I'm also a scientist on the project that we work on for BOEM that Tom is leading. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Doug Nowacek. I'm a, a professor at Duke University in the School of the Environment and the Engineering School. I uh, uh, I also lead the um, Wildlife and Offshore Wind Project that's supported by uh, by DOE and BOEM. Um, that's mm -hmm. focused on the potential impacts of offshore wind development on marine mammals, seabirds, and and bats. Uh, and my area of study is bioacoustics and behavioral ecology of of uh, mostly large whales, but certainly spent a lot of time uh, with North Atlantic right whales. Good morning, I'm Christina Archer. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware in the departments of geography and special sciences and mechanical engineering. I'm also the director of the Center for Research in Wind, and I'm here to talk about uh, uh, wakes in the atmosphere uh, from wind farms. Okay, I think that's everyone. Have we missed anyone on Zoom or? in here okay so thank you all again for making the time to be here and for your um your contributions to this fact finding activity by the committee um i think we'll go ahead and um get started with our agenda jump right into it 
And the first presentation we have today will be from Glenn Gorkowitz, who is uh, a senior scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic. He's an expert in coastal oceanography, particularly with frontal dynamics and observations and modeling of shelf break fronts. And so Glenn is going to talk to us about the oceanography of the Nantucket Shoals. So please. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, thank you, thank Eileen. you Eileen. Oop, oop. Need to remute myself. Okay, so let's see. And then do I hit share screen on the... Are you running your own uh, should I run my, my own? Okay. Uh, let's see. And where's the share screen button? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about the uh, oceanography uh, around Nantucket Shoals, uh, pretty much the, the uh, circulation um, uh, around New England, basically. And uh, the outline of the talk is as follows. I'll just give a quick introduction to the regional circulation. Uh, let's see, is the PowerPoint going to the people on Zoom? Oh, okay, okay, good. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, one of the biggest impacts, which is ocean warming in the region and marine heat waves. And I think relative to the uh, potential prey distributions, the biggest impact is changes in the stratification. And the stratification uh, is getting very, very complex because of an increase in Gulf Stream variability. And I'll also talk about a very important physical process uh, mid-depth salinity maximum intrusions that, that is very much affecting the uh, stratification and also bringing species from offshore. Uh, then um, uh, finally, I'd like to talk about something that was very, very disconcerting in 2021. Uh, uh, my research is really focused on shelf break processes, and we saw a massive displacement of the shelf break front uh, more than 50 kilometers offshore that lasted for more than five months. And it, it drastically affected the ecosystem, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I work very closely with the commercial fishing industry in southern New England and heard about all sorts of impacts there. But it's something that, that I'm not sure has been fully appreciated. Okay. Uh, this, this is the, the larger scale circulation. I'll zoom into Nantucket Shoals in the next slide. Uh, uh, and this is a figure on the left from Paula Frat and Tony. And there's really two major current systems that are in the region. Uh, the Gulf Stream, uh, uh, their western boundary current, very large, huge transport, important in the, uh, uh, the global transport of heat there. But another really important current system is the, the shelf break jet uh, that runs along the edge of the continental shelf. And you can trace that all the way back up to the Labrador Sea. It's a continuous feature there. And uh, on the right-hand side is a climatology that, that uh, my old student, Chris Linder, uh, uh, put together. That's 100 years worth of uh, data averaged in the cross shelf there. And uh, uh, the, the front is normally uh, uh, positioned with its foot where it intersects the bottom around the 100-meter isobath south of New England. And typical temperature differences are four to six degrees centigrade there. And in the lower panel, you can see that the, the uh, mean salinity field, and by the way, that's in the summertime, that's why you see the, uh, the thermocline there, uh, but typical salinity differences were uh, 2.0, but, but um, uh, as we'll see, that, that gradient has increased dramatically in the last 20 years. If we zoom into uh, uh, the area around Nantucket Shoals, this is the upstream circulation uh, here. And uh, back around 2006, 2007, when we had a, a sparkly brand new Remus 100 autonomous underwater vehicle, we did a bunch of surveys and actually mapped out the uh, 
uh, outer Cape coastal current that runs down past Chatham there. And then just north of Nantucket Shoals, the, uh, uh, the flow bifurcates there uh, with one branch heading across the northern edge of, of uh, George's Bank and uh, another branch heading down the uh, western portion of the Great South Channel there. And uh, that coastal current has a typical velocity of 20 to 30 centimeters a second there. It's an important uh, uh, pathway. And uh, I, I can't resist uh, uh, mentioning uh, Chen's work uh, back for the Scopex experiment uh, on the northern edge of uh, uh, Great South Channel there in the late 1980s, I believe. Uh, there, that, that certainly had a, a big influence on how I look at the region. And, and by the way, that uh, in the lower right, that photo shows uh, uh, how much we had to learn about launch and recovery of uh, autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, I did regrettably show that figure once to a room full of Navy SEALs, and uh, I was worried that they injured themselves laughing, actually. Uh, okay, so uh, my entire career can basically be encapsulated in this one cartoon. I'm always careful not to delete it uh, uh, there, but um, shelf break, uh, processes are very complex. Uh, one of the important things is that there's a persistent upwelling at the shelf break, and that occurs even in the absence of wind forcing. It's really due to bottom boundary layer convergence, and typical upwelling rates are between 10 and 20 meters a day there. The upwelling feeds right into the center of the shelf break jet. You can see uh, the, the ice attacks, the, the U-shaped things near the surface. The jet itself is normally about 50 meters thick there. And uh, the jet is frequently affected by warm core rings uh, uh, immediately offshore. The warm core rings have typical vertical scales of 500 to 1,000 meters. So they don't get onto the continental shelf, but I'll show you how they are really affecting the stratification recently. I'll be talking uh, a little bit later about the mid-depth salinity maximum intrusions uh, that go in centered typically at a depth of about 20 meters during the stratified season. And uh, uh, hopefully I convince, can convince you that these processes have been changing quite a bit in terms of frequency and intensity. I won't be talking about it today, but we're also getting significant bottom intrusions uh, uh, that are linked to wind forcing, those can go 100 kilometers across the continental shelf there and get all the way up to Block Island, south of New England. Okay, two things have really shaped how I look at the recent oceanographic changes in the region. Uh, the first was the National Science Foundation Ocean Observatories Initiative Pioneer Array uh, uh, that was out between 2015 and 2022. That was a process-oriented shelf break observatory. It involved uh, gliders, uh, uh, seven different mooring sites, uh, and, and periodic autonomous underwater vehicle surveys there. I actually led the team that designed the observatory there, although it was not a part of, of uh, uh, any of the operations uh, there. But that ha has really, really shaped how I see the changing nature of the shelf break processes. And as a direct result of the uh, public hearings about the Pioneer Array and the permitting process, I was put into uh, very close contact with the commercial fishing industry. Uh, 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 we were able to convince them that this was a worthwhile endeavor. And uh, we ended up actually forming a shelf research fleet where fishing vessels collect uh, uh, temperature and salinity profiles since 2014. Uh, as of last week, uh, uh, fishing vessels had collected 818 profiles. This is particularly important during the pandemic when UNOL's vessels were not out uh, sampling there. And one of the most important aspects of this interaction has been uh, uh, twice a year meetings, and there's a photograph in the lower right. I go in and talk about the oceanographic conditions and then hear from the fishers about what the actual fishing conditions have been. So I get practically up to the minute reports on what's going on uh, uh, with the different catches. Okay. So ocean warming, uh, the time that, that it really, really hit me right on the face was, it was in a cruise in May of 2012, and we were doing some work just north of Cape Hatteras. 
And there was no temperature gradient across the shelf break front. It should have been five degrees C. We had a five degrees C warm anomaly. And I said, something weird is going on here. We were looking for uh, uh, a specific fish, uh, uh, butterfish and bluefish for uh, a program on fish school scattering and they weren't there at all. It was only warm water fish that we were seeing. So I got back, I had a, a postdoc who had just arrived at Woods Hole. I said, let's look into this. Uh, and that was Ka Chen, who's a scientist at Woods Hole now. This is a figure he made of the uh, mean temperature anomalies for March of 2012 uh, uh, there. There uh, was a maximum anomaly of six degrees centigrade. And as you can see, it was warm over the whole area. Ka was able to figure out that the jet stream did not bring cold air down in the fall until six weeks later. And so heat loss from the ocean was 50% less than usual that winter, which led directly to six month temperature anomalies in the Gulf of Maine at 1.7 degrees C, Nantucket Shoals 2.1 degrees C, Long Island 2.6 and Chesapeake Bay mouth 2.6. And again, when we were out in May, it was a five degree C warm anomaly. And this was the first time it really hit me in the face how extensive these warming processes really were. Now, uh, I think uh, an important topic in recent years uh, uh, particularly for marine ecology, uh, is marine heat waves. And briefly, uh, that's when you have uh, temperature anomalies that are in the 90th percentile or above that last more than five days there. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a nice paper by uh, Hendrik uh, Grosselindemann, an undergraduate from Germany, and his supervisor Svenja Ryan at Woods Hole, on the left-hand panel uh, shows the warming rates from the optimally interpolated SST fields from NOAA there. And I just wanna draw your attention to how the continental slope is, has the highest warming rates there, along with the axis of the Gulf Stream coming out at Cape Hatteras there. And, and I'll return to the, the changes in that upper slope uh, quite a bit there. On the right-hand side in the, the upper uh, uh, panel there is the number of days per year uh, within marine heat wave conditions over the uh, continental shelf south of New England. And uh, uh, that uh, largest value there is actually 2012, but, but uh, 2016 is the next peak over to the right. And uh, this starts in 1982, and you can see from about 1982 to 2000, the marine heat waves are very intermittent. But uh, uh, since about 2010, they've really increased. And I just want to uh, point out, there was a wonderful paper about two years ago by Afonso Neto and her advisor, Jamie Poulter, on how the Labrador uh, 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 seawater is not getting around the tail of the Grand Banks as effectively, and that's led to a lot of warming. That's an important paper, uh, Neto et al. I think it was 2021. Okay, now uh, for the purposes uh, of this committee, uh, I think stratification is very important. And uh, I've been working with the Sea Education Association for many years. I was actually the uh, science coordinator for the joint program orientation cruises. Uh, so it's fun doing oceanography with a sailing vessel. And so when the students come into the program, uh, uh, they go out for anywhere from seven to nine days. And uh, um, so uh, we ended up doing a U-shaped uh, 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 pattern uh, right at the shelf break south of New England there. And uh, and this is results over 11 years. Uh, and this was a paper uh, that Ben Harden led, uh, an SEA scientist. On the, the left-hand uh, side is the, the means. On the right-hand side of the panels uh, there on the left are the standard deviations. Uh, I, I just want to focus on the, the changes in the density. Um, and so in the, the two panels on the right-hand side, uh, that red area arrow on the top left points to the near surface. And over those 11 years, uh, uh, the, the arrow on the right-hand side shows the trend, linear trend there. Uh, the, the surface density, potential density is decreasing by 0.12 kilograms per meter cube per year, which I think is pretty amazing. 
Uh, it, at a, about 50 meters depth, the rate is about half of that. And then down at 150 meters, it's about an order of magnitude down from the surface. But that, that is really a, a very high rate. And then uh, I mentioned the Pioneer Array earlier. That's been really, really important because it's had continuous time series there over seven years. And uh, I have a PhD student, Lucas Lober, who's working closely with that to look at high wind events. But he made a, a nice plot for me uh, uh, on the right-hand side of the surface density and the density at 69 meters depth within the last several years. And uh, uh, you can see in the red there with the surface potential density uh, in um, uh, 2020 there, it got as low as about 21.4 sigma theta there. And you can see the enormous spread in that uh, August, September time period in terms of the, the, the minimum surface density there. There's just enormous interannual variability there. And to give uh, some idea of the complexity of the, the stratification, I was out on a cruise in, in September of 2022. Uh, uh, we were uh, looking at those salinity maximum intrusions in the lower left, are uh, a number of the um, uh, uh, vertical uh, profiles of density. Uh, and on the right-hand side is the buoyancy frequency. And you can see how complex that, that uh, N-squared uh, uh, is right there. And, and uh, it, it, as we'll see next, it's the influence of, of the offshore forcing that is really making the, the stratification very complex. So, uh, in, in thinking about models, uh, uh, and, and I'll have three different uh, thoughts on challenges uh, uh, there are, uh, can the models accurately describe the interannual variations in the peak stratification? Because these are large. These are one and a half to two sigma theta there from year to year. Can they capture the seasonal evolution of the stratification? And can they produce something like the trend in that decrease in surface density? And, and again, I think the last two years in particular, 2021 and 2022, you know, it's been particularly buoyant uh, 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 there at the surface. Okay, so uh, I've alluded to the Gulf Stream and its importance on the, on the continental shelf. And it's something that, that really has surprised me over the last last several years. So in 2013, we had a workshop that included members of the commercial fishing industry. Uh, this was really a follow-on to the uh, multi-use conflict negotiations over the Pioneer Array. And we heard from Fred Matera, who's, who's a legendary Rhode Island fisherman. He had a list of 10 observations that the fishing community just wanted to hear about from oceanographers and why it was happening. Number one was more Gulf Stream water on the continental shelf. I hadn't heard this from anybody. You know, this was the first time we heard it. We took that to heart. And uh, three years later, my colleague Magdalena Andres, looking at sea surface height anomaly fields, saw incredible differences between the mid-1990s and uh, 2014 in particular. Uh, and you can see in the panels on the left is the envelope of the 25 centimeter uh, uh, anomaly field there. And you can see that the Gulf Stream was relatively straight in 1995, but by 2014, uh, you can see that the, the meanders are much larger amplitude. They're getting much closer to the edge of the continental shelf there. And, and, and so the, the character has really changed. The Gulf Stream is more unstable. Uh, I, I should add that, that, I don't know if it's ironically or not, but the jet stream has also changed in the same manner. And Jennifer Francis's work has been you know, very important in, in how Arctic warming of the atmosphere is affecting mid-latitude weather. So uh, 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 my colleague, Avijit Gangopadai, uh, had a master's student uh, back in 2017. I knew about uh, uh, Magdalena's work there. And he did a climatology of warm core rings using the Jennifer Clark charts. And uh, 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 Avijit and his group found that the number of warm core rings generated by the Gulf Stream nearly doubled in the year 2000 there. It went from Eddy kinetic energy. Okay, now why should we care about that if we're worried about the continental shelf and, and about prey fields and about right whales? 
Well, it turns out that there's a process that's been known ab about since the 1930s. Uh, Bigelow, in, in his uh, classic book on, on uh, the Gulf of Maine, uh, actually talked about the, these profiles with a salinity maximum at mid-depth there. And there was a very nice paper uh, with a climatology of these intrusions in 2003 by my colleague, Steve Lentz. And he came up with a nice classification system to define these intrusions. Now they had not been mapped before. So everybody just has scattered profiles with these in them. Uh, but they're, they're uh, pretty pronounced uh, uh, when you come across them uh, there. And so uh, uh, at the start of the pandemic, in those blissful days before people discovered Zoom, I was uh, holed up in my daughter's bedroom and got to go through uh, 619 profiles one by one to characterize uh, these intrusions in the uh, shelf fleet data there. I should add one immediate difference right off the bat was that I had to use a delta S of 0.2 uh, PSU uh, as opposed to lenses 0.1 because there were so many intrusions in the profile with 0.1 I would have gone crazy. So one of the first things that jumped out, uh, this is the location of, of uh, profiles with the intrusions uh, uh, here. And uh, the, the, the sort of bluish green uh, are profiles with intrusions. And uh, uh, the uh, black dots are profiles with no intrusions. Uh, they're all the way up north of 41 degrees north. They are more than 100 kilometers inshore of the shelf break. And in the lens climatology, uh, they rarely got more than 30 kilometers inshore of the shelf break there. So these intrusions are getting all the way to the tidal mixing front uh, around Nantucket Shoals. And I had one uh, particular profile I'll never forget in August of 2018. We had a 10 meter thick layer practically on the beach at Martha's Vineyard of 36.0 uh, uh, PSU uh, uh, there. Unfortunately, the ship's engine exploded, so I wasn't able to map the feature, uh, which is one of my regrets, but that's field work. Now, uh, a direct consequence for uh, the prey fields, as these intrusions come in, 10% uh, of the profiles from the, the shelf fleet from the time period 2015 to 2019 had multiple intrusions. And this was the profile with the maximum number of intrusions. Uh, there's four of them above that 0 0.2 threshold there. And uh, I, I, I uh, regret that I don't have uh, a screenshot from a Simrad EK80 uh, acoustic backscatter system, but I've been out on cruises with the Neil Armstrong where you can see that the uh, zooplankton are in the different layers there. We had uh, uh, multiple layers. That was a cruise. Gareth Lawson is chief scientist in June of 2016 there. But I believe that when you get these intrusions with the, with the multiple layers there, it's definitely affecting the distribution of the prey fields there. And again, possibly reducing the concentration in an individual layer. And remember, I'm a physical oceanographer, not a biologist. So take what I say with some grain of salt. Uh, so now, uh, uh, how are these processes changing in frequency? Uh, this was one of the most surprising things. Uh, I was looking at the frequency in terms of percentage of profiles uh, uh, that had uh, a salinity maximum intrusion in them from the shelf fleet. And it turned out it's about 70% more frequent relative to the, uh, the lens numbers uh, uh, there. They only occur during the stratified season. You need to have the thermocline picnicline there for, to, for them to come. But in August and September, it's nearly 50% of the time you're seeing these intrusions. And so there is just uh, an incredible interplay between the continental slope water masses, uh, which frequently now are affected by rings and the continental uh, shelf. Uh, in the past, uh, it, it was a pretty much a uniform water mass. There was one nice sharp peak in the Brunt Visola frequency. The profiles were, were much simpler there. Uh, uh, and we are dealing with, with very, very messy stratification now. Uh, the other nice thing, because the fishing vessels are taking profiles every month, anywhere between seven and 24 profiles a month went into this. 
This is the year-to-year -year variability right here uh, in terms of that frequency. You can see that September 2019, 75% of the profiles actually had intrusions there. And then 2015, which was a year with very many warm core rings, uh, uh, there, there was 60% of the profiles, you know, throughout the stratified season had these kind of intrusions there. I should add, there was just a paper that appeared about two weeks ago by Adrian Silver, who's now a postdoc working with me. She showed that 72% of the uh, salinity maximum intrusions in Ecomon profiles occurred in uh, uh, proximity to warm core rings there. So we don't know the dynamics. Uh, we're working on that right now, but there's definitely a linkage to warm core rings. And so I, I think a second challenge, challenge is, can the hydrodynamic models capture the, the onshore advection of these offshore water masses and, and uh, uh, the organisms that are contained with them? And can they produce this kind of complex layering in temperature, salinity, and, and presumably ultimately prey fields that we're seeing in the observations? Okay, um, now uh, uh, this is uh, uh, for me as a shelf break processes uh, person, sort of the uh, horror story. Uh, I, I did three cruises in uh, 2021 uh, in uh, March, May, and June, and we also put out a long-range AUV in September of 2021. Uh, this is an image from the State of the Ecosystem report right here for the year 2021. In June of 2021, there were eight warm core rings out there. It was just remarkable. We did a cruise on the Neil Armstrong uh, the last two weeks of June and saw very strong salinity maximum intrusions there. But it wasn't until we did the long-range AUV mission in September uh, uh, there with Amy Kakulia's Cybotics Group that, that uh, got me to go and start looking in September at Pioneer Array data. And uh, this is the uh, salinity field from uh, the near-surface seven meters near-surface instrument frame. Uh, it's a time series of salinity, and it should be a straight line, just like the left of that plot from April until mid-June. It should be at 33. This is well inshore of the normal position of the front at seven meters depth. And it jumped up as high as 34.5 and stayed that high. Uh, we have taken a number of hydrographic sections during that time period. The shelf break front was at about the 50 meter isobath for the summer there. Um, looking at the uh, uh, National Data Buoy Center uh, temperature data, surface ocean temperature data uh, uh, there, uh, uh, on the, the left is the, the temperature. Uh, the light blue, by the way, is 2012. Red is 2021. Uh, uh, there was a six degree C warm anomaly in uh, uh, September of 2021 there. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I was just literally uh, astonished at, at how long the shelf break front stayed so far in shore. <clears throat> and then just as a schematic, this front should be at the edge of the continental shelf, and it was more than 50 kilometers onshore of its normal position. Now, because I'm in close contact with the commercial fishing industry, we were hearing, even while we were on the cruise, that bluefin tuna, which are normally in the canyons all summer and move inshore, very late August, first two weeks of September, they were off a of block island. They were inshore at the 30 meter isobath all summer. It turned out to be a windfall for the charter boat captains because they didn't have to go all the way out to the shelf break. They saved a lot of money on fuel there. Um, there were very unusual uh, species, cow-nosed rays, uh, cobia uh, uh, that were reported. Uh, fish that you might think of from the Carolinas or Florida were all over the outer continental shelf there. Uh, and perhaps, you know, the most worrisome thing for me was that I was hearing from uh, uh, the reports filtered through the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation that, uh, uh, that, that the, the fishers were reporting some of the largest marine mammal concentrations they had ever seen at the 50 meter isobath in the summer of 2021. So challenge number three, 
can the models capture these type of large onshore displacements of the shelf break front? I, I'll be working on that data and, and hopefully writing a manuscript by the end of the summer on that. I, I think that, that this, this has important implications. Similarly, when the front moves to mid shelf, does that change the gradients? Does that change the strength of the upwelling circulation? We need to, to really think about that. Clearly, it was concentrating marine organisms. By the way, there were traffic jams of, of uh, pleasure craft. There were so many humpback whales out there that everybody with a motorboat was going out to see them because they weren't that far offshore there. So it, it, it had all sorts of impacts there. Uh, and also, I want to point out, there's a very significant implication here. If the fronts at mid-shelf, the volume of shelf water coming down that goes into the cold pool must be a lot smaller. Again, this was over five months there. And so, you know, I would have expected like a volume transport of cold pool water to be reduced by at least 50% with the front moving that far inshore there. The major implication, these frontal displacements may move real concentrations of marine mammals to mid-shelf right in the heart of the, uh, uh, the offshore lease regions there. So, you know, that's why I'm so glad I was given the opportunity to come here and speak because I think this is something that's not, people are not generally aware of. Finally, uh, the last two weeks, I'm, I'm part of a group that's uh, informally called the Squid Squad, and uh, we have weekly meetings during the fishing season to, to talk about how oceanographic variability relates to uh, particularly the short fin squid catch. And we were contacted by Chris Orphanides because he was saying, uh, oh, there's some interesting right whale distributions uh, going on right now. You know, can you give us some thought about hydrographic sampling? Uh, from whalemap.org, that's uh, a map from uh, May 12th on the left there, and the black dots actually are, are right whale locations. So there's three uh, uh, main areas. Two are at the shelf break, uh, uh, surprisingly there, and one of them is on the, the uh, western side of the Great, Great South Channel. It's kind of at the bottom of the, uh, the pink triangle there uh, at the top. And uh, in, in a figure uh, uh, provided by Grace Jensen uh, at UMass at Dartmouth there, one of uh, uh, Vijay Gangopadai's students there, uh, uh, this is the Jennifer Clark chart blown up. And you can see that both of those right whale concentrations are near warm core rings that are adjacent to the uh, shelf break front. And we've had a lot of discussion about the, the relation uh, uh, of the, over the, about the last month of, of the right whales and shelf streamers going around to the northeast portion of the ring. Shelf streamers, uh, the record I heard uh, from Gordon Waring, who used to be in the protected species branch, uh, he said he saw 58 sperm whales in one shelf streamer there. So the shelf streamers really concentrate marine life and the fishing industry is well aware of that. So, uh, Eileen said I should put a few recommendations in, so uh, I thought I'd do that. Um, and my major points are, I, I think it's really important to accurately model the stratification. I, I think to get the, the prey fields right, and particularly the concentration of prey. I think that that uh, uh, one of the reasons I, I, I took a little bit more time with the salinity maximum intrusions is that ocean processes are changing. They're changing in their magnitude, they're changing in their frequency, and that's the scale that the organisms are having to deal with, with, with uh, feeding and behavior. One thing that I'm very sad about is that the pioneer array is outside of the region now, and, and that has been a big loss. I get emails, I get phone calls, what's going on? Two weeks uh, after the Pioneer Ray was pulled out of the water, I got a phone call about monkfish because they did not move offshore at their normal time period at the end of the fall. They moved offshore two months later than usual. And I think it was because a warm core ring pushed the front way inshore like in 2021, but we don't have subsurface observations. So, you know, it's something I will be asking modelers during break times. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, I do hope that that subsurface oceanographic data will be made available uh, from the offshore wind industry and from people doing research. I, I, you know, I'm frantic to try and get up to date information because, again, I have people in the fishing industry asking me. And when I had the Pioneer, it was just fantastic. You know, it's like give me ten minutes and I'll tell you bottom salinity, and and I've lost that capability. So uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Very comprehensive um, 
very thought provoking. Um, we have time for a couple of questions for Glenn, if anyone. Um, there's one in the. OK, thank you. Um, yeah. OK, I don't think I'm seeing I guess, that. You got it, Kelly. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, this is uh, can you comment on impact of solitons and internal waves in the region and their impact on stratification and distribution on prey? Fantastic question. I don't think that that has been addressed yet. And with these year to year changes in the uh, surface density there, obviously there, there's big changes year to year in peak stratification, which would affect the uh, would definitely affect the the uh, uh, amplitude and internal wave energy carried by the solitons there. That's something that's going to need to be looked at. I mean, that that directly feeds back into the strength of the stratification. Can, can I give Thank a you. time response to one of the uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go ahead. Uh, just literally one sentence um, from uh, uh, the perspective of ocean winds, um, our south coast JV um, from the jump has been providing all the data, all the Met Ocean data that we gather uh, to Naracuz. And, um, you know, and I think you will find across the industry with the possible exception of wind data, which has commercial <laughs> impacts, um, the, I think you will find great willingness from the offshore wind industry to supply you with any data that we have, particularly regarding mid ocean conditions. That is great to hear and merely points out my ignorance. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Richard has a question, yeah. So can you summarize the period of stratification so, so, so that period it uh, sounds like it's persisting later in the fall yes how about in the spring the breakdown yes. so that's that onset of it absolutely depends on individual synoptic meteorology events <laughs> and uh the, basically in the fall it's plus or minus 15 days for the breakdown and and uh, it's, I think the average is around mid-October when it breaks down, but it can break down as early as mid-September, you know, particularly when tropical storms pass through. And I should add that with ocean warming, uh, Fiona, I believe last fall, was the most energetic uh, tropical storm, you know, heading north that went right over a meander of the Gulf Stream and retained a lot of its energy, even as far north as Nova Scotia. In the spring, um, What'll happen is you'll start to get a one or two degree C thermocline, and then if you get strong winds, it'll wipe it out. So the stratification forms, you know, gets wiped away, forms again uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, and and I have a, a PhD student working on the the fall destratification. I uh, um, you know so can certainly send you the manuscript on that because he has a year by year breakdown uh, uh, there. But I think the spring uh, really needs more attention there uh, in, in terms of the interannual variability, but it's very much weather dependent. But is the onset changing? Is it earlier? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I couldn't give uh, a definitive answer. That's something we can talk about in what's whole sometimes. Okay. Um, yeah, one last question here. I have a question about your finding that uh, the uh, Gulf Stream meanderings are moving further to the west. Yeah. Because I attended recently a conference, uh, a presentation about hurricanes, uh, which are moving further north due to global warming, but they are actually also moving further west. And that was a very unexplained finding. And so I was wondering and curious about your opinion about whether the meandering of the uh, Gulf Stream, whether it's actually continuing or it was just isolated to 2015. No, and it's if definitely you think, continuing. Could and, that be a really? Oh, no, it, it has huge implications. Uh, 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 for storms. And, right. and uh, you know, I, I, I really want to compliment the Rutgers group for uh, their work on storms, and particularly the evolution of intensity over uh, continental shelves there. Uh, Scott Glenn and his group, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of understanding how important the uh, um, the mixing before the, uh, 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 the, the the core actually hits, that's really important. But no, these meanders are really large. And I was pretty stunned. I think it was two days ago, uh, Grace Jensen sent another Clark chart. There's a gigantic kink in the Gulf Stream right now. The north wall of the Gulf Stream is at 40 degrees north at about the 200 meter isopath. 
So if there was a storm that came through right now, it would maintain all its intensity, could even be gaining intensity right up to the shelf break. And, and so, you know, another consequence in terms of storms and infrastructure is that as the stratification increases, it's going to take more energy to get that cold pool water off up to destratify. And there was uh, what was in 2011, Hurricane Irene was much weaker when it hit hit the coast and and then of course when hurricane sandy hit everybody was like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna you know go to the poconos you know and then then that didn't lose any of its intensity crossing the continental shelf which is why it's so important for the general public to know about yeah. seasonal stratification so it sounds like they could be related absolutely, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. thanks okay i think um josh had his hand up we'll do that and i i recognize that there are a number of of questions from people online. We'll see if we can come back to those later. But go ahead, Josh. Uh, thanks, Glenn. As usual, very relevant talk on the processes. Really appreciate that. Um, my question is, you mentioned briefly the tidal mixed front yes. and a lot of the shelf processes that you talked about. And I wonder if you could just comment on how the Nantucket Shoals region, that's the, the focus for this, is interfacing with the tidal activities that are strength yeah, no, they're no, stronger that, near shore and question and and you know josh that, that could be a whole nother talk i i'm just not an expert in, in that and and uh what i would say is that the, the warming rates are differential because of the strong tidal mixing and there's a paper by uh lee san yu from our department that talks in in a lot more detail about the spatial structure of the warming rates there but, you know, one of the key things is the upwelling rates. And it's always so much more complicated in these tidal mixing fronts uh, 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 there. I don't know about uh, how those upwelling rates are changing there. But, you know, in talking to people, and, you know, I certainly expect to learn more about the shifting spatial distributions of the right whales there. That needs to be looked at in a lot more detail, how that is changing. Um, we did the uh, uh, Outer Cape Coastal Current work in 2006, 2007, and we recently put in a Sea Grant proposal to get a shelf research fleet at, based out of Chatham. We need to know how that uh, those water masses that are short circuiting there uh, through the Great South Channel are changing there. Uh, uh, and I would say that's something that needs a lot more emphasis is those upstream uh, uh, flows feeding in. Yeah, I was just wondering that stratification impact that you talked about, the freshening of the surface, right? If that's going to change the way that tidal mixed front. Oh, it absolutely interacts, could. Right? It, it absolutely could. And I was stunned in August of 2018 to see SMAX intrusions going straight into the tidal yeah. mixing front, and then they were mixed away. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we have some questions from committee members, and I think we'll go ahead and take those. Um, so Nick Record online, would you like, you have your hand up? Sure. Thanks. And and thanks, Glenn. That was a really great talk. I learned a lot. Um, I'm wondering, one of your recommendations was about understanding changes. I can't remember the exact wording. But I'm wondering your thoughts on to what degree that includes being able to predict those changes 5, 10, 20 years down the line, or do you mean sort of monitoring and understanding changes as they're happening? Um, you need both. And uh, one of the things that that's just really struck me is how little I was able to predict changes we've seen. That's kind of embarrassing. We uh, originally came up with the Pioneer Array concept in 2004 to look at all that fresh water that's going to be flooding out from the continental shelf. And what did we find? The shelf is getting more salty. And it was because of the Gulf Stream variability. And at that point, I'd already been studying, you know, that 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 system for like 20 years and and I got that completely wrong. Now maybe the flood will come down. But we need to understand the changes that are happening now because I, I I'm probably less confident than a lot of people about our uh, ability to predict 5 10 20 years into the future uh until you know we really get these processes understand the dynamics understand you know what's necessary to to uh, resolve them and mixing is just a huge part that that underlays a lot of what i've had for my recommendations the soliton question certainly brings that up but but really both okay thank you um Kaus, you had a question yeah yeah, 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 yeah,
Um, uh, so I guess my question is, uh, you know, there's yeah. clearly been... Oh, yeah. oh, uh, great talk. Uh, I, I, and I guess my question is that there's clearly been been some kind of regime shift, uh, and uh, and within within the context of of, of <laughs> recent observations since since the uh, since, since since you've been making observations of the sh of, of of the changes, has there been uh, some kind of stability? Yeah, like more recent stability in in. No, no, that's a really, really important question. And and uh, so I think there's been been two particular time periods that, that people talk about. So first of all, Avijit identified that 2000 shift into more warm core rings. And he has a student looking at the wind stress curl right now uh, uh, there, uh, uh, Ian Gifford. And it does not appear that there were major changes in the wind stress curl to, to drive that uh, and so we, we're going to have to look at the stability of the Gulf Stream itself, uh, uh, and we want to look at the potential vorticity distribution, uh, just to throw a little jargon in there. Uh, uh, but but yes, there, there's clearly something about the stability characteristics that have changed. The other thing that's really important, and I mentioned Jamie Palter's work and, and her student, Afonso Neto, there's a tremendous amount of interest at the tail of the bank now because there's been a retro, more retroflexion of the Labrador current. And so one of the shocking things that we found from the Pioneer Array, and this was in a paper in 2018, is that the salinity over the upper slope has gone up by 0 0.7 PSU in the last 20 years there. Like that's a huge change. And so you have much sharper salinity gradients at the edge of the continental shelf. You're transporting much more salt across the continental shelf. It's even getting to the tidal mixing front, which is, you know, I would not have thought that that was possible before. But I, uh, I think that 2010 shift is really important because in talking to a lobsterman in, in Rhode Island one time, he said, 2010 is a year. Everything went haywire. I don't know what's going on, you know, since 2010. So this is why it's so important to hear all the different species about what, what's going on uh, uh, there to try and get a more comprehensive understanding of, of these particular re regime shifts there. That, that's an important question, though. Okay, thank you. Um, one final question, Doug, please. Yeah, this won't take long, Eileen. First of all, thanks, Glenn. Thanks a lot. It was really, really instructive. Uh, one logistical question is, will the presentation be available to us to, okay, to paw back through? Because I've heard a lot of, I like to paw back through. Then the other one was, you won't be surprised, uh, my question, how much, you mentioned um, Gareth, some of Gareth's work along alongside of this. How much of, uh, a lot of these data collection efforts have had those collection of zooplankton ecology and and even just backscatter data to go along with them. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of EK80 data collected there, and Andoni Lavery has collected a lot of it. And in fact, during the uh, the Task Force Ocean New England Shelf Break Acoustics Experiment, uh, Andoni and, and Tim Duda collected a ton of data there. Sure. So uh, I think it's really important. It'd be nice if, if there was some funding, you know, directly towards the identif identification of, of uh, uh, the zooplankton. And uh, I, I do want to say uh, I'm going to contact Gareth uh, uh, there about that EK-80 data from the June 16 cruise because it was incredible. It's the first time I'd seen an EK-80 in action. You could actually see at the lowest frequencies fish going back and forth to feed in the different layers. Yeah. You know, so I was joking about, oh, there's the dessert layer. There's the appetizer. It's like a trifle. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, okay. but that data really needs to be looked at because... You know, we have information about the physical oceanic oceanographic variability at the same time. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Thanks again, bud. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Very helpful and um I think so. That's a good that question is a good segue to our next presentation, which will be given by uh Jeffrey Runge, who's a professor of oceanography in the School of Marine Science in the University of, of Maine, and he's at the Darling Marine Center. And Jeff is an expert in all things plankton, I think. Um, he's worked uh, with uh, processes controlling plankton productivity, plankton production, uh, impacts on higher trophic levels. And um, he's uh, been involved with this work for, for very many years. So he's gonna talk to us today about potential changes in ecosystem dynamics, prey fuel from offshore wind turbine in the Nantucket Shoals region. So Jeff, please. 
Je suis en screen. Je suis en screen. Je suis en screen. So, can you share your screen? Is that? Um, I I don't know if you can see me. I can't. Um... Yeah, Jeff. We... If you stop your video, maybe because of the bandwidth, stop your video and then try sharing it again. Jeff, we can run the presentation from our end if that's all right, and we can advance at your prompt. So have we lost you, Jeff? Are you still there? Can you hear us, Jeff? It looks like we lost him, but I still his video is frozen. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. Um, good idea. <laughs> Eileen suggested we take a short break while we get them online. Um, how about we meet back in 10 minutes? So at 10.23. <laughs> Cutting the break short by about a minute and a half here. Um, anyway, so we have Jeff back, and um, and again, he's going to talk to us about uh, zooplankton and the uh, Gulf of Maine and Nantucket Shoals. So, Jeff, please go ahead. Thank you, Eileen, and hello, everyone. Sorry for that. My computer just completely froze, and I didn't know any alternative but to restart. So I'm... Um, I'm going to focus um, this presentation on the uh, availability of prey for North Atlantic right whales, which I think is a subject of uh, focus for, for your study. And um, I'm going to uh, a, a little bit of a contrast from um, Glenn's talk and focus more on the upstream sources. Uh, and what and my attention has especially been in, in, on the Gulf of Maine and, and the, the potential role for the Gulf of Maine in, in supplying um, zooplankton to, to Nantucket Shoals and just generally what's happening to zooplankton in the region uh, with respect to these shifting oceanographic conditions that we've been talking about already. And so I will be presenting some of my own data uh, or some of the data that I've been um, participating in and would like to acknowledge all the um, contributions of my co-PIs, including Nick Record, um, and technical staff and students in, in collecting and analyzing these data. And I'm also going to provide some a review of, of studies um, uh, of, in the region regarding zooplankton. And um, just acknowledging also the, the funding sources, uh, one of which recently has been very um, critical in sustaining the time series that I've been involved in, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And so um, Glenn said that he's a physical oceanographer and not a biologist. And I'm going to say I'm a biologist and not a physical oceanographer. So I'm going to just provide my, my perspective of the um, physical uh, conditions and especially the general circulation in the coastal Northwest Atlantic 
And um, I, my view it has, a, I have a Canadian perspective on that since I worked in Canada for many years with DFO, is that the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Gulf of Maine uh, can be considered as a large scale coupled advective vestrine system driven by the huge discharge from the St. Lawrence River, which itself uh, drives a buoyancy current that uh, flows through the Gulf of St. Lawrence and down the Scotian Shelf into the Gulf of Maine. Um, and um, that I want to point out right away that the Gulf of St. Lawrence is um, a huge source of Calanus uh, species, Calanus finmarchicus, other species, but it, for the Gulf of Maine, what's relevant is Calanus finmarchicus. And um, so there's, there are very large concentrations of Calanus finmarchicus and high production in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And there's also, as you see, there's uh, the Labrador current, um, the subsurface, subwater Labrador uh, subsurface water that flows down the shelf break and also can enter into the, the Gulf of Maine through the Northeast Channel. Um, and in addition, there's warm slope water that's um, uh, adjacent to the shelf break in between um, the Gulf of Maine and, and the Gulf Stream. And um, that can also enter into the, um, into, into the Gulf of Maine through the um, Northeast Channel. And so this, this water that enters in uh, flows down, especially in the, the main coastal current, uh, eastern and western main coastal current down past Cape Cod, and some of it uh, goes around George's Bank, and some of it, um, this is the residual circulation patterns, it goes past um, the south of Martha's Vineyard along the shelf and out. And there's also a component that flows along the shelf break. Um, so this, this is... Um, uh, the kind of general circulation pattern. And uh, since 2010, as we just we just been talking about, there's been evidence for um, a shift in, in, in the, in the um, north wall of the Gulf Stream, uh, greater transport of warm salt, warm slope water into the Gulf of Maine, higher salinities in the Gulf of Maine, higher temperatures, and um, even the possibility recently of, of Gulf Stream water, modified Gulf Stream water flowing into the Gulf of Maine. Um, and uh, Dave Townsend at the University of Maine has, is publishing a review of the sources of water into the Gulf of Maine, uh, which is coming out in progress in oceanography in July. And um, I, I think that's, uh, for me, a very uh, insightful review about uh, what's going on in the Gulf of Maine for the sources of water. So uh, just uh, what's happening in the Gulf of Maine can be seen in the surface temperatures. Uh, this is the Gulf of Maine Research Institute website. Uh, they have a great summary of um, warming trends in the Gulf of Maine. And in this figure here, where you see the, the time on the, the years on the y-axis and uh, months on the x-axis. And since 2010, the temperature anomalies have been especially uh, positive. Just um, indicating, again, the, the, the effect that, the, um, that, that there's something important that happened around this time, 2010. And that warming occurred not only at the surface, um, the surface temperatures on the left here, fall sea surface temperatures. This is again from the Gulf of Maine web, website and also from uh, NOAA's Fishery State of the Ecosystem report that the Gulf of Maine bottom temperatures have also been increasing, uh, especially since 2010. So it's not just the warming in the Gulf of Maine, it's my perspective is not just um, an, a heat exchange between the air and the, and the ocean, it's also uh, shifting water mass transport and warmer water from different masses coming into the Gulf of Maine. So I'm, I wanna talk about, especially, the observing programs for observing zooplankton responses to oceanographic conditions. And um, so I'll do that first. And then I'd like to just briefly summarize recent uh, decadal trends in oceanographic condition in, in, in the abundance of zooplankton in the Gulf of Maine with a focus on Calanus from Marchicus and other prey pseudocalanus and centropogies for North Atlantic right whales. And then at the end, I'm, I pose some questions and implications for Nantucket Shoals zooplankton 
and um, the wind turbine impacts. So I'm, I'm providing, I, I think maybe there's an opportunity here for um, a little bit of Hegelian uh, dialectic of uh, synthesis between uh, Glenn's focus on, on shelf break processes and, and the transport of shelf break water into the Nantucket Shoals. And the focus on, on this talk here is especially the Gulf of Maine and the Gulf of Maine is a source of supply uh, of zooplankton to, um, to Southern New England. So the, the first um, observing program in, 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 the, in the Gulf of Maine that's been going on since 1960 is the Continuous Plankton Recorder, CPR. It's an apparatus that towed behind merchant vessels, a uh, tiny opening, 1.3 centimeter squared opening that, um, that uh, allows water in, flows past a, a mesh, the mesh winds up in formaldehyde and is analyzed by uh, plankton experts. Um, for, for the Gulf of Maine, uh, those experts are located in a, la a lab in Poland. Um, and it's, it's co-run between NOAA and um, the Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation. And the line shown here runs from Nova Scotia um, to the Western Gulf of Maine. And that's been going since 1961. Another uh, zooplankton uh, observing program that's been going on since 1977 is of course the NOAA ECOMON MARMAP surveys. And this is an example of the stations that are that, that may happened. It's a stratified random design. Um, so the stations might vary each year, uh, towed with bongo nets, 333 mesh, and uh, from two to six surveys a year. I think it's more on the lower end now than, than it has in the past in, in numbers of surveys. And finally, we have uh, more recently the, the NERACUS, which operates the Integrated Sentinel Monitoring Network, ISMN, um, and it uh, collects um, monthly, nominally monthly, it's now in the summer at CMPS, um, at the, which is the coastal main time series station located about five, kilom five miles off the Damerscott estuary at the western margin uh, of the main coastal current, and also a station that's sampled from University of New Hampshire, from Portsmouth, uh, at the Wilkinson, in Wilkinson Basin, the northwest tip called the Wilkinson Basin time series station. And these protocols, the the protocols, the, the, the primary zooplankton um, collection is with a vertical 0 0.75 meter uh, ring net towed from the bottom to the surface, 200 micron mesh net. Um, and it, the other uh, sampling, including CTD, chlorophyll, phytoplankton taxonomy, um, the, the protocols are similar to the Atlantic Zone Monitoring Program, which was established in 1999 in the, the maritime region. You can see they, there are some time series stations at Prince 5 and Bay of Fundy, uh, Station 2 off Halifax. There were others in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. I actually was involved when I was up working fisheries and oceans in setting up the AZMP, uh, which was um, now has now been going on for, uh, over, for 20 years. And uh, so um, you, you, I'm, I'm providing references as we go to. Um, like there's the, the recent report to, that we made for BOEM about the, um, the ISMN stations, fixed stations in the, in the Gulf of Maine, the AZMB, there's a link to reports of the, um, the data that are collected at the, um, as part of the AZMP. And then I also put a link to our pretty neat rap video on YouTube about, uh, uh, called Cruise Cruise Baby about sampling at these stations. So the foc uh, focus, especially on the subarctic planktonic copepod, Calanus finmarchicus, the primary prey for the North Atlantic right whale. Uh, the range of Calanus finmarchicus, you can see that uh, the southern New England is, is pretty much thought to be at, at the southern edge of the uh, viable populations, the reproducing populations of uh, southern margin of the subarctic distribution that goes all the way up into Norway and, and into the Barents Sea. Um, it's Calanus finmarchicus is especially and remarkably abundant uh, in the North Atlantic Ocean, and especially in the Gulf of Maine. There's something about the Gulf of Maine historically that has um, nurtured very large concentrations of Calanus finmarchicus. This is why North Atlantic right whales go there. Um, 
And so uh, there's, and if you, you look at the, uh, to the right here, these plots of the proportion of copepod biomass and copepods make up most of the catch of mesozooplankton in, a, in these um, net toes, uh, 200 micron vertically integrated net toes. Um, the copepods make up more than, typically more than 80% of the abundance of, of plankton caught with these caught. And uh, of the planktonic copepods, Calanus species, uh, whether it's in Canadian uh, shelf waters or um, where there are several species, including Calanus hyperboreus, an Arctic species. In the Gulf of Maine, it's primarily or almost all Calanus finmarchicus. In, in, in all these waters, um, what, um, in the deep, deeper waters, say greater than 100 meters, uh, Calanus species make up. Um, more than 70, between 70 and 90 percent of the biomass of the mesozooplankton, of the mesozooplankton copepods. So uh, hugely important to the uh, foundation species, to the whole functioning of the subarctic um, um, ecosystems in, in, in this region. So just some results from the NOAA Ecomon surveys, uh, um, a study by Grieve et al, um, supported by NOAA, 2000, that was published in 2017. So you see um, from the Ecomon averages, um, different regions that they, they divided up the survey from the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's Bank, Southern New England, and the Mid-Atlantic Bight. You can see the um, mean average annual abundances of Calanus from Marcus fluctuate by an uh, order of magnitude of have fluctuated over the past um, uh, 30 years or so. Um, the, the abundances, average abundances in, in the Gulf of Maine are say three to five times higher than what you might find in Southern New England, uh, which is this orange line here. Um, uh, just to give you a sense of the, um, the variability that can occur in, in abundances. Um, now I'm going to focus especially on the period um, since um, the more recent period since about 2000 um, at coming up. The um, Rubao G and uh, and his co-authors I was involved in this study uh, um, looked at the seasonal patterns uh, and coherence of Calanus marchicus in the Gulf of Maine, and it's important that um, annual abundances, um, it's important to understand that the, the drivers of, of the population abundance in, of Calanus have a strong subannual component, seasonal component. Um, for example, the, uh, and if you look at the left panel here in spring, um, the anomalies of Calanus abundance across the NOAA Ecomon surveys for Wilkinson Basin, Jordan Basin, and Georgia's Basin, three deep basins in the Gulf of Maine, there really is no trend in the spring abundance of Calanus Um, and, and they're fairly coherent among the, the three basins. Whereas in the fall, the coherence breaks down, especially uh, between Georgia's Basin and the other basins. And we see that since 2010, especially, you could kind of mark it off, around there, there has been a dramatic decline, decline. And these are log scale anomalies. So there's been a dramatic decline, decline in, in these basins observed in, in the NOAA data. And uh, so th this is a decline, especially in the Eastern Gulf of Maine has been correlated with the uh, shift in foraging habitat of the North Atlantic right whale. Um, Nick Record uh, led a, a study uh, published in 2019 in Oceanography, where uh, taking NOAA's data that was available for the Eastern Gulf of Maine before and after 2010, um, since 2000, since say the year 2005, uh, you see that um, when there was in Jordan Basin, when Calanus from Marchicus abundance, Jordan Basin in the Eastern Gulf of Maine, when Calanus from Marchicus abundance was say greater than 40,000 per square meter, lot. There were a lot of right whale sightings in the Bay of Fundy in, in, the, in the late summer, fall. 
uh, whereas when their Countess von Marchkis was not there, especially after uh, 2010, the, the data that was available, um, neither were the right whales. And the, these abundances correlated with the increases in, in, in temperature and um, correlated with this change in shifting water masses coming into the Gulf of Maine. Um, and, so, and so Aaron's paper in 2021, um, they, they looked at the CPR data, the continuous plankton recorder data, um, and also found that um, a coherence with or with, with what the ECOMON data has been finding of lower Calinus Finmarchus abundances um, in the eastern Gulf of Maine. And um, that also correlated with the uh, North Atlantic right whale calving index. And uh, in, in this um, oceanography paper, they were explicitly discussing um, um, kind of a regime shift that, that occurred uh, that centered uh, around 2010. So it's important, I, I, I didn't mention that it's, imp well, I'll, I'll say it now. It's important that the, the source, I consider that the, the important source of countess and marches coming into the Gulf of Maine is not from the warm slope waters or the, the, the slope sea that's just um, east of, of Northeast Channel. It is from the Nova Scotia current and Gulf of St. Lawrence, and also uh, contributions from laboratory slope water that are contributing calendars from March into the Gulf of Maine. So I guess here it is here. So here you see the, what I what I see is the primary source of calendars from March is actually uh, coming from the Scotian Shelf in in this colder and fresher water into the eastern Gulf of Maine. And so we just saw that in the eastern Gulf of Maine, calendars from March because abundance is uh, lower than, since 2010. We, and we're off, the question also is now what, what's happening to Calinus in the Western Gulf of Maine, and, and uh, which is, um, as we see the um, residual circulation um, flows past Cape Cod and in, in, into Southern New England. Um, and we've been studying that, especially uh, Rubal G and, uh, and others, I was involved in the study, um, uh, developed this uh, sent idea of, um, the important role of that the main coastal current plays, where it, it, it picks up individuals that are in the eastern Gulf of Maine, Calinus, and the main coastal current has um, rich, rich uh, food supply throughout the summer. The temperatures for Calinus and Marchicus are just optimal in the main coastal current, and it grows and reproduces there. And, um, and by the time it gets to western Gulf of Maine, as say Wilkinson Basin, the, they've developed to the overwintering diapause stage and find this refuge in, in, in Wilkinson Basin to overwinter. And, and so from there in the spring, the animals come out of diapause and then reproduce and then uh, are a source of, of, of calinus to um, the western Gulf of Maine and southern New England. So that's there, it's important to emphasize that there's seasonality of primary drivers controlling the abundance of calendars. First is advective supply, and that's from external supply. And the evidence for the regime shift in 2010 um, affects supply. So less of, of um, the calendars rich cold freshwater from the Scotian shelf, more warm slope water entering in and affecting concentrations in the eastern Gulf of Maine. And then there's advective supply in the main coastal current of affecting of abundances in the, in the um, late summer uh, in the western Gulf of Maine. And then there's very important local production, especially in the main coastal current and in, in waters just adjacent to the main coastal current, um, um, where the phytoplankton regime and temperature affect lipid accumulation and timing of diapause and reproduction. And finally, predation. And Peter Wiebe just published a, a paper last year with uh, his co-authors um, emphasizing that the predation may have an important role and especially with higher temperatures and, and affecting abundances. And this is especially as the predator field 
uh, develops over the season. The, uh, I, I see them as this predation component as being especially important at the end of the active season in late summer and fall. So I, I want to talk now about what's happened to Calanus finmargicus in the western Gulf of Maine based on our on the Niracus ISMN uh, time series stations and just uh, recalling everyone recalling um, the life cycle of a Calanus starts out the egg develops through six Noplia stages and then six copepitid stages. And so the stages that we're focused on, the stages that, that North Atlantic right whales are especially interested in are the lipid rich stages, uh, especially stage C5 and, and adults in stage C4. Um, the Ecomon, we're focusing especially on stage C3 through, through adult female here. This is what, these are the stages that are primarily captured by the bongo toes of the NOAA um, Ecomon survey. And uh, we've, also, uh, we count all, all competitive stages for the Niracus stations, but we're just going to focus on the state abundance of stages C3 through C6, as these, these are probably the stages that North Atlantic right whales are especially interested in. And so here is um, a phenology uh, that um, we've prepared. Rubal G has, has been involved in this, especially, and uh, it's an it's the, on the y-axis is the, um, on the y-axis, the abundance in a log scale, uh, normalized to individuals per meter cubed. Um, the, dark, the time of year, the year day is on the x-axis. And um, so what we have here are the, all these light gray, points in the background are the ECOMON data from Wilkinson Basin. So this is the Wilkinson Basin time series station. The um, colored points are the observations from these six stations, that just one station from the Wilkinson Basin station in the northwest corner um, in these vertically integrated toes, and just to see how they map onto the ECOMON data. And we think it does a pretty, pretty good job of of uh, reflecting concentrations. And you see that there's a, there is an annual cycle where the abundances uh, of Calanus are lowest in um, say February, March, in, wh in which time they're mostly in either stage C5 or females ready to reproduce. Then there's the appearance of a lot more zooplankton, a lot more phytoplankton food and uh, uh, spring vernal increase in the abundance of, of Calanus and Marchicus, uh, especially younger stages. And then as they develop into the diapausing stage C5, you can see the decline that occurs over, over the summer and, and late fall. So uh, I, I point out especially that our the time series stations at Wilkinson Basin uh, started in 2005. And we see uh, these red points here, which is 2020, 21, um, uh, that the, they're considerably lower than the, than the long time average. The, the average of the Ecomon data is this black line here. And with the twice and half the abundances in this dotted lines from, that's from the Ecomon data. And so the, well, the recent 2021 Calanus abundances are considerably lower than the long time, than the, the historical average. Uh, here, it, it's plotted out since 2005 for um, the coastal main time series station in, 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 off the, in the western margin of the main coastal current in Wilkinson Basin in late summer and in Wilkinson Basin in late fall and winter. And we can see declines uh, occurring in all three places. We believe that the CMTS Main coastal current is a source of supply for Wilkinson Basin in later in the summer, uh, where they where they are har the Wilkinson Basin harbors these uh, stages that are developing in the main coastal current, and we can see that the abundance levels comparing 2008 to 2021 are somewhere between 15 and 40 percent of what they were, um, you know, back in before 2010. Uh, in the spring, it's a different story. The spring again is. Um, uh, as we see, there's a decoupling, and uh, even though there are fewer females, say, that come out of diapause in February, March, 
if the conditions are right, they, they're they so reproductive, you can produce so many eggs per female, up, say up to 60 eggs per female per day, that um, you fewer females can still replenish the population. So we don't see really any, any trend um, over the long term in, in spring calendar abundance. And uh, so, so, you know, this, this, even though there are fewer females here, there's, there's a lot of production that happens during the spring period. And we believe that this is um, in part due to a ch changing more earlier availability of phytoplankton. Um, this is chlorophyll biomass before 2010 and after 2010 at Wilkinson Basin. And, and even concentrations between 0 0.5 and one milligram per liter, uh, one microgram per liter in the period between say in February, March, when females may be coming out of diapause early because the temperature is warmer, um, are encountering higher phyto food availability and being able to reproduce earlier and then and offset the lower concentrations that we see uh, being supplied to Wilkinson Basin. So uh, also looking at uh, other um, copepods in the um, zooplankton community before and after 2010, uh, the red is significant increases in, the, in, in abundance. And these are ranked from smallest microcalonus to largest in calonus is up there somewhere. Can't see it with this bar in a way. Oh, there we go. So um, Pariuchita is a predator on, on the copepods. Uh, so it's the largest, and then Calanus is sort of like the second largest copepod in the system. And what is important is uh, from this point of view is, well, first is Oithona has increased greatly in the six year period since 2010, and so has Pseudocalanus and Centropogies, um, two of the species that are also. Um, considered as uh, common prey for, uh, especially when calanus is not available for North Atlantic right whales. So let's see if I can shift this. So coming now to Nantucket Shoals. And so here's, again, the perspective is upstream sources uh, into Nantucket Shoals. Uh, and um, I, from based on the look at the circulation patterns, I'm, I'm not really know much about the zooplankton on, on Nantucket Shoals, uh, what, what's there and what, what observing programs apart from the NOAA stations that are there, the Ekoman stations that are sampled there. But it, it, based on the circulation pattern, it seems like that the Gulf of Maine, the Maine Coastal Current, Wilkinson Basin, especially in, in the spring, uh, is an important source of supply to zooplankton, of zooplankton and to uh, Nantucket Shoals. And also Nantucket Shoals harbors the highest abundances of pseudocalanus and centropogies in the Gulf of Maine in fall and winter, where I believe that's where, North, where the North Atlantic right whales are especially observed is in fall and winter. Since 2010, the abundances of pseudocalanus and centropogies typicus, as we, as we just saw, have increased in the Western Gulf of Maine. That's likely due to the increased temperature and higher chlorophyll concentrations in fall and winter that I pointed out. And finally, I'd like to say that the late lipid rich stages of Calanus and Marchicus in the, in the Gulf of Maine, we, we do not find them. They're, they're, they're not common in, and are not in great abundance at depths shallower than 75 meters due to their high visibility to visual predators. Um, so just uh, to back up some of these, um, point out Rubao G's study in 2009, uh, where he, he actually modeled uh, a coupled physical biological model of um, centropogies and pseudocalanus abundance. Uh, the Marmap climatology from 1977 to 2006 for the different winter, spring, summer, and autumn periods is here on the top panel and the model results are on the bottom panel. And I just point out uh, uh, in winter and, and spring, especially how um, warmer temperatures there, how pseudocalanus and centropogies are, that the highest abundances in th this period are especially um, in that Southern New England area. Likewise for centropogies, um, 
the southern New England area um, in the climatology and the modeling, that's where you find um, uh, highest abundances. And so, uh, I mean, thinking about it, maybe North Atlantic, North Atlantic right whales must know that as well. Uh, but also in Cape Cod Bay, because they, where, they, where they go. So these, this southern New England, western Gulf of Maine, southern uh, as being high concentrations of pseudocalonists and, and centropogies before the calonists from March's late uh, lipid rich stages come online. And just uh, backing up the calonists from Marchicus, this is our observations of abundance of calonists from Marchicus late stages in the Gulf of Maine, where we don't really see them until bottom depth gets to about 100 meters, or 75 to 100 meters. And then finally, then the questions that I, I might pose, having not much knowledge about impacts of offshore wind farms on, on zooplankton. Um, and so I've given an overview more of the potential effective, the role of infection, especially in local production and, and predation uh, by, uh, in, in upstream supply to Nantucket Shoals. But um, really the questions for that, that they're at a finer scale that I, I'm not really uh, have a great understanding of is whether or not there are fine scale patches and aggregations of these um, three uh, known prey species for a North Atlantic right whale on Nantucket Shoals? Or does mixing on the shoals prevent aggregations from occurring? These are questions that I, I just don't know. And, and Glenn, it's just listening to his talk and, um, uh, you know, there, there's an opportunity, so I think, looks like for um, fine scale ag aggregations to occur that are at the scale that are of interest to um, plankton feeding whales. Um, and would offshore wind turbines significantly disrupt these aggregations if, if they occur? And are North Atlantic right whales in Nantucket Shoals feeding on other prey besides talons, pseudocalons, and syntropogies? Um, we have to ask that question. And uh, another question would be, um, would a field of offshore wind turbines by altering turbulence affect the vertical distribution of phytoplankton microzooplankton and therefore affect the feeding rates of suspension feeding zooplankton. And uh, you know, if 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 there's if there aren't patches of perhaps there are patches of uh, in the vertical of prey that um, allow for higher uh, feeding rates and therefore say growth and reproduction of zooplankton, copepods especially um, that are omnivorous. And uh, I would note that if that does occur, that because of the effective patterns, I wouldn't think that that would be an impact on population abundances there, that that, that would be a downstream effect. And it really depends on the footprint of these, um, any impacts on mixing processes of the wind offshore farms, whether or not that would have any inf influence at all in, in the population dynamics of, uh, of the zooplankton. And finally, as the fifth one, listening to Glenn, I, I'm, I'm wondering now about the relative roles of shelf break processes and transport from the shelf break onto Nantucket Shoals versus the substream sources. And what are those relative roles? I, I, I don't have any idea about that, but um, he's kind of, I've kind of seen now that there's um, you know, an important um, contribution possibly of both uh, sources of supply. Okay, I, I hope you heard all that. <laughs> hey, yes, we did. Thank you. Um, do we have questions for, for Jeff? Yes, Glenn, go ahead. Very informative talk, Jeff. Uh, one uh, immediate question is uh, you mentioned the importance of predator fields. And uh, one thing I hear about is uh, longfin squid continually heading further north. And I know that they are very voracious feeders. Do, do they feed on Calanus? Uh, the other one that I, I've heard uh, quite a, a bit of talk about is uh, black sea bass also head, heading uh, further north. Right. Yes. And I... To, to my knowledge, I don't think any of them are directly feeding on 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 um, the mesozooplankton, possibly euphausids, but um, 
uh, that the predator is thinking about, especially for um, um, Calanus species, our, our species, our euphausids, especially Megantiphanes, uh, Megantiphanes norvegica, which is a, a predator on copepods, and it's very abundant in the, the main coastal current and in the Gulf of Maine, but we don't have, we don't catch it in our nets. It's one of the underknown species or undersampled species. Uh, it's maybe better sampled by acoustics. And another uh, important predator are gelatinous zooplankton, jellyfish. And um, Peter Wiebe's uh, paper emphasized the possibility of uh, jellyfish predation being especially important in some years. Um, uh, thinking more of the invertebrate predators, but then there's also herring and sand lance that are, are forage fish are important predators of the calanus. And I don't know if there was a second part to your question, Glenn, but I'm, I'm uh, no, oh, just, just curious about the predators, that's all. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So adult fish don't feed on calanus, but a lot of the juvenile life stages do, cod, for example. So small fish under 40 centimeters or so. Right, yes. Yeah, and the forage fish, even the adult herring, herring in um, sandlands. Yep. Yeah, yes, please. Um, thank you for that talk. I'm I'm coming from a physical oceanographic perspective, so spare me some uh, maybe benefit. Uh, uh, my well, question is: you, yeah. you mentioned yeah. the different stages of the the life cycle, and I'm wondering if there's any evidence of different stages being more or less dependent on physical processes like is there a i'm assuming the the younger stages are more dependent on transport processes but when we think about stratification and how it might affect aggregation is that limited to the adults is it limited to some of the other stages that you mentioned i so advection applies across the board all stages uh the the as the as the um these the, the uh, copepods, let's say Calanus, develops the older stages, starting say stage C C3, and especially uh, above stage C5, and and uh, females undergo vertical migration, so they have more control of their their vertical distribution, or they exert more control of their vertical distribution, and that especially is the their migration, their diapause migration in the fall, where they the uh, stage C5s will migrate and stay deep in in waters um off the in the slope waters it's 400 greater than 400 meters in, in the wilkinson basin which is only 250 270 meters deep their mode uh vertical distribution of the overwintering stages these these late adult state late pre-adult stages is around 150 meters 120 to 100 say 200 meters they're able to survive um Nevertheless, in in Wilkins Basin at, at at those depths, so the the younger stages, the Nauplia stages and the Copepidid stages, are especially subject to surface surface transport. Say, okay, thank you, Richard. Do you have a question? Just a comment to elaborate on something Jeff had said. Jeff, good speculation on what might be in the Nantucket Shoals because there has been a little bit of analysis done by the Northeast Center for 2020 through 2022 from their cruises and basically centropogies is the most common zooplankton on Nantucket Shoals and pseudocalanus and, and calanus are about equal at least in those surveys so good speculation yeah. and and one thing we're noticing is an expansion of centropogies expansion of its uh, seasonal abundance um, not just in the fall but more in the summer and into the spring and high, much higher abundances. So centropogies is one of those species, I think that's taking, that's really taking advantage of the warmer temperatures. Is centropogies as energy rich as Calanus? No, I sort of see centropogies like um, Trader Joe's burrito compared to uh, say salmon if, for a human, if that, if that makes any sense. If anyone's ever bought Trader Joe's burritos, you disappointed. Yeah, you're setting us up for lunch, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one question. Yeah. 
Hi, this is um, Emily Hildreth from Boehm. Um, I am a lawyer by training, so that's my disclaimer that you should probably mute me. But um, I was just thinking, and I'm going to use my hands. So one of the things I noticed that you said, and in all the maps I've seen so far today, everything is pretty much going north-south. And yes. the really large concentration of wind farms in the Rhode Island Mass area is south of the shoals. So when you're talking about oceanographic effects, it would be that downstream zone where you would see most of those effects. And I know we've looked at wind roses too, and I think at least more than half, it's the same thing, it's going in that direction. And I think you acknowledged that some, but it was like this sort of tiny note. Um, and I just found that like really interesting and really notable. So I guess it's not a question, but I'm hoping you can correct me if I'm just like crazy and a lawyer trying to be in a science meeting. <laughs> Well, I probably defer to Glenn on on this, but uh, the the forces that are are driving the um, the north to south circulation are not not primarily wind driven. They're um, they're, they're have to do with uh, freshwater input and um, density gradients in in the water, uh, and less about which way the wind is going. I don't know if that's kind of. Go sufficient. ahead, Glenn. Yeah, Jeff, uh, that's definitely correct. And uh, just just to add uh, uh, a little bit more, uh, that is absolutely certainly true that it's mostly going uh, uh, north to south or west uh, to south of, of uh, uh, New England there. And uh, uh, as Jeff said, that uh, all the, the freshwater input makes the water on the continental shelf less uh, uh, less dense than offshore. And that, that density gradient is what drives the, uh, uh, the shelf break jet there. But there's also, uh, uh, and, and I hate to use a bit of gar jargon, but on a long shelf pressure gradient that drives a depth average component to the flow. And the two components are about equal to each other. And since you're a lawyer, this came up in a recent murder case. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. Um, where actually uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, sank their fishing boat and their mother went down with the boat and they were found 80 kilometers east of where they said the boat went down. And uh, that was shown to be uh, an error there. So it is, it is actually important legally too. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right. Yes, please go ahead. So we have seen all these fantastic uh, observations, all the detail, but most of the transport we have seen that has been, uh, say, residual transports, all the maps you have shown, but it's strongly tidal. So isn't there a strong, uh, say, dispersive transport due to the tides? Sometimes that can be even bigger than the residual transport so that, you know, Tides transport uh, down and go back, but still they push a lot of uh, along the gradients. So Chen actually knows more about this than I do. But uh, as you go further east and into the Gulf of Maine, the tides are very important. And particularly on the north flank of George's Bank, you get very strong residual tidal currents there. Uh, what's interesting is as you get closer to Hudson Canyon, that's a minimum in the M2 semi-diurnal tide there. And that was one of the reasons actually the Pioneer Array location was chosen so that we could look at the, uh, the buoyancy driven flows in isolation there. So generally the further west you get, the less the tidal influences. No, how much about this? You know, in the New England shock region, most of the two circulation important ones that come from George's Bank. Because George Bank had a, no, George Bank had a circulation go down. Another one just from Cape Cod circulation, this is most like a residual current, also buoyancy driving current. But the problem is you now when the warming, you know, Southern Georgia Bank of front will become strongly because like a grand and you know, like a gulf stream meandering. So Southern Georgia Bank, you know, stratification becomes strongly. That's why they get intensified the southern wall floor to go down. So another thing is you no know, can be change also make like Jordan Basin, like a like Wilkinson Basin, like a Jeff mentioned, is uh, the clockwise circulation is identified. The Cape Cod currents can be can be intensified. That's get the more water come from government region or the upstream or also Georgia Bank region. But you know, so no LTR, NSF LTR had long term transect. You know, started from the short region, from Cape Cod region, 
the start of their countdown. They had a change, they always had a five year data. So every month they get a survey. So they get most of five years or data over there, zooplankton, nutrient data, they get another renew contract for the next five years. They should have a lot of zooplankton data there. Okay, yeah, I, I forgot to mention LTER. They, they, they have that, um, and Glenn, Glenn, you know about that, and, and they have the um, Martha's Vineyard Observatory and um, stations there. I'm, I'm, my sense is that they're especially emphasizing the phytoplankton field with the, the remote sense with the auto, autonomous um, or imaging systems that, that they have. Um, I'm, I'm not aware, and maybe you can correct me if that about zooplankton data being collected. Apart from Jeff, the yeah, Jeff, you are you are right. You know they do focus on phytoplankton, but they do have you no know, micro zooplankton, some other zooplankton data. You know, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, sorry. I need to look. <coughs> Uh, hi, Laura Moore. So the, I guess this is a question uh, for Richard and Aaron and Jeff. Um, talk, Richard, you started to talk a little bit about it with the, the different species and their energy value to uh, the population. Um, could you dig into a little bit more? We've talked about some of the aggregations, the one that has been seen in May. Um, I'm aware there was aggregations off of New York Bite that um, one of our projects found off in New Jersey in recent years. And then of course, Nantucket Shoals, Cape Cod Bay, and the the energy value to individuals and what species are present. That's a big question. Maybe it's too big to answer here, but I would be interested to hear what folks think about that or have to say about that. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I was going to say at least those concentrations that were to the west of Nantucket Shoals and the ones that are on Nantucket Shoals now, there's not much sampling going on. So it's a little hard to tell what they're actually might be feeding on. Mark? I, I don't have the, uh, the cal caloric values off the top of my head. Um, it, it set, I'll, I'll just say that Calanus uh, late stages are much bigger than Centropogy's or pseudocalanus, and their lipid content, energy-rich wax esters is way much higher than um, centropogies or pseudocalanus. So there, there, I mean, there is caloric con content in centropogies and pseudocalanus. Pseudocalanus does have a small lipid um, storage, um, but uh, there's, no question that, as North Atlantic right whales would tell you, that that Calanus and Marchicus is the uh, de desired prey for energy content. And a lot of this also depends on the density of the prey aggregation. So you can you could have pseudo Calanus out there in really high densities, which could balance for low density Calanus, but it's it's also an unknown. <clears throat> I'll add that Calanus and Marchicus is probably the highest energy content per these different species that we're looking at. And so that would have probably the biggest effect on right whale reproductive success. Um, but right whales are feeding on these other guys, Centropogies, Pseudocalanus. Um, my guess is when dense aggregations of Calanus and Marchicus are not available. So when we're thinking about the effects of prey, you know, on right whale demography through the mechanism of reproduction, maybe looking at Calanus finmarchicus is the most important, but we're also thinking about the effects of prey on right whale distribution. And so then the abundances of these smaller bugs really can come into play. And another addition to that is that, you know, we, we, did, we did a lot of survey effort in Southern New England over the last 20 plus years. And I ramped that up in 1997 when we started that. We did not see concentrations of large whales, either humpbacks or fin whales, not to speak of right whales, like we're seeing now. So in the last decade, something has fundamentally changed in those areas. And there's, unfortunately, this is not an area where that zooplankton data has ever really worked up. Yeah. 
I, I, one thought that I, I forgot to put in my talk, are the hot spots getting hotter? And, and uh, uh, one of the processes that, that we've been thinking about a lot are these streamers around the warm core rings there. And, uh, uh, you know, just in talking with the local fishing community there, they're seeing unbelievable concentrations to the northeast of warm core rings. And actually, we just had a paper published a month ago showing that most of the short fin squid, the highest catches, are to the northeast of a warm core ring. That's right where the shelf break jet deflects offshore uh, right there. And uh, uh, one of my uh, former PhD students, Jacob Forsyth, estimated that the upwelling rates to the northeast of a warm core ring can be up to 100 meters a day in these shelf streamers there. So that's a full order of magnitude larger than is normally in the shelf break front there. So that, you know, I, I'm wondering if that's leading to some of this uh, uh, increased number of concentrations. It could very well. That, that this, there's some concentrations that were seen this winter spring that to me seem really unusual. I mean, we would see groups of right whales together, but not a lot of other species with them. But now we're seeing these large aggregations of right whales, humpbacks, fins, says, and then small stations there at the same time. So something different is, is happening. And it could be something like that. Overlaying that those, those sightings with what you've got on warm core rings would be really useful. Yeah, he, he has some of it, but we have there's more data now. Okay, it's a very interesting discussion, and we'll come back to it. But in the interest of time, I think we'll go on. If people need to take a break, I mean, then yes. So could I just have one more comment for the for the panel yes. that, that might be yeah. important? Since I I thought of it while Glenn was talking, and um, which is uh, something in the Marmap data, I, I've seen that that there is in in springtime there's an important Calanus concentration right along the shelf break. Um, south in southern New England, um, and if, if there are incursions, that that might be an important other source of calanus than the upstream is is this uh, springtime abundance of calanus from Arctic along the shelf break um, being and intruding into the North Nantucket shoals. Okay, thank you, and I'm sure we'll be coming back to this topic as we go forward here. Um, if you need a break, get up. you can get up and move, but I think in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next part of the agenda here. Um, these are from uh, European colleagues and it's getting late in their day. So um, we'll go ahead and, and talk, let them make their presentation. And we have a series of three presentations that will give us a European perspective on offshore um, wind turbine effects on hydrodynamics and associated ecosystem changes. I'm not sure of the order in which we'll go here, but we have Goran Brostrom, Ute Dowell, and Ariana Zampolo um, making the presentation. So um, please go ahead. And I'm not sure, like I said, who will be going first. Goran, okay, you're yes. first. All right, yes. and, and Goran is uh, at the University of Gothenburg in Gothenburg, Sweden. So please go. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, looks good. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Good laser pointer. Okay, so I will talk about offshore wind farms and uh, how they possibly can impact ocean dynamics and biogeochemistry. Uh, my name is Jöran Brostrom, uh, as you must have got in Sweden. So there's a lot of plans for offshore wind farms uh, around the world, especially in uh, Europe. So these green ones, they are, I guess, is the existing ones. Uh, these orange is in the development phase, and these are planned. So in the you in Sweden, I'm here, by the way, Gothenburg. And this uh, dark blue is what is planned in the long term. So this is something that is going to quite big in the future and very, very big wind farms. So it's start to, we need to start to think how to look on how these wind farms impact on the ocean. And also we need to see that this is probably important for future energy mix. Uh, there's also some plans in the US, uh, on the, because I guess the Nantaka Shoals is these ones. So when you, place wind farms, you have monopiles when you have quite 
pan of water, then you go to jackets when you're a little bit deeper, then you get, go to different floating ones uh, when you get deeper, and also this becomes uh, bigger. Uh, if you have tides, as you have in the North Sea, as Peter will talk about, then you have a quite mixed layer, then you start to get a, a stratification and you get a surface layer. But for instance, in the Baltic Sea, you don't have tides, so there are many areas you don't have strong tides. Uh, this figure is from Dorel in 2020. Of course, uh, the fundaments by themselves will create some mixing. If you have a flow, you have a structure here, you will create some curls, swirls around that will go downstream. So if you have a, a fundament here, you will have a flow around it and you will create these wakes that will go around. Uh, and this creates mixing. Uh, I'm not sure, but I don't want to talk about it. Uh, uh, well, if you put Reynolds number against Dental number, ocean wind from turbines uh, is in an area where you create wakes and lot of mixing. And I think Ute will talk more about this. So I leave it. What I will talk about, uh, this is a work I did in 2008. So this is the wind wake uh, and how it possibly can impact on the ocean dynamics. So if you have a wind blowing in this direction, then uh, if, you, if the wind changes slowly, you will have a strong air transport in the un undisturbed part. But behind the wind farm, you will have a wind wake, but you have lower wind speeds. So here the air transport will be weaker, so it's weaker there, so it's strong, weak, weak, and strong. So this implies that you have a convergence or a downwelling in this area and you have a divergence in the upper water or upper in this area. Uh, and wind farms probably have a 20% reduction in wind speeds. That means there is a 40% reduction in the wind stress. So the wind stress is proportional to the wind speed squared, uh, roughly. So this is from a model experiment with MIT UCM model. So here I have the wind direction in that direction. And this is the change in thermal climb position. After one day, if you have a wind stress that is 0 0.05 Newton per square meter, this is roughly five meters per second wind. So after one day, you will get a upwelling that is about one meter and downwelling that's about one meter. After five days, you get an upwelling that is about two meters and a downwelling that is about two meters. And you can see that this is the wind farm in red. So these things, upwelling patterns and downwelling, upwelling patterns and downwelling patterns, they are much, much larger than the wind farm itself. And on the stratified ocean, this is to much ex uh, extent uh, governed by the internal Rossby radius or internal radius of deformation. So if you have a double wind, uh, after one day, you see that the signal is actually about doubled, but after five days, the signal is not so big difference between a weak wind and a strong wind. It's a bit larger, it's a bit more upwelling, but it's not doubled in size. So it's a bit complex. So this is uh, just showing the dipole. Oh, I should say that. Uh, sorry, I forgot that. Uh, you can see that it moves to the right. That is the Eggman transport, but it also moves up, upwind. So what is that? So this is... Uh, case when you have barotropic. So you have a wind from about there. This is the vorticity that you see. Then you can see you can create some positive and positive and negative vorticities. And this is a smoke ring, just a lot bigger. So this is a self-advecting uh, because of non-linearity between the vorticity cells, should you say. And here is a new, there's a new wind after 240 hours. So you can again see these vorticity cells and you have this self-advection pattern in this region. And now we we'll still have this from the last uh, wind event. Uh, this is periodics and here is uh, blue, that blue one has gone through the boundaries. Here. So you will create a lot of vorticity. This is on a barotropic case. For a baroclinic case, it's a bit more complicated. So this is simulation is, sorry, the wind direction in this direction now. Uh, I haven't. 
I, I didn't see that until late. Mm -hmm. So anyway, here you could create uh, these dipoles. You get a downwelling and you get upwelling. And this advects a little bit in this direction. So you have uh, this uh, self-advection of the dipole system. But it also creates a big areas of downwelling and upwelling. Now, if you blow the wind a little bit stronger, you can see that you get the same pattern, but eventually the, the, the Ekman current is so strong, so it blows everything away. And the vorticity you create here by curl tau is, is net zero. So you have the possibility, possibility to actually uh, not get an impact at all if you have a strong wind. So, so it, it is complicated. Uh, so I would say um, perhaps more studies are needed to, to understand that the dynamics of this, uh, how it affects uh, the, the vorticity in the, in the ocean. So does it exist in the real world? So this is study where I was uh, lead water, but it was actually Elke Ludwig who did the modeling and Anja Schneehorst that did the observations. So this is a model, here is a wind, the, the offshore wind farm is here. So you have a wind wake uh, with low wind speeds. On the flanks, there is actually high wind speeds. And in before the wind form, there is again a little bit low in the wind stress, the wind speed. So uh, let's think that the wind is going in this direction. So, so this figure is about this size, that figure. So let's look at the east section, these observations. So in the east section, you would get an upwelling and you would get a downwelling. So this is going northwards. So this is going in that direction, actually. And if you look in an observations, you can see this upwelling and this downwelling. And this is the place of the wind form. So this is dotted is the place of the wind form. So you can see that in the observations, there seems to be an indication of the pattern that you can see as, a, as an evidence of, hey, it's consistent with theory. On the southern section, remember that the, the things tends to move uh, in the direction of the, to the right of the wind. Oops, sorry. Uh, so on the south section, you can also see this, there is a downwelling pattern here and perhaps an upwelling pattern here that is also um, reproduced in this model, ocean model. So it was a couple model of atmosphere and ocean. So there were some evidence here. Uh, Flutter et al. Uh, did a study. So they looked at these uh, wind farms in the, in the North Sea. So they took a ship and they went uh, up and down like this. Uh, now this was not operating at the moment. Um, so, so you couldn't see anything from there. So this E is from that one. So in the wind farm, you really don't see much and the wind direction is in that direction. So it's going downstream. But when it comes to these points here, D1 and U1, you can see something that resembles a downward pattern and you can see an upward pattern. When it comes to U2 and D2, you can again see the downward pattern and upward pattern. And we're going to D3 and U3. You see a downwind pattern and an upwelling pattern. So this is consistent with uh, that you could create an upwelling downwelling pattern. This was uh, June 27th, June 29th. Uh, again, then went like this. Uh, let's see. So this pattern, yeah, T2 here. Let's see. Into here. You do see a downward pattern, up on a pattern, and Q3, D3, one, one like this. Again, you can spot it, uh, but this is in the area of, uh, of strong mixing. So you actually have these uh, tidal fronts that goes around there and tidal jets. So um, I wouldn't say that there is an you can conclude that there is a proof of this up and downward pattern. 
you can see an indication that it, it seems to be consistent with what we predict. Uh, this was after a strong wind event. So here you have actually a lot of mixing. So that has reset these up and down whirling pattern from before. But you again can see that it's uh, U1, D1 in this period. You get an up and down whirling. There you can get a down whirling up. Whirling. Ah, it's not so good. This is a little bit, this is a little bit more yellowish and this is a little bit more purple. So you can say that this might be down whirling and up whirling. So there is a lot of, there is some work uh, using models to evaluate the impact of this uh, proposed up whirling, down whirling pattern that occurs from, from that you have a lower wind behind a wind farm. And Christensen in 2022, Ute, who will talk uh, in the next presentation. She will describe a lot more on these processes. And uh, uh, <clears throat> can't, yeah, I wrote down your name, but I can't. Kostalba uh, also did some uh, work on the off upwelling used by offshore wind farms development along the California coast. So it's a bit interesting. This is a few days old. So it's a commercial research being released and grant this issuance and a site that's less than in the Gulf of Mexico. This is 500 pages something. Uh, I didn't read it. It come, came yesterday or two days ago. There seems to be no evaluation on hydrodynamic impact and how changes in hydrodynamics impact on the environment. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's I think it can be an important issue. So as a final comments, wind wake uh, will create an upwelling and downwelling dipole. It is actually quite well anchored in theory. It's really looking on uh, vorticity dynamics. It seems to be observed, but it's not really so easy to detect. Uh, we expect it to be detected by satellite observations, but it seems not to be so easy to detect it. Uh, but it's in, in areas with a lot of variability. Uh, modeling studies indicate it changes, uh, it changes the natural environment. And we will talk more about that in our presentations. So you will have a change in 20, 10 to 20% for productive in a quite large area, uh, an area that is much larger than the ocean wind farm area. And also pointing out that solid structures can be important. They can be important for increased mixing, but they can also be important for, there is a growth of muscles in an area where you don't have muscles. And when they die or get ripped off the structure, they can have a transport of organic material to the bottom. They also impact on the, or the plankton community in the surface water. And also for organized connectivity, we know that oil platforms in the North Sea are, have, uh, for instance, cold water coral, coral Lophelia pertusa, and they can be transported to nearby regions. I would say this is a positive uh, environmental impact, but you can also have an organism that you don't want invasive species. So, Maybe wind wake and upwelling and mixing from fundaments are the largest unknown regarding environmental impacts. And that's known unknowns. There might be unknown unknowns as well. So I added some recommendations. Uh, I think there is important that just uh, that one sets up a monitoring program. And that should be started well before the wind farm is set up. Otherwise, you won't be able to distinguish natural vari variability from what comes from the wind farm. And this is an area of high natural variability. And even nice if the monitoring program is producing real-time data, and it can be used in operational models for atmospheric motion. And the recommendation of modeling, I don't have that much. Resolution is important, but it's not everything. Getting the regional features correct is probably essential. And this is what Glenn said earlier. So you really need high resolution along the whole coast. I think there's important that there is a biochemical model available for the numerical model one will use. And I also would go for, I do like open source models and that the setup for the study is made available and ready to run. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to say we had whole questions, but um, yes, go right ahead. But we'll do. It. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mary Boatman from BOEM, and I just want to uh, point out the environmental assessment that you showed was for lease issuance. And for lease issuance at BOEM, we analyze um, site characterization and site assessment. We do not analyze wind farms at that point in the process down the road when we get a construction and operations plan. That's when we would analyze the wind farm. So this is strictly looking at surveys and the possibility of a met buoy. So there would be no issues or concerns with hydrodynamics, and that's why it's not analyzed in that document. Okay, great. And thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Jeff Runge had a question in the chat here, and we'll maybe do this and then we'll move on to the next presentation. And he was wondering about the footprint, um, the distance from the center of the farm, of the hydrodynamic impact of the wind farm. Um, how does it relate to the area of the wind farm and the number of turbines per unit area? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, typically the wind wake, I mean, this is all the wind wake. Uh, so, so you have a wake and that comes from extracting the entities. There's not much to do about it. Uh, so I think, uh, this will be discussed later. Uh, I don't remember her name. Testing. So she, maybe she's better answering the question. But it's it's actually quite long. It's typically four or five times the size of the wind farm area. And this so, so you, if the wind farm covers an area of five by five kilometers, you can expect an impact of at least. 30 by 30 kilometers, I would say. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, there is another comment in the chat um, from York that you might wanna look at here. I, I think we'll go ahead in the interest of time to move on to the next presentation. And Ute, I think you are the one making this presentation. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, okay, thank you. All um, right, I, and then, I share yes. It? Okay, and Ute is a, a physical oceanographer, and um, she is at the Helmholtz Centrum Heron and um, has been working on looking at um, the impacts of wind farms on fisheries and other uh, impacts on coastal marine ecosystems. So please go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me and give a bit of an overview about um, the impact of offshore wind farms on the Southern North Sea ecosystem. And this is, uh, I will present results from numerical modeling work that we've been doing for a few years now. Uh, first question, can you see the full presentation or do you see presenters mode? No, we <laughs> see the presentation. Perfect. It looks good. Um, I first, I'd like to acknowledge that my co-workers, um, Niels Christiansen, who uh, did a lot of the modeling work um, in our group and just finished his PhD with us, and Navid Akta, who's an atmospheric modeler in Greenwich Farm. Um, a bit to the introduction, I'm glad that uh, Johan gives that basic in uh, introduction into the processes that are related to this wind wake effect. So that saves me a lot of time by explaining this um, depot pattern and how that affects uh, the environment. But I will show results from modeling work on a regional scale, and that might answer some of the questions that came up before. How does that actually affect the environment on larger scales, and what are the scales that you can expect? If it was the background of the North Sea, um, just very recently in the Under Declaration, the North Sea has been um, branded as a green power plant of Europe, uh, which will mean that they're planning or they committed to an installation of over 300 gigawatt by 2050, which is about 10 times of what we have today. And here in the map, you see um, the different plant and uh, construction areas. So in red is what is fully commissioned right now. Um, and then there are a lot of um, other areas that are in discussions to kind of fulfill these 
300 gigawatt, which is really, really a lot. Now, when we think about the North Sea, this is a very strongly used area. Just when we kind of put on top of this the marine protected areas, we already see there are quite some regulations and restrictions on where you might be able to plant um, these uh, offshore renewables. And there are other um, use uses, of course, there's shipping, there's fisheries, um, there are uh, military regions. So the North Sea um, is really getting into an industrialized state. Um, so it becomes much more important now to know what are the impacts um, on both physics and um, biology in that area. Um, so as Jürgen just said, there are basically two impacts we are talking about here. One is the uh, wind speed reduction due to energy extraction um, in these wind wakes, and the other one is the uh, direct impact by structures in the ocean um, that typically create additional mixing in the system. And we've looked at both, but separately until now. So um, there are a lot of um, things to look at in future further. So I will go through all the different impacts that we've found so far um, and hope I can clarify a bit. Um, a bit to the wind wakes. Um, from satellite images, um, there have been shown that in 60% of the images, you can see these wind wakes appearing in Lee of the wind farms. And the relative wind decrease is about 10 to 20% inside the wakes. Um, these wakes can lead uh, to up to 65 kilometers in lee of the offshore wind farms, independent of the atmospheric stability. So with a very stable atmosphere, you have very long wakes. <clears throat> with a dynamic atmosphere, these wakes are much shorter, um, sometimes not even seen. And of course, considering that there will be so many wind parks in the system, there will be also superposition of these wakes and um, they will affect each other. Um, from numerical modeling, we've also seen that there is a generation of turbulent kinetic energy along these atmospheric wakes. And of course, there is an alteration of the wind forcing at the sea surface boundaries. Um, here is a um, sketch from uh, Navid Akhtar's uh, publication on simulating offshore wind effect in the atmosphere. And you have on the left side, the wind speed and on the right side, turbulent kinetic energies. And this um, uh, dashed line is a simulation without wind parks. And then the full lines are simulations with wind parks. And then you see, well, you have at the sea surface a reduction in wind speed. Um, and in the atmosphere, you do have a uh, strong increase in turbulent kinetic energy, which doesn't necessarily reach the uh, sea surface. So how does that affect um, the ocean? Well, you got the basic introduction from Juran. Um, and we looked at the regional scale um, under the conditions of uh, current, uh, yeah, now installed wind parks in the Southern North Sea. So this is a German bite area. Um, and this is um, from a simulation with an unstructured grid model schism. Um, where the wind wakes have been um, parameterized using an empirical formulation deduced from uh, satellite uh, images. And on the left side, you see the estimated wind speed reduction in the of the wind farms. And you can very, uh, see very nicely on how long these wakes actually uh, go um, in the surrounding of the wind parks. And then in the right side, you have the change in the current velocities of the surface. So you have a direct impact on what's happening in the surface current velocity. So clear process change, wind uh, energy extraction, reduction of wind speed at sea surface and then change in sea surface currents. However, as we've heard before, there is a whole process chain um, related to this process actually. And a somewhat closer look and an uh, average situation for summer um, in the whole North Sea shows uh, on the one hand the mean change in wind speed, which is actually quite substantial in the areas where there are a lot of wind um, farm clusters. But in addition, we do have a general change in the um, residual currents, uh, which is actually substantial and covers almost the whole area. Um, and um, there is an additional change in sea surface elevation. Um, this is very small change, but it uh, shows that these deep poles actually, when there are a lot of wind farms clustering together, also these um, uh, system uh, response clusters into larger deep poles. And this also uh, impacts uh, the 
stratification of the system. Since the North Sea is a system that's, which is strongly impacted by tides, uh, we use the similar, uh, the same model setup to assess whether the tides actually mitigate these effects um, that have been described before. So there, uh, with the same um, unstructured grid model, uh, Niels performed simulations with tides and without tides and uh, looked at whether there is an impact on the on the process uh, magnitude. So on the left side here, you can see um, actually a representation on um, how the effects look during flood tide and how they look during ebb tide. And here you can already see that there is a very strong impact. And of course, that makes sense. Um, in this case, the wind actually comes nicely um, from the uh, southwest. So you have in case of a flood type, you do have an uh, alignment with the currents um, and you get this nice reduction of current speed and lee of the wind farms. Well, but of course, in uptides, the currents go in the other direction and um, you still have a reduction of the wind induced currents on the surface, which means that the actual current speed uh, becomes larger because it's going in the opposite direction. And um, this is a process uh, we haven't considered so much before, but it means that the effects are actually mitigated by the up um, streams. And it's not only um, the surface where we see that, but actually when you look in the vertical, you do see that it's actually going all the way to the um, seabed, which is here about 30 meters deep. Um, on the right side, um, I'm sorry. Um, on the right side, he um, estimated uh, the difference um, for a simulation with tides, uh, which is on the left side, and it's uh, current speed up here, and then there is stratification in the lower panel. And this is the same simulation, but uh, he did not force the simulation with tides. So there is no tides in this simulation. And in principle, you can see that the pattern is somewhat different, but what is most striking here is that the effect is actually about um and for the currents it's about 10 times or maybe five five times as high as it would be recitite um for the current speed and also for the stratification um the effects without tides are much stronger than with tides so here um he clearly concluded that this periodic tidal currents can mitigate the impact of the wind speed reduction over time due to the opposing changes in the horizontal flow. But we also see that in these um, very well mixed areas that um, comes with the tides in the shallow areas, um, that uh, this is kind of a secondary effect that mitigates um, the impact of the offshore wind parks because um, the tidal steering can influence the effects of the vertical transport and therefore attenuate the impacts of on temperature and salinity um, and stratification. So um, tides play a very important role and when you have a system with strong tides, um, these general effects can be mitigated by the tides. Um, so we also wanted to see what happened to the ecosystem now. Uh, and therefore we set up a different model system because we need the ecosystem model. And we used the model chain here with atmospheric forcing um, that I showed before, where we have um, offshore wind farms directly parameterized inside the atmospheric model. And then we do have a structured grid system uh, with a two kilometer resolution here that is coupled to a lower traffic level ecosystem model. This is a um, simple well, a flow diagram of this model. And it basically says that there are kind of three types of nutrient cycles simulated. Um, so we've had a plankton group, two so plankton groups. That's a very typical MPZ type model. And we run the system for one year only because of actually, um, it took us quite a while to run it. So we didn't have time to do more simulation. Um, and we did a spin up period of two years. First thing I looked at, do I see these deep poles? So this is a composite plot for wind directions from Southwest and you can nicely see in the vertical velocities that there is an upwelling pattern to the right of these clusters and then there is this um, down the 
down the link pattern to the left or well more or less inside these um, clusters and this is nicely in agreement with your just um, showed just for the whole area yes these uh, um, black polygons show the areas where we consider the wind talks so it's a hypothetical um, scenario right now if we change it or if we look at different wind directions this pattern changes so that's a good um, sign that this has been nicely covered by the model so if I've averaged that over the year, what are the impacts on the overall system dynamics? And here I looked at mixed layer depths um, and at current velocities. And for the mixed layer depths, I wasn't that surprised. There was a shallowing, general shallowing of the mixed layer since you kind of reduce the energy that's uh, mixing the surface layer. Um, what I was really surprised of that you see a uh, general decrease in the residual currents almost everywhere in that area, not only where you have the wind farms. While there are also still some areas where you actually see an increase in current velocities, and in some areas that can amount to up to 10% of the current velocities. Um, how does that affect the ecosystem? Um, well, this on the left side, you see a uh, representation of the prime production in the area. And you can nicely see the prime production is the highest in these um, front, uh, uh, tidal fronts. So this is a very typical situation um, in the North Sea. But you also see that many of the plant wind parks are situated in these frontal areas. Um, so what would we expect? the change to be and this is for the whole year but you can nicely see that they are actually pattern appearing but they are not only located to where your clusters are structured but they're actually uh, impacting the whole area and we have a general decrease of primary production in the situation uh, in the regions where the clusters are but there is an increase in the uh, locations around these clusters here and also at Dogger Bank so these are all areas that are very important and dynamic in the North Sea ecosystem and we expect that this might be actually play a role also for higher traffics. This is, I will not explain that very detailed, but it also shows that in especially the stratified areas, you would expect a vertical shift in your productivity related to these um, wind wakes of the system. Um, other uh, ecosystem variables we looked at were um, actually sediment biomass or well, biogenic carbon inside the uh, sediment. And also here we see a redistribution mainly related to the changes in the bottom shear stress. Um, and there is, uh, we saw that there is a stronger increase in sediment biomass in deeper areas where there is a bit of uh, uh, an increase in sediment biomass in the deeper areas and decrease in sediment biomass in shallow areas. Um, and what I thought was really most interesting was actually the dissolved oxygen in the bottom layer. Normally the North Sea is not an area that's very limited by oxygen, but uh, here in this area at Oyster Grounds, this is actually an area that can become hypoxic during autumn. Um, as it's uh, like a trough where um, the system contains uh, material. And um, that has also been shown before from uh, mooring data, for example, in oyster grounds on your sea. And in autumn, you have these very low oxygen situations. So we saw from the model that these low oxygen situations actually can be even more decreased, um, at least in the year we um, simulated. So. Um, I just wanted to show once more this kind of change in primary production versus marine protected areas. And I think it's important to keep in mind that the impacts we see from these large clusters of offshore wind farms are not very, not local. There are uh, changes that can be expected in a large, um, in a much larger environment. Now, the North Sea might be very special um, in that case, but maybe not. Well, needs to be assessed, I guess. Um, so the last part where I want to guide you very quickly through is um, this mixing in the ocean, um, which is a somewhat different process. And it's actually quite interesting because it might actually compensate for some of the changes that come from the wind wakes. Um, these are both um, figures from uh, a nice review paper from uh, Robert Joel last year and this shows that kind of when the um, currents meet the piles that they kind of induce these kind of mixing and um, vortices in lee of these uh, 
um, piles and uh, Jeff Carpenter, who's Jeff Bezos, um, has a huge experience with that. Um, and he hypothesized that that might kind of induce a nutrient flux into the euphotic zone and that's increased um, uh, productivity in the system. So we started to look at this um, as well, again, with the same unstructured grid system we had before, um, implementing and uh, trying different things here. Oh, apologies. <laughs> um, trying different things here, like using a direct implementation of um, these files versus a direct parametrization um, that comes from simulations um, that uh, Jeff's group have been doing. And then we wanted to see, um, is the effect actually smaller than the wind waves? Because we would expect, well, they were a bit smaller in space at least. And um, what we found was that this effect is actually in the same order of magnitude as the effect that we expect from the wind waves. And here is um, the changes in current speed changes and the change in stratification. Um, and you see that for the current speed changes, in fact, we found also again decrease while the stratification change is actually the opposite to what we expect from the uh, wind waves. I put that side by side here just to give a bit of an uh, idea about this. This is the change in potential energy anomaly um, for the, oh, sorry. Um, for the simulation with the atmospheric wave versus the, the simulation, uh, I don't touch it anymore, versus the simulation with the pile effect itself. Um, and there you can see for the stratification, it goes kind of in an opposite direction, while um, for the current speed, it's a bit more complicated. And uh, um, what the next step would be, um, in the, in the future is actually to combine these effects to see what the net effect actually um, will be. So to summarize, um, we see that these offshore wind farms alter the physical condition on um, that it results in large scale anomalies and not only very local anomalies. And we have an ecosystem response, which is also large scale and tends to restructure um, the productivity in the system, but also carbon sediments or bottom water oxygen are impacted. Um, and it needs to be kept in mind that there are far field effects, really far field effects that might, for example, um, impact other areas, marine protected areas, um, and that need to be assessed um, clearly uh, while considering these offshore wind parks. Um, there are also a lot of things that we don't know, of course. Um, well, this is just a bit of a list. Um, um, I did not set up recommendations here, um, but I think what what the major recommendation is take keep in mind that there is not just a local effect that the whole thing will change and the tides play an important role. Um, and uh, yes, in terms of modeling, clearly I also don't think that it's very. I mean, scale, uh, spatial scales are important, um, as Johan said, but it's not the most important thing. It just needs to be um, clearly, the system needs to be clearly represented to cover um, these uh, changes. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, apologies for the interruption. No, you're fine. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll take one or two quick questions before moving to the next. Um, Josh and then, okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for those those two related talks. My question is that you showed in both talks some impacts on current stratification, uh, primary production DO. Can you comment on how those changes scale to natural variability, either like within season or even week to week or year to year? Are these of the same order, smaller, larger? Um, I think it can be in the same order. Well, at least for the productivity, but clearly the seasonal variability um, in the North Sea, for example, is super large. Um, so um, since we have a very clear seasonal cycle in productivity, so that's much larger than this effect. But for the interannual variability, I think it's like 10%. Um, that can be in the range of what you would expect um, in interannual variability. Um, However, what I what I forgot to say is actually when you integrate over the whole area, 
um, the net change in prime production, for example, was very small, was almost not there. So it's less about a net change in prime production and more about a redistribution in both space and time. And I think that's important to um, consider. Thank you, um, York. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I had a question about the um, explicit integration of the foundations into the hydrodynamic model. If if I saw correctly, your grid resolution ranges between four meters and one thousand meters in those simulations, um, and with yeah. typical foundation sizes of let's say eight ten meters. Um, of course, the resolution of the grid is nowhere near fine enough to capture all the local processes around the foundation foundation so i was wondering how, how you model the foundations and and what the value of that explicit relatively coarse integration is uh, in 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 that model yeah that's a actually that's a very long story and um just can certainly say even more on this because the parameterization is cut from his model this is explicit integration we actually had a couple of more problems that's why we chose for the final simulation the direct parameterization um since the schism model is uh, uh has a or uses a hydrostatic assumption and that doesn't work on these very fine scales so um in the paper um from Niels that just came out like two three weeks ago and uh, um, jeff and myself of course or so um he makes an assessment on this um implementation of these uh, of these foundations and um, clearly explained why it's very uh, why it's probably not so appropriate using that in a hydrostatic model um, but yeah that's a very long story so I recommend to look into the paper and maybe talk to Jeff as well hey, thank you Christina you had a uh, or do you want to respond or do it later. Okay. I, I wasn't sure if you had your hand up to make a comment, but I had, I had questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, look, maybe Christina, you had a question in the chat. Did you want to ask that? And then we'll come back to your question. Thank you. My question is in the chat too. And I'm concerned about several of the figures that you showed the numerical simulations had an incredible amount of numerical noise that can potentially mask the real results, uh, emphasize them, e exaggerate them. When I see a, a figure full of blue and red dots everywhere, so far away from the location where the perturbations actually occurred, I'm very, very concerned and I'm very aware of the uh, numerical noise, um, chaos seeding issues that uh, some models have. So I'm wondering if you've taken care of this problem in any way. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just very suspicious of, of these results. Um, lots of cinematic noise came actually also from the um, atmospheric forcing, but um, I actually checked the signal to this noise signals in the surrounding, and the signals from the simulation was um, significantly stronger than from the noise. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeff, did, you had a question? Yeah. Yeah, hi, Uta. Uh, it's Jeff here. I'm in the United States, actually. So I, I had a question. If you've looked at, for the wind wake parameterizations, have you, have you looked at different types of parameterizations and any effects that that would have on the results? Mm, no, I haven't. For the simulations we had, we just had this kind of one simulation, which took months to do in the atmosphere. So um but navit is currently working also on well not on different types of parameterization but on different types of um parameter settings for the i mean i'm not sure what whether you mean parameterization or the parameter settings um for the uh for the clusters so i think he's um they're testing uh these different um types like hub height changes in hub height and changes in density of um um, piles to see how that affects the results, but we haven't um, made simulations for that yet. And then maybe one quick other question was on the primary productivity results. So these dipoles, they show, you know, positive and negative anomalies. 
and then you see very little net change in in NPP. And is that just because these dipoles kind of have a canceling nature to themselves? Um, yes, but also because they are not very consistent. I mean, you have constantly changing um, wind directions. So um, what I showed were actually uh, on plot where it basically just analyzed the situations with that wind directions. Um, but in reality, this is also constantly changing. So I think that's one of the reasons. And then it's, the effects, I think, also cancel each other out. We're going to hear about hydrodynamic models, uh, methods, assumptions, and conclusions, and how these translate to the Nantucket Shoals region. And we have three presentations. Um, the first of these will be by Zhang Xin Chen, who is a professor at the School for Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. And I think it's fair to say that he is the person behind the development of the finite volume community ocean model that we've already heard referenced in presentations this morning. And so he's going to talk to us today about some of the uh, about, about the model and some of the uh, applications of the model for looking at offshore wind farms. So, Chen. Oh, Is everyone can see that? Okay, like I, I, I pull it like a presentation mode. So, okay, I mean, uh, okay. So, when I talk today, you know, we talk about the potential impact of offshore renewable energy for environment issues in Northeast region. So, we this project you no know, first funded by Bond, the two thousand fourteen. Later, we get a NOAA. So we get a lot of people involved in the project. You know, we get a, a fisheries people like a Kevin Strawberry, like a Pingo. We also had a fiscal oceanography like a like a Bob Beasley in the Woods Hall, and also had a you know had a right away person, the Scott Garrick. Okay, in the Woods Hall, you know, this project is working by you know UMass and the Woods Hall together. Okay, so uh, okay, okay, why not able to move? Okay, so look about the structure here, you know, look at the wind farm. So we see interesting, look at, so we get a whole region, you look at Northeast region, you get a Massachusetts and the Long Island water. So they have a larger area in the region, they're all Northeast region. So this look about, you know, Glen Lock talk about a lot of fiscal ocean already. I probably don't need to go so, so many anymore. But we look at the circulation, the pattern here. So that's the whole offshore wind farm area. So you get a circulation for Cape Cod region, also come from Georgia Bank, and also a big front circulation come down. So, you know, when this region, the Northeast region, the Massachusetts water and the Long Island water, so they already had a night company get the lease. They will be deployed the wind turbine into system. The only show that before, when we get a 2014, they said that they put a 136 wind turbine into system. But now only one company come from, you know, like a like winter farm. So they will be put here, small, the yellow region here, the half region, put hundreds. That means you get a lot of wind farm, you know, there. So so even this one here, they get a, you know, they get a lot of generation wind farm region, but also they put a, you know, tower region is 16 feet. So what do you do? You have to, Think about result system here, then look about what a structure here. This picture shows you the scallop distribution for fish data. So you see that most of the region is very interesting. You get a, you know, you get a, a mid-Atlantic by a larger population scallop there. I think Ellen will do a lot of work about this, right? So they also had a Georgia Bank region, had a one here. You look at the Nantucky Saw region, this region here, you don't you don't have a lot of uh, scallop. You know, magic over here, but that's to put a wind farm there. The question is how they affect that. So, so you look about the picture here. I want to see most scallop we find over there, they're swarming on the Georgia Bank, a great sausage channel. When it's swarming the Georgia Bank region, they're swarming there. So then the larvae were moving down by the current. Then 40 days later, they settle down 
in the bottom. So the red one, the surface, that amount the simulation. So we do a 40 year simulation for the scholar. So then the blue one is all settled down here. Okay, most of settled down, but in a lot of lava will settle down on the, in the, on the southern New England shock and the Nantucket soil region. But then the question, the problem, you know, then you then, then you look about the, you look about the, you know wind farm. You said okay, now I put a wind farm there. I put an individual wind turbine into system, so they get a you know vortex wake, right? So okay, I call a vortex wake over there. That's the model simulation. You can see a lot of wake can generate there. So the question here, you know, does this is really true on the uh, Nantucket soil region? Does it can be happen in the region like this? So we then we we was doing okay. So we was questioning here. Then you look at the circulation pattern. I'll probably skip this one because Glenn will talk a very really nice talk and show about whole things here. So that's the red one is the surface circulation. The blue, you know, the white one is uh, like a steep circulation. You can see the circulation. One, two circulation. One is come from Gulf region, go down Cape Cod region, uh, Ronnie region. Another one is uh, come from Georgia Bank circulation, come here. This region is a flu through system. It's not a, like, you look about North Sea, they have a basin, like a, a semi enclosed basin, but in our region, everything's open. Okay, they just go through the system there. So that's why you, flew, they also have a one, you know, you know Gulf Stream, the one core ring, the like Glenn was mentioning about it. There's also a lot of intrusion in the shopping region. So then we want to see that for long term, you know, Gulf Stream is really important, or oh, level sea water come down. For, for short term, they get stronger tide current over there, so it was happened. So I want to show you some kind of work we done before. You know, I think it's uh, Anthony and the Hall and the game department. So he had answered proposal funding for CODA measurement. So we get uh, Bob Beasley and uh, Steve Lance and working together. I do the modeling, Anthony do the observation. That's the region, left side region, they do the CODA measurement. So that's the data coverage. You see that? You look about the, you know, signal, you know, semi is a very dominant energy in the region. You know, the dinatized model in polar semi M2 types is very dominant. So we compare with the model and the core that data, tied the simulation really match each other, had a simulation, but even you had a lot of data uncertainty, but you still get a very match of a tie. But then the no question here that you, you you can do this one here. So you look at the ties in our region. This is the whole Georgia Bank, the government region stronger tie. In over here, Nantucket so, some region, that Nantucket so region, they get a lot of uh, tide generation eddy around the around the island. So this circulation can be stronger forced back over there at all time, all time region. That's why you know region is very different from what we saw in the other region. Okay, so like uh, you know, we mentioned here today, the grand mentioned that wind driving circulation is one order smaller than tide. Well, you know, you have to look low pass filter, you can see how the wind driving circulation. So most strongly daily variation is tide. So then a question here, then we also have a noise stone. Because a lot of stone come in, noise stone come here. So stone come here, they can they carry the big, you know, they carry you know, very strong wind. You know, they get a lot stronger wave, also wave very really important. When stone come here, they can surface the wave. In Nantucket soil region, you know, when stone come here, way high can be 10 meter. 10 meter high the wave. And the stone come here. When you have a hurricane, for example, we only had one hurricane really across our region in the Hurricane Bob, 1991. So that's time I was student in the Woods Hall, Ocean Avenue Sushi. So we we all uh, electricity down, everything down over there. So you can see the when the stone, you know, hurricane come, the rice had a big wave come here around the region. So that's the way you come here, you got a wind turbine, how to interact with this. Okay, that's why you get a short turn, you get a no east stone, you get a you know, you get a you get a you get a hurricane, uh, you no know, long turn, you get a gulf stream meandering, all other things. You know, that's a lot of physical process over there. So we have a developed model called North, Northeast Coast Ocean Forecast System called NECOP. At the time we was the the near, near coast funding us. That's is atmosphere ocean couple model system. 
So we next thing is global model and a regional model and also West Coast model. This model, West Coast model is a 10 meter resolution, include region here. The Antarctic soil region is about 100 meter resolution. So ocean, we use this model to use for ocean rescue. The rest of ocean rescue doing fully covered. We had a full inundation model. I don't want to talk about it anymore. But we talk about the Antarctic soil region. But use this model system, we run for 40 years. We had a 40 year hourly data build up, data simulation, the whole region. So then use this affair. So we compare with, uh, you know, uh, some of these, uh, you know, CODA data. Okay, that's the movie show you, but low pass filter, the low frequency circulation, see how they change with the monthly. Uh, the red one is the model, and the blue one is the CODA data. The red one is the CODA data, the, the black one is the model, you know, model. You see that it really match well aware with the resolution high. So then we do the drift study. Let's have a drift study. Now this uh, drift study is called observation and the modeling is really match, you know, showing the color AD simulation of this here. So based on the study, we saw the can we do the official wind, wind farm? So the question, you know, like we took it to today, if you do the wind farm, you have to resolve the wind termite. How you do the wind termite? So we working with the company, you know, wind the wind, we get their design. They have a two layoff. The one left here, there's a layoff of one, layoff of two. Now, a couple of questions here, you know, first thing, you, can you model resolve the wind termite? If you resolve the wind termite, how to look at that? The second question, how they affect for, <coughs> you know, e ecosystem? We do the scalp of population model, see how population is move. So I just, I go, go quickly, the model resolution one meter included, but this is nesting with the global, regional, and the local model. We call it Nantucket Sun model, include New York Harbor, this region, we can put all the wind fine termite into a system. So that's a whole nesting. You get a really true environment in the region. So we also run for mineralogy model later, I show you, and the three mineralogy model couple together, see how the wind changes. Okay, so that's what we do. The population model, I'll describe more about this. So then in 2014, Bang finally said, we want to see how the hurricane, how the northeast storm can affect that. So we do this one here. We finally know, really depend on how your storm come from. For northeast storm, the case 100 years storm, you see the big change in the way. So the way change a lot. If we talk about the circulation, talk about the way, way, but then you can see the way change a lot. If a hurricane come here, they not affect, if we put a wind termite here, we put a 135 wind termite. You find a hole here, you know, in the coast region can be really changed in a big way. You can cause a lot more significant inundation future if a hurricane come from south. If a northeast storm come from northeast, you see whole region, the wind, we can be changed in that region too. So then look at the bottom, you know, habitats. You can see the bottom habitats. This H point is the wind termite. You can see how the wind termite changes the bottom circulation. You can cause a lot of, you know, residual circulation near the bottom. The sediment can be changes. So that's the first study we do for bomb. We only put a 135 wind termite. But now they change, everything changes, story changes. Okay, so, so then we do a 40 year, you know, night simulation, you see the scalper, scalper, you know, you know, scalper, you know, assemble energy. You see the percentage, you know, this is the mean distribution, a lot of larvae stay here in the region. But then, okay, you no know, variability, much variability is the New England shelf region. Variability, very larger variability. Okay, your Georgia Bank very stable, that's the variability. So we do this one here, however, when you run for basic model without the wind farm, you see that's the settle down the larvae, you run for the four year recruit the model, you find that that's the observation, show you, that's, that's the observation of the model. No many larvae can survive into New England shelf region. They all because of habitats, all things there. So most of uh, the high the region is stayed on the, still like observation, like a great South China or Georgia Bank. But in the region, most die. We run for 40 years simulation, we found all the problem. I talked to the scalpel scientists, they told me it's a basic issue. It's a habitat issue, cause the problem, or temperature, 
also cause a problem. But then we want to see how they affect the balance. Now we do a really wind simulation. So that's the model we do for 100 year, the 100 wind turbine we put into like an industry design. So this is a, the movie show you how to change the circulation look like. Each one is the winter turbine. Okay, so we don't put the transition in there, which is around the simulation. So you look about it when you zoom in, you want to see individual termite. You see the red one is the part of TC, the blue one is the negative TC. So you did not see like a vortex wake, okay? The old time over here, but you do see the change with time, the time cycle, red one, you see individual, the right red one is the part of TC, the blue one is the negative TC. They change with the time cycle. Now one, two times per day, because same with Diana. So they tend to short. So they don't have a steady circulation over there. That's why you don't you do see the you know wind shocking shortly, but it's patient very quickly. Okay, you see that's what high cycle individual circulation over there. That's really resolved for the winter my mother. You know, you're doing this one. So that's why our northeast region is very different from the European region. No, because we get so open, right? Because so strong a tide. So that's the circulation can become different. So then I look about, you know, look about here, you look at the whole tide cycle. You see over here, you see that's the part of what is negative what is So you the what is change with time with the side cycle. So the influence region, okay, they do have an AD shooting, but AD shooting takes place very quickly, like a rent and walk. But then they all just because the, the water also, the region is really stratified. That's why our region is completely different from other regions because we so strong a tide, tide circulation. So then you look about, you know, circulation. That's what you find. You know, you look about the surface, the bottom, red one is the bottom, the blue and the black one is the surface because the water is stratified. That's the surface current and the bottom current not to go to the same direction. So you see the most lee side of the surface over here, the bottom is that direction. When, it, when they change with the tide cycle, they change with the tide cycle, a long time, if you do the average, I do the three months average, you see that's the bottom, you know, that's the, that's the bottom stress. The bottom stress is a change here and here, but scale is not very big. No, Jeff, when you ask a question, say how large your effect is. It's only about a 50, no, 50 meter, Ch big, significant change and the 50 meter in the local termite. But then you look about the you know, maximum, you know, for three months, that's the maximum you can find. But you look at the water column, the mixing water column, they most everywhere. Okay, the bottom stress look very, North, east, north, south orientation, but the water color mixing, adverse casting around the whole region. Also maximum, you can see the AD shooting, some region you can see, but not like a steady, like we found so frequently. Okay, that's what happened. So then what really happened is, you know, you look about this one here, this is the winter mine, we put here 100 winter mine here. You look at the bottom stress, this top mines without winter mine, the bottom one with termite, you find the most bottom stress intensified, or bit larger, not in the winter mine region, was in the shallow region and Nantucky Sound. Because that's a shallow, that's a shallow region, that's very, because it's a little bit deeper than 40 and 50 meter, but here it's like a 30 and 40 meter. That's the bottom stress that can be changed a lot. So then you do the transect, you want to transect, you want to see what happened. You want to have a transect over here, you find that this, this top one is without a wind turbine. That's the great south channel or the water here. You see that that's a like cold water you know, in the deep channel. But that's the wind turbine was using here. But after you we put a wind turbine in, they, they suck the water and you know, they put upwelling. The upwelling strongly from the great south channel club onto the Nantucky soil region. That means you can bring a lot of nutrients into the system. So then the effect here, you can have a cold water intruding from the surrounding Great South China region to here for the wind fire. That's why the reason because the bottom stress and the shallow region become so strongly 
Okay, the circulation region changes. So that's the that's the, we we last model run for nesting model. So then we look at the uh, no larvae distribution, no fish larvae, no not like a scalp larvae distribution. You look at one here. We look about. We also consider about uh, the semi diurnal diurnal the behavior, the phytoplankton, no no like a uh, larvae. But this the, this one's without wind termite is include termite. What happened? Everything moving offshore. Everything move offshore. This, this morning I talked to one person. You no, know, he was a European people said so the talk is there. He finally you know if a wind termite the circulation was drifting, like Ekman folk drifting. So we find a similar thing you see here. This one without the wind termite, this one without a termite, you see everything move offshore. So I keep talking to the fishermen, they feel very happy because the close region box is that's a closing area. That's a closing area for fish reservation. Okay, that's why they say all oh, larvae stay there, they probably get more scalp, you know, because they're not they they're not allowed to catch over there. Okay, but then you look publishing the same way. We do the many simulation. Okay, many years of simulation, we found all the same pattern, all the same pattern. Okay, so then we'll, we do the static analysis to ensemble, he include all the swinging behavior. Okay, we find, you know, this is a result of wind termite up level is below as a wind termite. So you can see they're all moving, you know, offshore. Then that's the reason you get a transport moving offshore. That's the reason you get intrusion water for you get offshore transport over there. Then you get intrusion water come from in the bottom. That's the reason it affects the region that we find. So that's what happened. We find here. So now you look about how the wind can be changes. So you look about we put a hundred wind termites here. So we run a war for a whole year for one meet, one climate resolution. So we win the termite. So we look about how the energy, we use the termite height, 121 meter, use the industry design. So we know how the low tree, the, the diameter, the 180 meter. So we know what the, you know, what the parameter put the model, we run a wall. That's, I do the whole scene average, you see over here, that's springtime. If we have a wind termite there, all the wind effect in this side, on the lee side, not every place. So in the summertime, you see this side, because the wind might come from the southeast, you see this side can be changed, but this side is not changing much. But then you see the autumn, the fall, you see the wind, most, a lot of very beautiful wind, you see the region still was in the lee side over there. If That's the hundreds of wind termite, how the wind changes. So then in the winter time, you see the most whole area can be changes. Because wind time, you know, wind come from, you know, northeast region. So that's why you can see the very big, strong the wind. So the wind changes. So then you want to see how the circulation can change. So I didn't show the movie, show you how the circulation changes. So this one, you know, this one show you, you know, uh, you know without the wind, you know, you have affected by the, you know, the wind not changes. This one had a consider wind changes by turbine. You see, they still show the same pattern. You still show the offshore things go there, but however, they're more concentrated. Over there, you see this one's a little bit spare, this one is pushing to be larger, this one's smaller. So that means you now, even you don't consider wind changes, you you know, you put the wind termite into the system, you really can call offshore transport, enhance the transport. Okay, you can do the circulation can be much complicated. Okay, so that's the basic we found. So then, what a what a reason? Uh, you know, when we do the study, you no, know, I think uh, we have got the Bob Beasley, Bob, Be Bob said, you no, know, let us do the dispersion study. See how this uh, happened. So we said, okay, let us put the only you know particle, not the, like a larvae. Okay, put the particle there. So this one is without wind termite with termite. We found uh, include wind termite. Dispersion becomes smaller. No, because you got a larger, larger dispersion, dispersion, when they include termite, dispersion very smaller. You see here, it's very narrow. Okay, if you put, a, put everything here in the inside of wind termite, you see here, they, they change a lot. Then you look at this one here, is this without a wind termite, dispersion really bigger. Everything is spread out. You include termite, 
You see here, it was a dispersion vehicle become narrow. Dispersion smaller. That's why when you include the wind turbine system, Holland dispersion changes. Okay, that's the, the, the circulation can be changes. Okay, that's all basically we found. So then a question, another question about the industry design. Because they get a, you know, D1 de designing, they said, okay, I can put the wind turbine like this way. I can put the east and north like this way. Okay. Even separation scales the same, but location different, orientation different. Now, how this designing can affect it about circulation? So we find, you know, they do affect it, but not like, a, you know, current, it does affect it. That's a, that's a layoff one, layoff two. You see that very similar, but change is very smaller, not very bigger, but they do change it, right? But not like a, we think of a significant like a, like, like current, like a tide. So that's what happened. So now the question come up, you know, climate change. You now climate change here, you know, Graham has mentioned this, had a warming system here. So this is uh, 2010, they got a big warming here. So we do a, a, a simulation for 40 years simulation regional model. We find, you know, bottom temperature change a lot. Because of warming, so you can see the about you know the Georgia southern Georgia Bay can much stratified. Okay, much, the grading can be much stronger while warming. So then we find transport. You know, before you get all transport go to south, but now the transport large availability. You know, the annual availability the southern transport here change a lot. So then you also see you know you have a you have a Gulf Stream meandering. They can put the water in here. A lot of uh, one core AD can be affected region. Okay, so that's why we finally you know how to do the climate change. So to address the question, we do a couple of things. First thing is we do a couple model. We already couple with uh, our wind re wind resolving termite model with the atmospheric model wall. Before I just run the wind, you know, ch the termite change the wind. Wind drive the ocean. But now we do the whole couple. You know, instantly your ST changes, affect the warp model, see how they changes. So that's the model we developed, okay? Uh, last couple of years, my student published a paper in 2022 in the proper oceanography. So then we four things we validate the model. We also make a new designing for the four nesting model, the one, two, three, four. So that's for the model, the couple model system. Each one, we have a nesting model wrong for a couple model. You resolve the wind turbine, you got to win to see what happened. Okay, that's the whole domain. Uh, we got a one camera resolution in our model. So we get one meter resolution wind turbine model. Okay, so then, uh, then, uh, then the, the simulation results, we do the testing for Hurricane Sandy. We find that the LC coupling change a lot. Okay, if without the LC coupling, that's the hurricane pack. With the coupling, get it this way, get it very close. The pressure simulation, I don't want to talk too much about this. We find it's a LC, the, the energy flux is very important. But now we make a tools ready. We can run this one to simulate how the wind turbine is. Last one, I want to show this kind of climate change model. We also, look at, like people talking about the Earth model. So we working then together. We already couple Earth into the knee cup. We have a fully coupled Earth model with the NICOP region, uh, simulation of region. So we already run for many years. That's the data we compare region here. We run this couple region, we compare the old model. This model is good. They go, they go to the uh, PCO2, PhD. They have a low traffic food web model. So I just quickly go through. That's the comparison uh, come out. My student had a PSCC doing that. We can simulation the nutrient simulation phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, simulation whole region. We do a uh, many year simulation, uh, come out uh, is a uh, coverage model, pretty good for region. So then last things I want to talk about downscaling. So we have, you know, mineralogy downscaling. We run uh, for a uh, global regional mineralogy model, downscaling model. So we get regional wolf model, climate change model, three climate resolution. We run for, we prediction for 2050. So we run the climate change model. What we found, we found for 2050, 
stratification change a lot. The springtime, you get a you get a stratification intensify significantly, but in the fall summer you get more stone. We don't know our climate change model correct or not. At least we find a stone number in the 2050 had a much more than before. You get a more stone, so you find in our region, you know, the spring or summertime water becomes very stratified. In the fall, you get a enhanced the mixing. That's why the question come out, you know, if you include a wind farm, what's really happen, right? So we had a physical part, we tried to do the simulation, use this way to see what happened. So the basically, you know, that's what I talk. So we has been, we find, you know, you really need to resolve the wind turmoil. If you really want to do simulation. So that's the reason we have a wind turmoil resolving the model. So we get a physical biological model developed. Uh, region, we do the assessment, but really question, we do the only one design. Now they have a, you know, night company where put all the wind termites there. So what accumulation effect, we don't know, right? You took a hundred year already significant change, you put a solid, what happened? So result we find here today, probably not a true anymore. We will put more. That's why I saw this really, you know, important thing to understand accumulation effect. Okay, that's what I, I basically what I talked today. Okay. okay. I do, I go too too fast, but I put <laughs> yeah. a PowerPoint here. So, you know, if everyone is interested, you can look at my PowerPoint file. Yeah, wow. Lots of interesting simulations okay. and things to think about. Uh, maybe we'll take one question and then we'll uh, move on to the next presentation. If there is a question. Yes, Richard. Clarification. Yeah. Tidal mixing, sorry. Yeah. Tidal mixing was really important in your modeling effort. How widespread would that be in the larger area, though? Okay. Yeah. You know, larger, you no, know, the government region, you know, so this whole government region, you had a couple of tidal mixing zone. Nantaki saw is the one attack mix zone. If you look at tide, very interesting uh, feature there. Tidal system in the region, there are two tidal systems. One is a tidal come from government publication down, another New England shelf come down. Nantucket soil region is a converging zone. There's a tidal converging zone. That region tidal mixing very strongly. So like a, the most like a rare tax mixing on the, on the close to the Great South China side. But another side is you now New England shop region, that's the mixed region. But the whole region will water be you no know, shallow than a 40 meter tide, very important. Now they're like a 40 or 50 meter, very stronger tide mixing. So I mean, just to be sure I understand that full region of all nine. But no, no, you know, Nova Scotia had one region. So sorry, Georgia Bank and then Nantucket Sound. Sorry. I just I'm we're, we're really concerned about the, the area that's subsumed by those nine projects mm -hmm. south of the vineyard and the Nantucket. So my question was really just focused on that one area. Yeah. So is that full area one where tidal mixing, whether it's a diurnal or semi-diurnal tide, is important to work, be considered in, in the modeling? I should have said it's important, but however, stratification also important. You know, because reason, you know, because the region is very stratified. So in the Nantucket soil region, in like a summertime and the springtime is very really stratified. So this you no know, stratification really strong. It had a cold pool there, okay, region there. That's why tidal mixing strongly, but stratification was important. You know, so you combine both together. Not every mix, every region is mix it. But it's still stratified. So it's right. But the wind, you put the wind turbine in there, you enhance the mixing. But however, the mixing is locally, right? Locally, the locally in the locally about a 50 meter around the wind turbine, but this is very intensified. But the, however, they change the whole transport surface current. As Glenn mentioned today, they can uh, show big flow, they can uh, intrusion water. We found, uh, you know, I didn't show the result. We found this region here. If we wind turbine this region here, you can uh, surface currents go offshore. The bottom currents go in. So you probably can in the future can in, in, enhance the intrusion water for short break region. Okay, yeah. No, yeah. One, one another thing is, 
one of the things I want to forget to mention, we do a climate change study for mixed layer. When the warming gets mixed with shallow, wind termite include push water offshore. But include stratification, the shallow mixed layer, they put the water you flow in. Hmm. That's why two things will compete each other. You don't know what's really happened. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Christina yeah. and Jeff, I think you had a question. Or I loved your your setup with the variable resolution mm. domain and the high resolution mm. around the wind turbine. So there's no parameterization. Yeah. You resolve it. What I just can't understand is how it's possible that you show us results where the effects of the of the uh, foundation are yeah. limited within 30 to 50 meters of yeah. the turbines. They are absolutely gone, gone from the domain in 100 meters. And yet you see regional impacts 500 kilometers away. What does that? How can it be? Oh, yeah. Physically, what, what can possibly do okay. that? Okay, you mean, no, no, we, we put like a wind turbine, like a, you know, like a small region, 100 meters, right? But then the question, they got a lot of mass scarce, you know, circulation changes. So then they push the water surface offshore, region, offshore. So then there's you, nothing left, you know, <laughs> there's nothing. To oh, push, <laughs> uh, no, no. If they have a current to go out, right? Sure. So then, what happens? You crew out. So then, the surrounding water get in the compensation. The water in. That's the reason the water. If you look at tide, you, you see nothing because it's moving like this way. But then you feel the tide out. You do see low frame circulation changes. You know, from from Great South China flowing up, compensation of water loose was in the region. So that's a, that's why we find it's a most significant change in the that's shallow nearby region, not in the winter my region, around the region has a very shallow. You, you look at Pacific there, here's a, here's a deep, here's a shallow. Yeah. But the strongest effect cannot possibly be away from the location where it's caused. There's nothing that it's like there's some kind of a convergence of small effects that converge somewhere else and become stronger. That is not natural. It, oh no, it's, it's I, no. I, I, see what, I believe it's a, now. You leave an individual termite there. That's why we do like, we do like analysis right now. We have a big like box model in region, so we want to see how much net transport changes uh, between the winter my region. So then we want to see how the water intrusion how the because we get a. We want to calculate what the mass balance, see how the balance will come in. So then we'll see how the water, why the water can intrude in the deep region come down, come up. So you look about circulation there, you want to see that. So, you know, so you look about, because if you only want to put one or two, it's not effective much. But you will put a hundreds, hundreds there. That's why the whole region, you know, you, you look at, you look at, you know, particle tracking, dispersion, dispersion change. You see the whole water just moving out. Okay, that's that they do have, but uh, you know, no, probably I'm not able to address your question well aware. Okay, but that's why you know the simulation you do see this one because if we do the region is nesting, this model is a region model, nesting model there, region is really far away, the model region, so that's why you're not affected. But you know, the reason we run the model for you know, you when you go to boundary, you you, you can be affected, right. But we have to not reach the boundary. We find all the side of circulation not much change, it, but just transport change. It. Yes. Okay. Sounds like. But we can talk. Yeah. Need further discussion. Um, okay. Jeff and then Doug. Yeah. Please. Yeah. I, I. It seems to me like there's two different ways of including the turbine effects in the ocean. You know, there's the sort of bulk parameterization where you say this patch is wind farm, and I'm going to extract a certain amount of momentum from that patch mm -hmm. that. Uh, that's provided by the drag formulas or some other law. And then there's the method that you chose, which is to actually resolve or try to resolve the, the individual wakes with a really high resolution around the structures themselves. And I guess, um, you know, you chose a very challenging approach, but um, I wonder how, how well do you think that that model is representing these small scale turbulent wake effects? You know, it, it should have a parameterization that's, I think capable of dealing with those types of flows and and the effects that you would expect in those very small scale rapidly changing flows. So, how, like, how well do you, how confident are you in what the model's doing there? You know, the, that's a very good question. You know, I should honestly say, you know, because we use the term as a closure model, we validate the closure model for tidal mixing before. 
okay, my, you know, like Georgia Bank region be validated. But we find, you know, we use the Mela Yamada, you know, terms of closure scheme. This model, uh, this scheme is really good simulation tied the mixing, but not, a, not for wind mixing. Okay, wind mixing sometimes is fair, okay. But tied the mixing, they can result very well. So we compare with the observation data, terms of measurements, comes pretty good. But then you, when you want to go to small scale, the questions my address, you know, I run a simulation with a hydrostatic approximation. You know, hydrostatic approximation. But when you go to one meter resolution, you have to turn on a non-hydrostatic. You have to consider convection. So I didn't mention here, no, LC couple more we do is non-hydrostatic. The hurricane simulation we did is non-hydrostatic. So when we do the hurricane simulation, so we find that when you turn non-hydrostatic, convection can cause a really important uh, impact. But then uh, Ken Brink told me, he said, turn. Now, when we test the hurricane, we do the resolution is about, uh, you know, one kilometer, you know, you know, you know 500 meters in the short region. The cancer is not result of non-hydrostatic. It's true. We compare with the model non-hydrostatic, no, hydrostatic, non-hydrostatic. If resolution not, horrendous resolution not enough, you didn't resolve. But in the deep ocean, we result very well, well when the short region not. But when winter turn my model, we run it now, we have been turned on the non-hydrostatic. So we want to see how the convection, because we find, uh, you know, convection probably more important than the diffusion when the small scale come in. So I don't get an answer yet, but the system we have right now, we have a non-hydrostatic. So when you turn on a really high LC couple model, you have to run the non-hydrostatic for a small scale, like a one meter. <clears throat> okay. No, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I'm, first of all, I need some time to digest all of this, of course, but um, but and not just not just chins. But um, one thing does occur to me, uh, and I know we can't do it because we don't have the the turbines aren't in the water yet. But hmm. are there some examples, either Chen with yours or some of our our European colleagues that presented earlier, uh, use of some data source, uh, remotely sensed data or otherwise, to actually test against the model predictions. And I, I look at things like the, the yeah. productivity predictions from the models in the North Sea, yes, yeah. and I understand that they're different systems, but um, are we using any available data to, to ground truth and verify some of the model yeah. predictions? You know, you know we, when we do a regional model, uh, this model we run, uh, we use our Hank's model wrong. This include all data simulation, include a temperature, CAT, current simulation to, for whole region. So uh, we compare with uh, the SAT data, compare comparison the region, they're pretty good. But the problem is when you go to downscaling, uh, like a uh, wind turbine resolve system, one meter resolution there. So we don't have a data compare. That's why we don't know the temperature simulation we get there, stratification correctly or something correctly. That's only the model result. So recently we are working on a Osta company, Osta company. So they has been make like a three region measurement. They got a control area. When they put a winter mine, they put a measurement temperature salinity. So they already give us data, but the problem with this data is before they, we put the winter mine in, you know, this is like regional scale. So compare come out pretty good, but the question come out to us, you know, after they put the winter mat into system, how they change it? So we have no data. So I saw the Musa group, uh, no, Anthony's group, they get DOE funding. They will put like a MORI into the system. So they will be measured temperature over there. But we really want to wait, see what's happened after they put the winter mat in. We don't have the data yet. We don't compare yet. Okay. That's a very good question. That's why you don't know what the model correct. So now we just uh, make a technology develop, but uh, that's that's ground true or not? We don't know. <laughs> All right, one one last question. Okay, comment. Yeah, yeah. I have just one comment is yeah. that re regarding ground truth, we have a unique uh, moment now. If we do measurements now before the turbines are in, we can do it after, and then that gives right. a very good uh, basis for that. And I think that's up to. Yeah, maybe the developers and boom to focus that. Jen, you mentioned that you use data simulation in your modeling. How, how do you do that when you now make changes? 
you have data simulation, you simulate the situation as it is now historically, and then you put in turbines, and what happens then with the oh, no. data simulation? No, uh, with the turbine model, we don't do data simulation anymore. That's the nesting model wrong. We, we run the regional model, and the whole domain, include the gas stream, include everything there. So that's a hell of data simulation. So once you offer simulation, when you do the wind turbine, we use the nesting boundary. We get a nesting boundary, I just put a nesting boundary there to drive with a one-way nesting. We didn't do the two-way nesting yet. Do one-way nesting. That's why the you know, boundary change with time. Because it's an unstructured model. So you can you don't need to have an interpretation. Just I know you have a mic, it's an unstructured model. So you you, you don't need that. You just output, you put it there, you can run it. But then the important thing you want to make sure your running period is not too long. You don't want to have the water catch the boundary. That's why you have everything change it because small scale things, because if you have a small, larger one way nesting, most important internal tie, internal way. So when the internal way publication touch your boundary, so they can, your boundary can be changes. So then you can get energy accumulation over there because scale different. When your resolution high, you resolve internal way, right? We resolution you cause it probably not resolve. That's why we run the model, we have to make sure, you know, initial condition, make sure the time we run it. So you want to check or check, does it really affect your boundary or not? If effect boundary stop, you have to restart again, because that's why, yeah. yeah. That's right. good, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Interesting discussion, but I think we're going to need to move on, and um, we can come back to this if we have some time at the end. Um, okay, so we're going to hear about a different modeling structure or framework, Mike DHI, and it'll be from Oli Peterson, who's the chief engineer of the ports and ports and offshore technology at the Danish Hydraulic Institute, and Tom Johnson, chief operating officer at the Danish Hydraulic Institute. Thank you for inviting us here. Being here this morning, I'm not sure I dare say much. We have heard now Dr. Chin here, he's a hard man to follow here. And then we all heard, heard about all these details, uh, Glenn, you have presented an amazing amount of details of how complicated this system is. So we come here with the models and it is, even if it's very, very complicated and very advanced, we think, I don't think it matches anything in reality. So it is a simplification. So that's, I want to say that uh, upfront here. Um, so let's see, uh, why are we here? The very specific reason is that we have been doing two studies, one uh, historic study for BOEM, looking at accumulated impacts of the Massachusetts Rhode Island uh, uh, area uh, that's completed and reported. And we have an ongoing uh, study right now looking at uh, the whole US East Coast. Uh, that's a very specific reason. And we will try and develop, discuss here today what we have learned from these two studies and, and, and try and, and, and put that forward. Another reason is that we think this discussion about accumulated impacts is very important for the industry and for the society. And it is a discussion that often falls between GS developers. They don't require it. They have to their own projects to look for. Uh, and no one really cares about these accumulated impacts. But I think it is important and it will be an issue in the future that may affect how we develop offshore wind uh, in the future. So uh, that's why we chose to come here. And I think it's a very, very good initiative that uh, you have taken. Just a few words about who is DHI. We are a little bit uh, new in the street here in US. Uh, so I can hear all of you, you know each other very well. Uh, DHI, we are in, uh, based in Denmark. We have about 1,000 people working with water. We are like a private research institution that also do commercial. You have similar institutions here in the US. Uh, we have uh, offices around the world, uh, also here in the US, in Denmark, in Portland. Tom here is chief officer in the US. Uh, we have been around for about 50 years uh, and we have worked with waters and we work do studies. We don't do designs. There are many things we don't do, but it's natural water is the key. And another key factor for us, that is uh, numerical modeling. That has been kind of our legacy. Um, we do uh, projects and we also do about 25% of our activity is research. And another 25 is our software. We sell this uh, commercial mic software that we're using here. 
So let's see. Uh, well, we have been in the offshore wind business in many years. The Vinneby, that was the first offshore wind park in the world. We were part of that in 1991, about five megawatts. And that was a revolution at that time. Um, so we supported that one and was part of the research project behind. And today we are now up to, we have supported 25 gigawatt of realized projects. And we are still supporting 130 gigawatt of coming projects. We are involved in, we say, 80% of all commissioned offshore projects in the world. Um, and we are also doing a lot of, say, research projects uh, related to offshore wind. Let's see if this can come up here. And what are we doing for offshore wind? Mid-ocean conditions, waves, hydrodynamics, as we are discussing today. We are looking, supporting uh, uh, scour, cabling, all this kind of uh, water things. Sediment transport is part of it. And we also do ecology, biodynamics, AIAs. And some special things is uh, uh, noise, noise for EIA and also uh, uh, bird detection. We have some bird detection systems that can basically stop wind turbines when something uh, comes flying past. As I said, <clears throat> modeling has been key. It's part of nearly all our projects, one way or the other. And we have this mic suite that we are using here, which is a well recognized standard in the in the coastal and, and, and ocean engineering. And today we'll use two of these models. That's a wave model that looks at the waves. And another one is our uh, flow model is called Mic 3 3D. So they are the key tools that we will uh, employ here and have employed in the projects. Yeah, this we have talked about all day. Uh, just for someone has listened that uh, the accumulated impact impacts that we look at, at these things, this is mostly the wind wake effects and how that affects uh, waves, how that affects uh, uh, the currents. We look at drag from uh, the foundations and from the from the towers and from the scour protection and how that affects the, the flows around. We will not look at cables or new habitats, but we have a continuation in the bone study. We have done, it goes the way further down and look at the migration of uh, larvae or scallops and how they change uh, as a consequence of say, impact from the offshore wind turbines. So, but today, we will not go into that in much detail. Yeah, this is the same again. Uh, the impacts, I'll just, and say what we learned from the study, the first bone study was that initially we thought that it was the towers that were an important part. Uh, the mixing and the drag on these uh, foundations directly in the water, that must be a big impact. But it seems it's not. It is really the wind. Uh, the wind wake and the wind energy reduction by the offshore farms, that is a big, the big factor. And that affects the waves. Waves will not grow as fast or they will decay faster. Uh, it affects the currents because uh, they drag the currents. Uh, so that is really a big one. I'll show you why later. Uh, and then of course we have the drag and mixing induced from the foundations directly, whether it's a, uh, it's a uh, monopile, so it's uh, jacket structures. Uh, they are the ones. There is a paper by Corinna that I reference here that has a longer list of more impacts on temperature, on heat exchange, on other things, and we have not looked at these things. If we take the one of the effects on uh, on the foundations, as Chen discussed, uh, the flow around these structures is very complicated. The boundary layer is about uh, two, three centimeters thick. So I think even with a one meter resolution, there's still a lot of things going on there that is uh, important. So it's very difficult to resolve actually these flows. And if we do it in a two course mesh, we overestimate the forces. We have done that many times. We can see we can easily get 10 times the drag if we don't resolve uh, properly. <clears throat> so what we do here is that we make a, an empirical model drag on a, on a cylinder structure, that is kind of a standard engineering exercise. Also turbulence induced by a structure 
drag on a structure, uh, it's well known. So we have this input as a, as a parametrization, uh, such that we are sure that the drag induced by that structure is correct, as, or as correct as we can get it. And it also includes the mixing. Uh, we did some experiments uh, that are referenced here earlier, where we looked at mixing induced by in stratified flow by these uh, uh, structures. So we can put that into a formula that can calculate the effect on the flow by these structures. The same for the waves. I can't remember if that, no. The same goes for the waves. Wave interaction with a cylinder structure in the ocean, that is uh, something you can write uh, many PhDs about uh, without knowing everything. But we try to do a, a simplification where we look at, uh, say, basically uh, what they call a, well, a dynamic model of, of the waves, and then we could uh, boil that down to some empirical relations that tells us how much of the wave is transmitted through the structure, how much is reflected, and that gives us this uh, reduction in, say, wave height due to the presence of, of structures inside the water. That's also built into the models. And I say, and that will be subgrids. So our grids are not one meter. They may be uh, larger. We have tried to make it such that we have one structure within each grid cells. That gives us a good control of how uh, these things, they work. Next is the effect of the wind wakes. The first study we did, we took a, a simplified approach and we said, okay, the effect of the wind wake is inside the, the footprint of the wind farm. That has been discussed and we have now taken that up and, and improved it. So what we do now is that we use a system called Piway. That's the one they use for resource assessment of uh, wind mm -hmm. farm. So that is accurate, I'll tell you, because that's money. But we use the same, uh, the same uh, feature, basically it takes each turbine, it calculates say, what is the incoming wind? What is the wind production? And then it calculates the wake and, and empirical relation for the wake. Um, and then we take in a farm, we take for each turbine, we look at all the other turbines, how will that wake come in and maybe reduce the incoming wind to that turbine, which is downstream. So the last turbine will get much less wind than the first one. And it will also calculate downstream the wind farm, how are all these wakes uh, combining and going uh, downstream. That's up in hop height. That's in now today in 125 meter above the seabed. So that has not really much to do with what's going on at the sea surface where we want it. So what we do is that we use this uh, uh, called Franzen's model, which, uh, which basically takes and we can transform the reduced wind height, uh, wind, wind speed in, uh, in hop height down to the sea surface uh, because that transformation is not straightforward. It depends on the weather. It depends on the stability of the atmosphere. Uh, and that makes the this thing very site specific. On US West Coast, weather is stable normally. So uh, that has one uh, impact on how, how much of the reduced wind stress will come down to the surface. In the East Coast, in the winter, it's, it's convective dominated, it's called. So these, uh, wakes they mix up very quickly and it also has an impact of how how strongly is uh, the sea surface impact um, we take that in uh, to account and then we do for example you can see these pictures here they are uh, the wind speed uh, calculated for i think this one is uh, empire wind and the other ones in new york bite we have them for all the lease areas uh, calculated and you can see the an example of how big is the impact. We calculate this picture every hour for the whole period that we are simulating. So we have the varying wind direction, varying uh, stability con conditions, uh, and get a good measure of how the uh, sea surface is impacted. And it takes nearly as long to calculate these ones as it does to calculate the whole 3D model because of this, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think this one can move if I'm lucky here. This is just an example. You can see, uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, a little bit artificial example. You can see how the how the impact on the stress it uh, it changes with time. So that's it. Let's go here. 
Now to the real world. Uh, as I said, we did uh, the first study. That's the mesh on the. And let's go up here. Uh, that's the first study uh, where we set up the model here. Uh, and what we do, we set up a very specific model, try and do it as accurate as possible, just like Jen is doing. Uh, then we implement the wind turbines, and then we look at what is the changes. Uh, that is uh, the way we work as engineers. The next model, uh, that's the one is ongoing now, is this one. It covers the whole area from Nova Scotia down to Florida, basically, and has all the leases inside. So it's a more heavy duty approach, uh, but we think we have learned uh, a lot with it. Let us see here if we go down a bit here. Yeah, so this is the way we work. We develop this validated baseline, have that as good as we can. Uh, put in the turbines, uh, different scenarios. And then we simulate here a historic period, which is, uh, uh, I think we have contractual up to one to three years. Uh, it, it's more the say, cost of computing time that is really the issue here. When we do design we, for wind turbines, we do nearly the same exercise as the baseline. And then we do 40 years of simulations hourly to get the, all the st statistics right. But for this purpose here, uh, we started with, uh, with say, one to three years. Um, we do it with a hydrodynamic model, a 3D model that has uh, temperature, stratification, flows, all uh, important stuff. And we do it with a wave model that calculates basically wave spectra also on the same grid. As I, and as I said, we are in the first study, we touch have some downstream uh, effect uh, on fish and uh, larvae. This is the way we calibrate the model. We look at each parameter. This is water levels. We have measurements. Uh, they are shown on the map here. Just a few examples here. We do a time series calculate. These scatter plots which show measured uh, on the axis here and the model up here. Uh, this. And then we can see if they follow the straight line here, everything is good. Uh, and if there's a lot of scatter, then, well, that's the uncertainty. When we do that for I think we have uh, 20 stations here along the coast and we do it for typically for one year where we use that for calibration. The next one that is uh, for currents here, that is up in New York Bight. There are these two stations in Iserta have two high quality LiDAR boys with also with ADCPs that we have used and we have used all Ørsted's measurements and a lot of measurements from uh, developers uh, covering Pioneer, we also used and uh, observ observatory. But still, if you look at current observations, they are scarce. They are nearly nothing. To have a good coverage of current measurements in the same period, that is a dream. So we take all we can get our hands on. So that's also why if we can get someone to collect some more current measurements, that will be important. Yeah, and then if you look at this, this is time series uh, measured and modeled. Uh, these are directions. Uh, this is uh, the current speed, and then it's the direction upward. So we can see there are two little bit dominant directions here, and this and this, they are the tides, but they are not very strong in New York Bight. And these are current roses, colored is measured, and black is, uh, or gray is from the model. And I would say, for example, this, the quality of this plot here, that is typical for what we get for current measurements. This is not an exact science. It is something, there's a lot of uncertainty. If we take the next, uh, these are for waves. Waves are a little bit easier. So you can see the match is better, uh, but still wave roses, uh, significant wave height, how it fits, distributions. We also do the same for wave periods and other wave parameters. And for waves, there are many stations. I think we have more than 20 or 30 stations where we look at periods about say one year and, and calibrates all over to get a good idea of the representation of the model. Okay, but now we have a baseline that we think is the best or is a good representation of what happens in real life. Um, but as I say, if Glenn looks at it, I'm sure he can point his finger to many places and say, this here is not what I know, but that is life. 
The way we quantify uh, high dynamic impacts is that I said we implement these turbines in different configurations, uh, different um, uh, what say, configurations and different uh, uh, strengths. We also, for each turbine, we have this operation curve. They're cut in with three meter per second cut out, 25 meter per second. So what is really important for the wind turbine impact, that's not the extreme situations. That is this normal operation situation because that's where the wind turbines, they operate. And that's when they affect, when they don't operate, they have minor effects on anything. These are just some very few examples there. If you look in the report, you can see uh, all the details. Uh, I didn't want to take them up here. But for example, these are a 75 percentile difference for, uh, this is for depth currents, current. depth average currents, where we look at different scenarios. I think scenario two is the one with full build out of two the four. four uh, Tom, he can remember all these things. With full build out of the uh, Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts. And you can see the impacts here, or the kind of what is the, uh, say, the, the change of this, uh, the current speeds. And they are here for current speeds, they are within, say, 10%. That is, uh, uh, I don't, can't remember if I have waves also. Let's see. No. So if we look at waves, it's also, it's with below 10% most of the time. It's not zero, there is an impact, uh, and, but it's about that order of magnitude. Yes. Tom, you will say a little bit about the next, because who cares about waves and currents? No one. Ask anyone, they care about, they care about, are my fish gone? Where are the scallops I need to catch? That's what really concerns people. Are my beach disappearing? Uh, so you'll you'll move them when I ask. Yes. So just very briefly, we're going to go through some of the, uh, the how we did the agent based modeling. We use the super agent uh, methodology because when you look at the fecundity of scallops or or uh, summer flounder or silver hake, you couldn't do every egg. Um, and, and model it. So we, we, we basically collapse these millions of eggs per spawning season into a number of super agents and then followed those super agents as they were dispersed. It reduces the computational load, and, uh, but we can still monitor and update them over time. Next. So the, the three, the three um, species that we did in the first uh, study that was completed in 2021 was this uh, was an a, uh, agent based model or ABM of the sea scallop larvae, silver hake, and summer flounder. And we took those customized ABM templates and then ran them through the hydrodynamic model. And then that what we were looking at basically was the differences in where these larvae settled. And when you look at the 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 the, the Graphic on the right, that is for summer flounder. Summer flounder were a little bit different than uh, the sea scallop and silver hake larvae because they had a certain motility and would, would sense um, basically ebb tides and flood tides and would swim towards the shore at a certain uh, development stage. So that's why the, that's why you see the, the differences are, are mostly in, in shore. Next. Um, the conceptualization, um, basically, this is the, the whole reason you do these agent-based models, the, the, how these were all conceptualized and built are based on these papers that are, that are talked about um, here in this slide. They're, they're just settlement rate and population abundance. You know, how do you parameterize that? What's the settlement of probability? You know, probability and, and basically, what is the substrate material and the environmental variables that will will um, allow the, the, the larva to survive the dispersal patterns and recruitment basically in different sinks areas and, and their swimming speeds and then vertical migration patterns of larva basically uh, for function of uh, daylight and tidal conditions. So all those things are built into um, these templates and and basically parameterized based on observations from from uh, from experts for each of the different species. Next. And then just to give you a flavor of what we what we found, um, there were, you know, 
basically determine oceanic responses for, for sea scallops. You know, there was a shift in settlement. Um, this is a full build out with 15 megawatt um, uh, wind turbines uh, in, in the Massachusetts, Rhode Island area. We had, we had basically four scenarios and, and this is the one that causes the biggest impact because they're the biggest, uh, biggest turbines. And so they, they reduce the wind speed the most and they have the biggest foundations um, uh, sticking through the water column. So we chose that one to, to present here, but basically it shows a shift um, based to the Southwest um, of the offshore wind farm buildup area. There's discernible or notable increases south of Block Island. Um, that's the blue on uh, east of Long Island. And then there's some distinct areas of decrease, which is south of Martha's Vineyard and to some degree in the Nantucket Shoals. So, you know, th this is a very, very brief review of, of how we do our agent-based modeling. But you know, th these are all integrated models in, in the MIC system. Um, I know someone said something about open source uh, this morning, and we, we sell our software. But for the BOEM project, everybody should know if you are if you are investigating anything that has to do with these two projects, um, following on for I think five years, you can get a hold of the models. So we have got that in the contract, so that deals with the open source issue. Perhaps deals with the open source issue where the, the models will be made available to consultants to BOEM or people that want to review our our uh, our models through the BOEM uh, these BOEM studies. Uh, next slide. So we also have to acknowledge BOEM. Uh, this is one of the, the mandatory slides that we have to put in. These are our contract numbers and uh, and some of our sponsors are sitting here in the room today. So thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your support. Okay, thank you. Um, questions? Yes, go ahead, Glenn. A very nice talk. So very, very informative. And uh, I'm really curious about the super agent modeling there. And uh, one of the things I noticed, you said that area uh, for scenario four, where, with the buildup of the scallop larvae, there was that uh, kind of Southwest oriented uh, uh, local maxima there that went up to Block Island. Was that overlaying the buried river channel there that goes up through Cox's Ledge? I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm obsessed by that channel. I, I, I don't know, Glenn. I'm sorry to say that that that's that's outside of my uh, detailed knowledge of that of that area. So I, we'd have to go back and look. Because it, it took me a number of years to realize that when we were having the, the fishing vessels collect CTD profiles for us, there was this huge concentration right along that that uh, that. Uh, a little depression there, and uh, it turns out that trapped a lot of organic matter because that was a, a river bed during the ice age when so, sea so, level was much lower. And so I, for our modeling, it would be it would be a, a deficit in current speed, most likely, that mm -hmm. would cause more settlement there than in another place. So that, that's we were looking basically at the differences in, in the settlement of these larvae, and so. Um, what we found was when you when you look at the current patterns and how they changed, it's pretty much overlays where the changes are. Excuse me, where the changes are in in the in the settlement patterns. And also, that uh, channel actually is an important onshore offshore seasonal migration pathway mm. for different species monkfish they catch with uh, uh, with gill nets along the bottom there. So I, I, I had never realized how important that feature was there. Uh, but the fishing community, I guess, have had three or four hundred years to work this out. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, well, nice talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is that uh, you said current and waves are not important. Well, they are driver. I mean, you, you are kidding, right? <laughs> the driver of the Asians based modeling. So I'm curious about the uh, subgrid. Effects that you mentioned that you say use energy relationship to parameterize the effects of the structure on the flow field. So can you elaborate that? It's the work of the drag force that we feed into the model, basically. So that gives a resistance in the model in that cell, and then we say the work of the drag force that gives us uh, say the change in, in or the input to turbulence. So is your Permanent scheme also affected by by yeah. the structures. It's affected by the structure and also by the stratification. No, the closure, the the the, the turbulence scheme. Yeah, it is affected. Okay, there's an input into that from the say from the 
reduction of turbulence around that structure. So what's so, the uh, typical resolution for your structure? It's about one kilometer. One kilometer of your, yes. your cell, but, but then you have that subgrid fats built into that. Yeah, but in that, into that cell, we will we'll feed that extra uh, turbulence and also that extra resistance. How accurate is that? Uh, it is, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> Yeah, but if we, if we do comparison to experiments, it's uh, spot on because that's the way it's, it's calculated. So it's basically, if you take the drag relation for a say, cylind cylinder structure, that is pretty accurate if you try to calculate the drag. Right. Well, I, I saw you cited several uh, CFD uh, models, yes. you know, papers. So have you compared the, uh, kind of your model with, yes. with that CFD model? Yes. Okay. So we don't know. We used the CFD and we used some experiments. We did a lot of experiments when we did this, uh, the, the Fehman bridge um, for, say, mixing induced by structures in stratified flows because no one knows what that is. But we did a lot of experiments and then we also did a lot of CFD calculations of that kind of problem. And out of that came a calibration of these uh, drag relations. It's Morrison's formula, you can say, it's a kind of for steady flows. All right, thanks. So, so it's accurate because because we force it to be accurate. But you cannot go in and go. You cannot go twenty meter downstream the turbine and see the variations that change you, for example, because it's all into this big cell. Because we need to both model, say the details have the correct uh, impact of the structure, but we also need to model more than one year in an area that is huge. So. It's to compromise. How should we do that? It's not possible for us to do a CFD model of every single turbine and calculate that for more than 20 seconds. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, That's just curious about how you parameterize that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That so-called subgrid mixing, a subgrid, subgrid effects uh, yeah. uh, using energy principles. Yeah. 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 But do, there were some there are some mm -hmm. papers cited. You can go yes. back and look. Thank you. You know, I had a comment for scallop, you know, the model. So have you considered swinging behaviors? Because scallop larvae, they have a, you know, they have an observation show a semi-diana and a diana behavior on the mixed layer when it's swarming. So they can make reach in the mixed layer in the day, you know, two times per day or sometimes one times per day. If you include the behaviors, you see the settle down can be completely different. Yes. So we, we do we consider it. We got a behavior, we do a diana behavior and a semi diana behavior. So we find, you know, semi diana behavior. We don't know which one is correct. Both observation find that. So then you, you look at it because of the migration in the vertical mix layer. So then then after 40 days settle down, they can be completely different pattern. Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. We, we take that into account. Okay. Okay. I was trying to let the committee ask questions first. So um, uh, this is a bit of a, a challenging question. I mean, no disrespect to either of the modeling teams. As a as a developer, we have to develop our permitting documents and consider information like this. And and what as an as a non oceanographer and non modeler, I'm. I'm hearing what you're having to say and seeing opposing results, right, from the models. And um, and that is a bit concerning. And so I guess two questions. One question for you both um, is, can you discuss a bit why you have such differing results? And then a second, just a you know, comment to the committee as you're developing the report to, to please consider uh, and advise folks like myself and regulators, how we interpret this variability, because this uncertainty does, I think, create some regulatory challenges for us that concerns us. And we and we obviously want um, good science that's validated, but I, I don't know how to deal with this conflicting information. Thank you. Just a, maybe a, a caution. This is not like structural engineering where you can do a calculation, ask three people and they'll get nearly the same. This is still development. This is very new science uh, coming up and it's very, very complicated uh, because there's so much uncertainty in the real world. Uh, Glenn will know that, everyone will know that. Uh, so so that, that is part of the background to why we get different results. So we use slightly different methods and then we get different results. So 
So I'm not sure we can promise anyone that we can come up with something that is completely consistent and where you can go anywhere and, and, and get that. You need to have certain knowledge, certain insights uh, of someone to go in and, and make the make it. But, but I see this opportunity here and also what we do otherwise as, a, as, a, as an effort to try and converge things and exactly to get results that are kind of agreed that we can, everyone, regulators, developer can say, okay, this is the ballpark we're talking about. Uh, because I have the same feeling as you have that today, if I look in one paper, it's uh, the world will go upside down if we build this. And in another paper, nothing will happen. And, and what, where are we in between of that? And you can say, it has been my ambition, and I've, at least that's what I try to, is to try and find sensible numbers that are in the ballpark. Maybe not within the 10 decimals, but still something that's in the ballpark and find realistic numbers. Uh, but it's not easy. Sorry. Okay, I think Josh and then Richard. Uh, yeah, this is a, I, I guess, kind of a follow-up to all the, the modelers and something that I wrestle with. It, you you're showing and this is i think related to the point that that laura just raised is there a way you've done validation both both groups so far and i know there's a third one to come have shown validation is that what's learned through the validation is that accounted for in the derived fields that are shown that that the groups are shown or is there a way to include that so that you can understand the derived forms or the sh the images don't show the uncertainty and so maybe there's a way to address the concern raised before and i don't know if that's possible with the validation that's done but i think it would be helpful to the community to understand what the uncertainty is in these fields given what you know about the underlying data that went into the calculation of those fields can i answer that so i have two things one that's your responsibility <laughs> that is that we need more data it's really crucial that we get more data for calibration, for validation. It is, uh, it is very important. That's I, one thing. All right, I'll, I'll just respond to that really quickly and just say, I don't. I would put any other place on the planet up against our Mid Atlantic as a place to look for validation data. <laughs> There's not many places in the world that have more. No, uh, Glenn talked about all the different systems that are in the place, and they don't they don't have the entire coverage of the model, which is why we need the models. But there are a lot of current there's a hf radar field that provides hourly currents since 20 yeah. 2007 at every six kilometers right so there are data out there yeah. so i think that if we're going to do something like this this is a great place to do it right but it has another one and that's it's also uh, one of the most complicated places so yes no, we, we need more data here regional model with a quota data for the past uh, like 10 years. So for the Block Island side, just uh, Nantucket, Block Island, they got a three quota there. We make an 80 year comparison, but it really depends on how you compare. For tide simulation, the model and the position match well aware. But for low frequency, really question. So we can get a very good comparison for monthly average, but then you do like an hourly comparison really tough because of the quota no, they have a uncertainty. Most are not for speed, most are for the direction. Because of the quota measurements, the uh, average uncertainty for direction is about 20 degrees. But sometimes, if you look at the recently in the Rodgers University published, you know, quota data, the whole region. So you can see a lot of, on the short big region, uncertainty is most 80, you no, know, that kind of, you no, know, no, kind of 80 degree. No, 80 and 100 degree angle. And was a short break region. But in the near shore region, you no, know, Long Island Sun region, if you look at the map, I have the data I can show you. Long Island Sun region is a pretty good measurement, but you know, when the quarter that go offshore, the signal arrow bus very uncertain is really big. So you have a very hard to compare. So when we do the comparison, we choose the whole of 40, you no, know, whole of measurement 10 year, we choose the high accuracy data for they they have uncertain number there you compare the subtitle and the and the title current they come out really good but however is you have to consider uncertainty the measurement but the code that is hard to compare most of good data compares more in data and the more in data because the uncertainty is very really, is really small 
you can get a good comparison. Yeah, I'll, 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 I don't want to defray the conversation. Yeah, I'll just yeah, say I, yeah, I, I did my PhD on HF radar. I'm very yeah. familiar with it. Yeah. I, I, I just was making a comment that you all showed validation. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's an opportunity to take what you learned from that yeah. validation with whatever data you had yeah. and, and actually put it into the results here. So we know yeah. if velocity has a certain uncertainty yeah. in comparisons to whatever data you chose to validate the model mm -hmm. against, how does that impact where larvae might go mm -hmm. in the model projection? That's mm -hmm. just the suggestion. I think that yeah. would be very helpful. Yeah. yeah, We can have conversations about which data sets are good yeah. or bad for yeah. validation, but when you you chose the data set you validated mm -hmm. against and yeah. you got some numbers. So how can we take that and, mm -hmm. and no, put it into the data final? Set is, if you look in the BOM report, there are some. They got so many ADCP crews across the Nantakisaw region. Nantakisaw region, most of, you can see like you know, more than 10 year data across the region. The, the results show big region of region there. So we do compare, we know the uncertainty. I think gonna talk today. But interesting, we can send you the computer uncertainty. They also intrusion water how they sometimes model though doing go okay, sometimes not. Depending on what a, how you model. If you can, if you get a simulation one core ring correctly, you get a very good comparison. Sometimes you feel the simulation, you not get a show bigger simulation comparison. But in the shallow region, so you have to remove the ties and compare. But kind of comparison, you know, that's pretty good. I'm pretty sure you see that their comparison with C-Lab was pretty good, right? Okay, I think, yeah. did you have a yeah, response to that? Or and then Richard more, and Christina? There was one more to answer. That was about the uh, uncertainty. When we do uh, these design studies, we do waves and currents. It's, it's a little bit easier, uh, you can say modeling wise to get accurate mm -hmm. results. But there we do 40 years uh, typically, and we do, a lot of effort to quantify uncertainty because that goes into design and money you know that's a, it's also important there as it is here so uh, so yeah. it's something we do but but it's not straightforward to do okay i think richard and then christina okay so one thing that i'm curious about is how we compare between models based on what we see of the spatial extent of the outcomes or the model run so in chen's example that was just five the project 501 veneer wind Correct. Yeah, sure. Your of... what we saw of your project was basically the model runs for Project Five Hundred One and Vineyard Wind Project. What height does it make up? For scallops, for the distribution of scallops. I don't get a question. Sorry, sorry, I didn't get a question. Yeah. So you, the project you used uh -huh. the hundred turbines yeah. that was basically Vineyard Wind. No, the wind tide they include the wind tide include because it's a nesting model. We run a global model, a regional model. Mm -hmm. Regional model come from a hand cast. But yeah. you, you were not modeling the full build out for all the projects south of the vineyard in the in Nantucket. No, I just saw for one. Yes, one, that, one design. That's my point. Yeah, hundred. Yeah. Whereas what we saw from y'all was the full build out. Yeah, that was four scenarios. So yeah, it's kind of hard to compare the results of those two, and, and I think. Some of us are probably curious about how you, you see the results of a single turbine. You can't extrapolate that to a whole project, obviously. Yeah. So you can expand out to the whole pro a project like 501 or Vineyard Wind, and that has an effect. But well, I'm really curious about what the overall effect is going to be yeah. from the full build out. So we haven't seen that from yours, and, but do you have a, a, any chance what you saw with 501? Yeah, yeah. That, that was one of our scenarios. I know it's one of the scenarios, but do you have yeah. it? So that right be, now, no, but, but, but it's in our report. Can we see that? Okay, because no. that would be the. Yeah. If you're, we're, I mean, I think someone's picked up in the difference in in the distribution of scallops. Yeah. That's very different in Chen's results than in yours. Yeah, it could simply be the spatial scale of the model. You know, so no, it'd be no, helpful no, to key, have the five hundred ones yeah. compare each other. No key issue difference, separation scale. Because uh, when you put a wind turbine into a system, be separation scale between the turbine is critically important. Mm -hmm. So now the industry agree, and they have a one necromile separation scale. When we do the bond project of 2014, the separation scale is five necromile. So we consider the whole region, right? But when we put a, they only put a 135 turbine into the system. But separation scales are, if separation scales are larger, influence is completely different for separation scales smaller. So they consider about, you know, we get a, we get a hundred 
100 wind turbine just in the one design, the winner win, a small area, put 100. Separate scale is the one necro mark. If you put a whole region, it is a separate scale. The, the, the influence can be different. I understand. That's yeah. my point yeah. that yeah. The, the full build out may look very different, yeah, very different than your yeah. results. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, Christina, we can come back to your question unless it's a quick question or. That's a so. Okay. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm concerned about running out of time. I want to give York a chance to tell us about yeah, a third model, um, Delft 3D. Mm -hmm. And York is a senior researcher and advisor in hydraulic engineering at Deltares. And please tell us about Delft 3D. I'll just open my presentation while everybody's going for a potty break and getting some water. The break is after your talk, so they're yeah. not excused from the classroom right now. So <laughs> everybody's excusing themselves. You didn't explicitly consider time. You understood your reference. Oh, and the compliment right there, because All right, I'm visible. Let's start then. Uh, model number three has, has often been referred to in the previous talks, uh, also also commonly known as Del 3D. Uh, in this case, now we'll talk a bit about um, uh, the same topics that my uh, predecessors talked about as uh, using this modeling suite to assess um, ecosystem effects of offshore wind installation. Um, so to tell you a little bit about Deltares, I think we have a rather similar company profile as DHI. <laughs> we are uh, also an independent institute for applied research in the field of uh, water, subsurface and infrastructure. And uh, yeah, we uh, do a lot of offshore wind related work together with both universities, but also with the industry. So for example, the nice photo you see in the background of, uh, of a turbine getting, getting splashed with a very big wave. Um, is from a physical model test performed in our Delta Flume um, it, within a project uh, consisting of over 20 consortium partners and dedicated to uh, develop guidelines for um, sky protection methods, uh, culminating in a broad industry supported uh, handbook. Um, the mission of Deltares is enabling Delta Life and yeah, offshore winds, of course, uh, vital uh, in there. And I think the past 10, 20 years were all dedicated to making offshore wind affordable. Uh, we're more or less there now. All right. So the bigger ch the challenges for the future are in um, are in upscaling, um, are in multi-use. It's mostly North Sea thing, and of course also in ecosystem impact. Um, so to say a little bit more about uh, what we do in in offshore wind, it's. Uh, consisting of, of uh, all these topics not limited to. Um, so for example, we, we do also Metocean, um, Metocean studies. Um, we have geotechnical uh, background as well. Um, corrosion and water replenishment. That's also something we do every now and then for Bowen. Um, and of course, one of the bigger topics is ecological impact, both positive and negative. And in that framework, uh, we quite often hear terms like nature inclusive design. Uh, or net positive impact, right? So nature inclusive design is really to, to integrate your design in such a way that you can alleviate pressure on the ecosystem. And uh, depending on how you do it, you may even uh, strive for achieving a net positive impact. So you leave the ecosystem in a better um, shape than you found it. Um, and of course, that's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, but those, those are um, yeah, hot topics at the moment. Um, so when we talk about nature inclusive design, I'd like to sketch the framework before going on to um, Del 3D and, and its capabilities. Um, because of course, ecological impact already um, starts with the installation. I don't know if you ever had the privilege to be witness of a pilot installation. I, I only had that in, in a physical scale model experiment, but it's very, very noisy. 
right? So uh, wildlife, uh, marine life is impacted by the installation. So you'd want to achieve more uh, noise mitigation or silent installation techniques, uh, for example, as a way of uh, mitigating impact on the ecosystem. Then once your pile is there, um, and we see at the moment um, that with scout protection installed, you create new habitat, and that results into an enrichment of marine life around foundation structures. And that can go, um, of course, on a local scale, so per foundation, but that accumulates over an entire wind farm. And you need to take into account, of course, the entire system. We have cables that uh, emit radiation and heat that have an impact on the environment. Um, in certain offshore wind related uh, offshore wind development areas, you also have migrating sand waves that could um, uh, lead to clogging of the pore space you created. So it's an entire system. Um, and talking about an entire system, of course, the turbines they impact also the hydrodynamics um, by in. Uh, uh, creating more turbulence, uh, realizing more mixing, all these things that we have already talked about. Um, but it's accumulating, of course, on um, on the on the scale of an entire basin. Uh, within the monopile, of course, you have a microclimate and bringing all of that together in an integrated fashion um, where you combine modeling, monitoring uh, to establish your impact. That's That's what we mean with this nature inclusive design for offshore wind farms. So I will now talk a little bit more about hydrodynamic modeling. Um, in general, I'd like to sketch a framework for the approach and go into a bit more details of del 3 d so outlining its base assumptions and limitations. And from those assumptions, I will um, you know, show you how we have applied this model um, to assess impact of offshore wind development and to give you an idea of what you can do with it, but also, of course, on what you cannot yet do with it. And that's, that's equally important. Um, so, of course, there's various types of models that you can utilize to assess impact of offshore wind. And uh, so far, we have uh, mainly talked about process-based numerical models, but of course, uh, there's, there's physical models as well, and numerical models, but also more simple engineering tools. And of course, they're um, depending on what you want. Um, not, not all models are equally fit for purpose. Um, of course, we focus now on the numerical model approaches, um, and there you can also choose from different flavors, uh, where you, depending on the complexity and detail that you require, uh, you can make similar choices. So, for example, we have this 1D network models that you could use to model rivers or maybe even tidal channels. Um, going into more complex 2D, 3D area models, um, and we talk about tidal inlets, seas, um, offshore wind farms, or even more detail, more complexity, local high resolution CFD model. And that's typically on the scale of single structures. And here you see a very nice visualization of a CFD simulation that was used to assess the impact of a slamming wave on the loads in the secondary steel structure. And that, that, that's the level of detail. Um, another thing that has not really been mentioned today, or at least implicitly, but a model is a tool. And it should therefore be fit for purpose. What do I mean with that? Well, if you try to drive a screw into the wall with a hammer, you're not doing yourself a big favor, right? So you need to use the right tool for the job. Um, so you always need to um, ask yourself, what do I want to model? And what is the level of complexity required to achieve my goals? And that means that uh, when you can go simple, go simple. And if you have to go complex, then you have to go complex, right? So it's different flavors. What do I mean with that? We'll get there. So on to DEL3D. Um, DEL3D is a multi-dimensional uh, hydromorphodynamic simulation program that can calculate non-steady flow and transport phenomena resulting from tidal and meteorological forcing. That's a mouthful, but it means that um, it is very well suited to um, model, for example, um, tidal inlets, estuaries, uh, waves, um, you know, morphodynamic uh, processes. I, I used it myself to model a mangrove forest, but I also used it to model breaker bar dynamics in the surf zone. And that was only during my student time, right? It's very versatile and it can do a lot. Um, it makes use of uh, curvilinear grids in combination with unstructured elements. Um, so it uses the best of 
both worlds in terms of flexibility, but also in terms of uh, performance and talking about computational speed and accuracy, right? So you see a very nice example where uh, we combine curvy linear um, to have a good layout in, in tidal channels with unstructured grids to um, combine uh, different parts. Eh? Because if you want to do this with uh, only curvy linear, you're going to have a very, very ugly grid. So here we combine it with unstructured elements to get a very nice uh, looking numerical grid that also leads to good performance. It makes use of the shallow water assumption. Um, and I think most of the models that have been discussed here do that. And that means that um, we assume that uh, one of the three dimensions is much smaller of scale than the other two. So the depth is much smaller than the horizontal scales. Right, that's what you see here. In reality, if we talk about uh, water depths of 30, 40, 50 meters in, in wind farms, and we talk about horizontal scales of, of kilometers, of course, your vertical, res uh, your vertical dimension is much smaller than your horizontal dimension. But it comes also with, the, uh, with an hydrostatic pressure assumption. Right? So in, in the vertical dimension, um, you do not solve the full momentum equation. You solve a hydrostatic uh, pressure equation um, so that also means um, that um, you do not um, explicitly uh, model vertical acceleration. And your vertical acceleration is assumed relatively small compared to gravitational acceleration. Um, so that means in del 3D, uh, vertical velocities are um, computed using continuity relation. It makes use of a Boussinesq approximation. So the effect of variable density is only considered in uh, terms of a horizontal pressure gradient. Um, so uh, vertical variability in density is taken into account by the model. Um, and vertical mixing is, is computed, uh, making use of, of um, di uh, diffusion, uh, uh, eddy diffusivity and eddy viscosity coefficients. Um, but in terms of the impact of um, uh, density variations on the pressure, it's only taken into account in horizontal pressure gradient terms. And last but not least, um, it uses Reynolds averaging for turbulent fluctuations. So that means that you resolve uh, for your mean uh, flow velocities and you take a uh, um, model uh, schematization for your time average part. So you make a decomposition into a mean and a time average part um, and then the model makes use of an eddy viscosity concept where the impact of turbulence is modeled as an eddy viscosity and as an eddy diffusivity. Um, and del 3D also makes, uh, has um, an anisotropy in, in the turbulence, which um, means, of course, that the horizontal um, eddy viscosities are typically much larger than the vertical eddy viscosities. So that means that um, vertical mixing processes are uh, very well represented in the model but on a mid to far field scale. So not on a very, very near field scale. So that, that's good to realize here. Um, so it has a bottom boundary and a free surface boundary, um, both an impermeability boundary, kinematic, um, and a free surface uh, at both free surface and the bed, and the momentum boundary condition of bed shear stress at the bed and wind shear at the free surface. Or, um, now, of course, offshore, you do not have only flows, you also have waves. And del 3 um, also explicitly takes into account wave current interaction, where the wave processes are modeled with a separate uh, model that is coupled um, to the flow module um, called SWAN, simulating waves approaching near shore. Um, and these wave processes are account accounted for in a wave average manner. So your wave-induced forces, they are imposed as gradients in your radiation stress. Um, and to account for vertical non-uniformity in those velocities, it makes use of a generalized Lagrangian mean method. Um, and it does affect the addition of bad shear stress components. So it's high level of detail. Um, of course, what we know, or we have seen figures like this. And so, so uh, we know that in um, offshore wind areas in, in seas in general, there can be sediment transport. And we know that turbines have an impact on sediment transport. And, and you can imagine that if um, you have a, a sediment concentration in your water column, that may have an impact on the ecology by uh, simply um, determining how much light can penetrate through the water column. 
So it's quite important that your sediment transports are also taken into account in the computation. So del 3 d uh, computes both bed load and uh, suspended load for both non-cohesive and cohesive sediments. Uh, and it can also do morphological updating if needed. Now the flow module can be coupled to a water quality model. Um, and that can also be applied uh, as a process-based model. So it can be applied in a, in a more passive way so that, uh, for example, nutrients or pollutants are um, modeled as passive tracers. So they're then affected by the flow. But you can also use it in a more, um, let's say, uh, complex uh, manner, uh, where you take also all the, uh, the various processes that are outlined here into account. And this is coupled in an online manner. So that means that you can uh, simultaneously with your flow and wave computations and with the vertical mixing of your um, of, of, of your water column, also all these processes are considered. So we're now looking at the chain of effects associated with I mean, not only wind uh, developments, but um, uh, coastal seas in general. And we have, we have external factors, uh, human pressure, so the climate, discharge, sand mining, and there somewhere in between uh, comes offshore wind. And below we look at the ecosystem and all the various interlinks between uh, all the processes there. And of course, we know that offshore wind, it has a direct impact on currents, waves and wind, um, and maybe a slightly less direct impact on the bed. And all these processes, they also influence each other. So that means that hey, you know you can already draw out the lines uh, where you expect there to be an influence on the ecosystem. Um, and, and this is the way that uh, we do it. So we go from the environment towards the ecosystem. So that's called a bottom-up approach. Um, and we work together with partners who um, you know, start on the other end of the spectrum. So with uh, the birds and the mammals. And they work their way back. That's called a bottom, uh, but a uh, top-down approach. Um, and and somewhere they have to meet, right? Somewhere they have to meet, and then you're then you're complete. Um, so we know that there are many different processes acting on many different lengths and time scales, right? We have on the scale of an entire estuary, uh, we have stratification due to um, density differences um, related to freshwater and saline water. Um, but also, of course, related to temperature. Then on the scale of a wind farm or, for, or of singular turbines, we know that uh, they lead to differences in mixing. So th they lead to increased sediment transports around the base. Um, so you have different suspended matter concentrations in the wake of the turbines. Um, and the mixing can uh, negate the impact of stratification. So there's... Um, a lot of things going on and then of course very locally um, we also have uh, maybe the formation of a new ecosystem due to the um, um, hard substrate that's introduced um, in, in the area and due to the structure itself. So we want to quantify all that in, in one um, yeah, single uh, model but it also inevitably, inevitably means you have to make choices eh? because there's so much variation between the length and time scales, if you want to capture that in one single model and explicitly resolve everything, um, you need a, a very, very good supercomputer and a lot of patience, right? So you need to make choices. Um, and I'd like to show an example of, of how we did that. This is in the WOSEP project that I referred to earlier. It stands for Wind at Sea Ecological Program, and it's a, a large scale research project funded by the Dutch government to assess the impact of um, large-scale offshore wind developments in the North Sea. Uh, this model that you see on the right, it's the Dutch continental shelf model, and it's, it's a model of the entire North Sea basin. Um, it's a 3D model uh, with the finest grid resolution. I mean, it varies over the model, but with the finest resolution of roughly half a nautical mile. Um, it can calculate temperature and salinity stratification, and it does so quite well, as you can see on this uh, figure. Eh? It's it's recent, um, the water temperature, for example, um, is quite close to what is, is measured. Um, it can also calculate fine sediment concentration. Um, so here you see, for example, the difference between 
um, the summer surface mud concentration and the winter surface mud concentration. So you see there's very clear seasonality, fine sediment concentration um, predicted by the model. And it also um, being coupled to the water quality module, it also um, is capable of modeling primary production. And here you see a comparison of the calibrated model with um, measurements performed, I think it was at Nordweg, so in front of the Dutch coast. It then makes use of dynamic energy budgets to assess um, the impact on uh, wildlife, right? So that means that for different uh, umbrella species, um, we can assess um, what um, is going to happen if you, if, uh, if you uh, go for large-scale offshore wind development in the region. Uh, one thing that still needs to be implemented is a direct coupling uh, with the impact of wind wakes. Um, so that's one of the one of the shortcomings of the model at the moment, and that's being worked on this year. So that's a development step for the present year. Um, another development step for this year is to incorporate zooplankton. Um, and of course, we want to do that to reduce the gap between the bottom-up approach and the top-down approach. Um, Another very important aspect, and it has been discussed already, is parameterization of the foundations. Because, of course, you can imagine with a grid resolution of half a nautical mile, we do not explicitly model the foundations. We use a similar approach as our colleagues from DHI. We parameterize the impact of the foundations uh, as, um, as track coefficient. Um, but yeah, that involves a very direct coupling, of course, between very local processes and, and large-scale processes. And, and one thing we do uh, here as well um, is that there's coupling between scales is highly relevant. And so on a structural scale, you have these very complex flow phenomena around the wind turbine, and that's in the order of centimeters to meters. So you need very, very fine grid resolution to capture this accurately. Um, whereas, of course, on a large scale, um, we talk about kilometers, and, and that, that never matches. That, that never matches. If you want to make a, a prediction of the impact over multiple years, uh, you, 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 you don't have the computational power to, to do that on a very small scale. Um, so, uh, especially if you want to model the impact of offshore wind development on an entire basin, uh, which you can see on the right. Um, so you want to have good insight into all these small scale processes, what they do with um, salinity mixing, with temperature mixing, so with your stratification, but also um, with your um, uh, suspended sediment concentrations in the wake of the foundation. So for that, we use a more detailed local model as a research tool. Uh, so here we see the results of a CFD simulation, for example. Um, to get the correct relations for a parameterization and to um, get the right impact. It's very similar to what our colleagues from DHI do. Uh, there's the consistency yeah, between all the, all the model approaches. Um, and we compare it with um, actual field data. So we, we supplement it with actual field measurements. So this is from a recent campaign performed last year. Um, and here you see, for example, in the wake of a monopile that there are horizontal gradients in both temperature and, and salinity in the wake of the pile. So it's also very um, relevant to take those impacts into account in your parameterization. So it's not just a drag coefficient, but it also has an impact on uh, on your uh, stratification, but also on your suspended sediment concentration. And these need to be parameterized along. Um, so you have all these puzzle pieces, wind, waves, currents, sediments, nutrients, light, temperature, see about your foundations and maybe one or two unknowns. You don't need to have all those pieces in place to, to, to solve the question of what the impact of offshore wind development can be. Yeah, here, uh, for example, here we also see an image where you do not have all the pieces available, but still you can see that this is a tree. Uh, maybe, maybe somebody knows exactly what kind of tree this is. Um, of course, if you want to know who is walking next to the person in front of the tree, you need more information. But with the information we have, we can already see that there's probably somebody walking next to that person, right? So you don't need all the pieces to make useful predictions. Um, and, and that's the way I think we all do it now, that we accept that the model is not perfect, but it's good enough. It's, it's fit for purpose. Um, so you can focus your efforts both on model development and application, right? The Dell 3D model, it's also not yet complete. It doesn't incorporate uh, explicitly the effect of wind wakes. It doesn't incorporate zooplankton, but that doesn't mean that we cannot use it to make 
useful predictions at the moment. Um, and by following the scenario-based approach that, that DHI showed as well. And for example, within the WOSA project, uh, we, we looked at a couple of scenarios um, uh, on, on expected developments, but also on, for example, an extreme upscaling scenario uh, where we well, fill almost the entire North Sea Basin with, uh, with offshore wind parks. Um, and if you compare that to a reference scenario, so without any turbines, for example, and you validate that that's good work, it gives a very good impression on the impact of, of different um, scales of offshore wind development. And, and that also shows that scale does matter, right? So, so one wind park may not do that much, um, but 20 wind parks do a lot. And, and the North Sea is, is of course, a, a special case. It's, it's kind of like a bathtub, so there is not much room <laughs> to, uh, to develop. Maybe, maybe in the U.S. coast, it's a bit different because you have the, the Atlantic Ocean um, adjacent to your developments. But still, uh, scale matters. That's, that, that, that's one of the important messages here. So that, that also means that to know what happens or if you want to know what's going to happen at the, at the Nantucket Shoals, I'd say it's also a good idea to take into account um, all the other wind farm developments that are going to happen along the U.S. coast, simply because scale matters. Um, in the North Sea, we, we see that the impacts vary per region, um, and it really depends on the local dynamics. Um, and so in the central North Sea, we see that destratification is something that is dominant. Uh, in the German Bight, which is a very complex area, um, suspended matter is dominant. We see that you have, uh, we, we know from that area that there are a lot of fine sediments there, so it stands to reason that offshore wind development in that area has the largest impact or on, on suspended matter. Um, on the English coast and the Wadden coast, we see that there are relatively minor effects of, of the upscaling. Um, in the, the rhine rofi area, area, where Rofi, you know, you, you've seen the term before in one of the previous presentations, stands for region of freshwater influence. Um, and we have the Rhine River, which has a huge impact along the entire Dutch coast. Um, their offshore wind has mostly an impact on suspended matter transport. It, it has an impact on uh, destratification, so it leads to different set, uh, suspended matter transports. And on the Dagger Bank, uh, so far we noticed that the impact is relatively minor. Um, to make the final step to an application at the Nantucket Shoals, um, as our colleagues, we also have have a model of of the greater of the greater area. Um, this one is the Massachusetts Bay model, uh, which was developed for the Massachusetts Water Resource uh, Authority to assess the impact of wastewater on recirculation in the bay. So they have to make yearly predictions showing, um, showing that what they do is acceptable. Um, so we have a local, uh, very refined grid. Um, and yeah, it's just a little bit more south of it <laughs> is the Nantucket Shoals. But of course, that means you can do a refinement in the area of interest. That, that's always uh, something that's, that's, that, that's possible because the offshore boundaries are very well established and the model has been validated with um, available data um, of the area. Um, so, and it is already equipped with a full water quality model. So if the impact of zooplankton um, is implemented uh, in uh, the model as we have it now, that means that you have a rather direct link with um, the North Atlantic right whale. If you can model the impact of offshore wind development on zooplankton, you have um, a relatively, I'm not going to say easy, but a <laughs> relatively straightforward coupling to what may happen uh, or what the impact could be on, on the habitat of the North Atlantic right whale. Um, so to kick off with a couple of conclusions, I hope I stay roughly within time. Um, the Dell 3D modeling suite is, is I think, uh, very capable of assessing the impact of offshore wind development on the environment. Um, it captures all the relevant three-dimensional processes, um, uh, suspended meta concentration, and is equipped with a water quality module that can also um, yeah, be extended um, to include ecosystem uh, modeling, but we still need coupling with other models and model approaches um, to get a complete picture. And that, 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 that's still required. Um, and of course, the model doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be good enough. It needs to be fit for purpose. Um, the term impact, that needs a very clear definition, right? Impacts in the eyes of Boulder. Um, and there's a lot possible in terms of, of mitigation and, and maybe even creating that positive impact. 
but that also means that you need to very clearly define terms like positive and negative in a very early stage, as early as possible. Um, and of course, you cannot enhance or restore or protect everything everywhere all at once. I think that's, that's an Oscar-winning movie. Um, so you have to make choices. And, and, a very, and an integrated approach is required here. So that means that um, you need to think very well about your legislation for permitting and decommissioning. Um, and this, this one, it, 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 it's a, it seems like a side note, but this may be quite important that stakeholder engagement is, is maybe as important as the technology. Um, and so I'm very happy to hear that you have been talking with, uh, with the fishermen uh, for uh, almost 20 years now. That's, that's extremely important. We see it in North Sea as well. Uh, everybody needs to be heard. Um, yeah, so the, that, that's um, my, my final say. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. All right, questions for your Sure, look around. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. You're very interesting. And this question, I guess, is really a two, two uh, for all the modelers. One is uh, with respect to scour, and the other one is about zooplankton and euphausids. Um, so I'll just throw them both out there and maybe we could just discuss. Um, but we've heard a lot about the sediment um, impacts. But are they, do they take into account various scour strategies, whether that's from putting down scour protection itself or, or um, I know there's some nature-based solutions for scour protection, which includes planting seagrass and things like that. So that's, that's one. And then the other one is, I guess, probably for most, uh, particularly for DHI, has anybody done agent-based models for zooplankton or euphausids that actually have the ability to move themselves um, against currents? So. If you allow me to respond to the scour question, then I'll leave the agent-based modeling question to DHI. Um, so it, it, it's quite typical eh, to have scour protection around your foundations, but um, in high current areas, um, you still see that there is um, an increase in sediment transport at the edge of your scour protection. So you cannot protect the entire seabed, so at some point you stop. Um, and, and edge scour that can... Um, depending on your flow conditions, um, extend um, you know, quite far uh, outside of the footprint of your scout protection. Um, and that um, and we're, we're not talking about meters of seabed level lowering, but uh, just enough to increase the um, sediment concentration in the water column every now and then. Um, and there are indeed efforts on uh, alternative scout protection systems. All right, so so now it's just loose rock, um, and and that works quite well because it introduces hard substrate, and and it turns out that marine life likes hard substrate, and with a couple of small adjustments like choosing larger rock to create more pore space, um, or or introducing calcareous material to to facilitate um, uh, oyster developments, there's a lot of possibilities in in terms of nature inclusive design. Um, artificial protection systems are being developed and we also see that um, or what I understood from my uh, ecological colleagues is that seagrass growth on, on depths of typical offshore wind farms is you know, rather non-existent because the amount of light that reaches the seabed is not sufficient. So um, there are some alternative scout protection systems that make use of artificial vegetation, but that's plastic. So it's, it's, it's plastic fronts and it, I mean, it, it may also create a, a, a habitat that's suitable for marine life. Um, but I also know that the, not, not everywhere in the North Sea, you, you can get a permit for those kinds of uh, systems simply because they're plastic. So. Yes. Are they are those we, results in the report anywhere? Or yeah, we can I can find something. I can never talk to guys. Okay. It's not me. But we do whales, for example. Yes, like crazy whales. I know they move. Yes, I know. But they move quite differently than you thousands and uh, yeah, yeah, but still, but, but, yeah, yeah. But, but still the core parts they move still goes up and down. But they okay. Yes. They also get affected. Yeah, for that, it both. 
It's a cool and, and Mary um, or Brian may want to jump in here. Uh, so all the projects, Doug, have to do sediment transport modeling. So if you look at any of the COPs, you, you can find a modeling that's project specific, as well as a description of the scour protection that each project uh, takes on. So it is it is project specific. And I don't know, Mary, if you want to add any. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. When we did the study, the first time we discussed about this, whether we should include the scour protection, I think we actually include scour protection in the resistance calculation for, because they also take up some, but how important they are for the accumulated impact on a large scale. Um, mm, right on the hydrodynamics itself. Yeah, maybe yeah. a little bit. They, they change the resistance a little yeah. bit. Anything else? Any other comments? Just an observation. It seems like that what we could benefit from would be uh, the equivalent of the uh, community model intercomparison project for the different models that are being developed for offshore wind energy development. But anyway, that would be a pretty in interesting project, I would think. Yeah. As you are said, we 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 are a little bit of twins institutes because we have same history and has competed all our lives. Uh, and uh, we have compared results for different projects. Uh, they have been compared very, very closely. And I think normally we can agree pretty close. That would be- Although I do think that in the North Sea, we were just a little bit better. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, it's right. only the names. <laughs> And with, who, who, with who's, who's doing Dutch water right now? Yeah. So maybe with that, we'll take a break. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, let's not do that. Okay, maybe a, a 10 minute break. Um, return in. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to hear, we've got. Two, two uh, topics to cover here after our, our break. And the first one is going to be um, from Christina Archer from the University of Delaware and looking at atmospheric modeling for wind turbines, wind turbine effects on the wind stress. We certainly heard a great deal about that already today. And so now we're going to hear even more. So Christina, please. Yeah. Should I use this microphone? Is yeah, that yes, so the people online can hear you. Yeah. yeah. So thank you uh, very much for inviting me. And uh, it's my pleasure today to talk to you about atmospheric wind turbine wakes. So we're switching from the water to the air and that's where I'm gonna stay for the, for the rest of my presentation. I'm gonna show you some modeling as well as some observations of these wind turbine wakes. But uh, um, I would do a disservice to wind turbine wakes if I didn't show you these two pictures. These are actually photos, so they're take so they're taken with regular photo machines. And um, as far as I know, they are the only two examples of naked eye visible wind turbine wakes in the world today. So you all now know just as much as any expert in the world about what wind turbine wakes really look like to the naked eye. They are basically almost impossible to see naturally. These were very special uh, days in in the uh, offshore environment of Denmark. Uh, this is the Horns Rev the two Horns Rev farms. And as you can see from the dates, they were taken eight years apart. So that's how rare they are. So next year, maybe we're gonna get another photo or something like that. Um, so they have to be the right conditions of humidity, uh, stability and, uh, and temperature for, for those to be visible. But the main point is that you can see how these wakes are regions or plumes that form downstream of wind turbines. These are not, uh, pollution plumes, there's no emissions, there's no pollutant in there, it's just water vapor that's condensing. But it kind of shows you the features, the, the cylindrical nature of the wakes. Sometimes they expand and become very, very large, and sometimes they stay kind of tubular. Uh, but this is what we're, we're going to talk about. Where we can observe, uh, we can also observe wind turbine wakes via LIDAR systems, and uh, these are examples of what these wind speed deficits look like. LIDARs are uh, basically electromagnetic waves um, that are safe to the eye that pick up movement of particles and via yeah, Doppler kind of effect, they can tell you what the wind speed was. 
And behind the turbine, you will see this wind speed deficit, meaning that there is reduced wind speed uh, with respect to what the wind speed was upstream. So in the first figure in the middle, you can see a vertical cross section of a wake. Uh, this is um, uh, the colors are like the more red, the faster the wind speed. So blue is kind of like indicative of a deficit. And the same color scheme is pretty much in the other in the other animations and in the other picture. The picture on the left is taken uh, from the Lewis turbine of the University of Delaware. We own a Gamesa 2 megawatt turbine on the marine campus in Lewis. It's been operational for some 10 years. And uh, um, the, the we sell basically excess electricity to the city of Lewis for a for a profit, I guess, and the funds have to be invested in research on wind so we can fund some students and initiatives related to research. So it's a very cool uh, initiatives that uh, that was because of the turbine. Another way that I can show you uh, some wakes is via large eddy simulation, uh, which is a form of computational fluid dynamics. And on the left is a single turbine wake and uh, uh, the, the rotor is where the circle is. And again, the color scheme is such that red is, is fast and blue is, is, is uh, weak. And you can see how dynamic the environment even, in, even around the turbine is. So there's turbulence in the wake, sure, but there's also turbulence outside of the wake. On the right is actually the Lillegrund wind farm, which is my favorite farm in the world. <laughs> It's, uh, um, it's located between Copenhagen and Sweden. And uh, um, this is a 48 turbine farm. And that's, that's an example of a simulation. Again, blue shows you where the maximum wind speed deficit is located. And just so you know it, these simulations take, the, the one on the right has taken something like a month and a half on 144 processors continuously running for a month and a half. And he gave me maybe 20 minutes of results. So these are very, very intense simulations that need to be done. You can also use a, uh, a mesoscale model such as the WARF and use a parameterization such as what other colleagues have used. Have used. This is a simulation that we have conducted with the WARF model and the Fitch parameterization, which is the standard one that comes with the model. Um, this is the day of the summer of 2018. We simulated the entire summer, the day with the longest possible wakes from all the uh, planned offshore development uh, along the US at that time. All the, all the wind energy areas are filled up to the stated capacity. And this is the, basically the worst case with the longest wakes. And as you can see, they can become rather long, uh, maybe reaching 100 kilometers or something like that at times. You can see overlap of wakes from different farms, neighboring effects, uh, you name it. I want to point out how um, crucial it is in this kind of simulations. It's absolutely crucial to have enough resolution in the vertical. It's, you need to have at least three, if not four points below the rotor in order to capture the surface effects enough. And this was extremely hard to do. So if you only have one point below the rotor, you cannot possibly solve the divergence convergence effect that, that I will describe later. And you can probably, you would probably get the wrong sign of the, of the uh, heat fluxes and turbulent fluxes at the surface if you don't have enough points below the rotor. Also, um, prior versions to, uh, I forget the exact version number of WARF, but there has been a 10 year, um, the version of WARF over 10 years had a bug, a code bug. So any results published in the literature you, during that 10 year um, um, period, basically has a major bug in the code. So there's a paper on this and, and the community is aware. So if you if you've just, just be aware of that, it's possible that if you get some strange results it's because there's a bug in the code. Mm -hmm. Why do we care about wakes? Um, aside from the fact that they can have, you know, they can be very long and impact communities. But I think the main reason that we care is that they impact power production the most. So, this is the layout of Lillegrund, which I mentioned already before. And uh, um, I'm focusing on that column of turbines, column B. And let's imagine that there's a southwesterly wind. So that turbine 15 is the first one. And that is the line here. 
I don't know if I want to dare touch in the screen because my colleagues have had crazy effect, but this line one means 100%. Turbine 15 produces 100% of what it can at the wind, at the wind speed of interest. But then the pink line after that, and I'm not going to touch it, but um, the second turbine, which is number 14, does not produce 100%. In fact, for the wind direction of southwest around to 220, it produces 30% of the power of the upfront of the of the front turbine. And same for the next turbine, 13, 14. Instead of producing 100%, they produce 30% of what they could. And why is that? Because of that wake. The wake of the front turbine hits the second turbine. The second turbine does not produce as much as the first. And this goes on and on and on in the farm. What is your x-axis? My what? The x-axis. Is the wind direction. Yeah. Wind direction. So, yeah. So the, the, the one with the minimum is exactly, you know, 217 yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you're around it. Yeah. And... Mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's take a look at uh, at these wakes in more detail, and I'm going to show you some literature data uh, and some some of my own results. This this is actually from the literature. This is a wind tunnel experiment, and it's actual measurements from uh, a, a long row of small turbines, and the colors they happen to be the same. So I really love that. So if you look at the blue. That's the wind speed deficit. And as you can see, it touches the ground basically uh, relatively quickly. So the wake of the turbines in terms of wind speed deficit indeed reaches the ground pretty much at any after every turbine. You see that blue shade uh, where there was a higher wind speed before upstream. The second issue that I want to point out is something that came up today about how the wind speed deficit is not cumulative. And this actually illustrates what I mean. The, you can see that between the first and the second turbine, there is more of that blue, the dark blue. That means that the, the, the shade is still, it doesn't get any darker in the second turbine than in the first one. And then if you actually continue and look, if uh, you focus on the dark blue, you can see that it doesn't get any darker at the third or the fourth or at the fifth. The maximum wind speed deficit kind of like remains the same. And if anything, the further you go in a wind farm, the less of the, uh, that deficit is. So it's not only non-cumulative, it's very non-linear and very hard to actually predict. Um, you can use also large eddy simulations to look at uh, the wind speed deficit. These are three cases for three stabilities, stable, neutral, and unstable. And now the color is reversed. So you have to look at red for, for a stronger uh, deficit, but it reaches the ground between four, three to five, six diameters. So the wind speed deficit reaches the ground Translated offshore for the oceanic community, it means that the wakes do reach the, the water, uh, the surface, which we, we suspected already before. You can also use WARF again. Uh, this is a mesoscale model with a parameterization. And if your parameterization is correctly done, you should see the same effect. And in fact, we do. Uh, so these are results from the Mid-Atlantic uh, um, um, wind energy areas. And on the left is the deficit at hub height. And of course, it's, it's the largest. So we're expecting that that's where the maximum deficit will be. But when we focus at the surface, and again, you need to have enough vertical levels to really see that there is still an impact at the surface. So the wind speed deficit does indeed reach the surface, but it's very modest compared to hub height. I have the line, the dashed line was 0.5 meters per second. Um, that is kind of like, to me, it's almost like a threshold of detectability. LIDARs have a hard, hard time detecting a difference that's less than 0.5. Some LIDAR experts might say, oh, we can get to 0.3. But, you know, around 0.5 is what we can detect. So as far as a measurement is concerned, you're not going to be able to see, to see anything except the 0.5 line, which for the most part is limited to where the wind farms are. So on average, at the surface, you're not going to see wakes in Long Island because of the offshore wind farms offshore of New Jersey. Everything remains relatively local. And we also have some simulations that are more relevant to this community for the offshore wind areas here. And uh, again, every region is different, but for, for this region, there's even less of an effect at the surface. It's almost non-detectable. No, no, no and this is a three-month three summer average um, that we did. 
Now we can look at turbulence because if wake, remember, has a wind speed deficit and tur added turbulence. So how does this added turbulence behave? And these are again wind tunnel experiments, so measurements for only two stabilities, neutral and stable. And I want to point out, first of all, obviously, there's a large injection of TKE. TKE is turbulent kinetic energy, i.e. turbulence. Large injection of TKE near the upper part of the rotor. Um, my face is frozen. I don't know. Okay, it's back. <laughs> um, so that's where most of the TKE is added. And if we focus now at the ground, which is where we're interested in, look at that. We actually see a reduction in turbulence near the ground. Near the ground. So there is no enhanced turbulence near the ground in the wake of a turbine. If anything, there is a reduction of turbulence. And this is from wind tunnel experiments by colleagues. Uh, we can look at more wind tunnel experiments represented in a slightly different way. This is a vertical profile of turbulence intensity before and after a turbine. And again, at the ground, you see the green dots are upstream and the uh, symbols are after the presence of a turbine and the turbulence intensity near the ground is reduced. We can also do a large eddy simulations, and these are some of some of the results in my own team. And we can see how upstream of this turbine we saw, you know, uh, reds and oranges, and then downstream uh, we saw more greens. And uh, uh, again, turbulent kinetic energy from other uh, LES simulations show a reduction of turbulence near the ground uh, downstream downstream of the turbine. These are some results from my PhD student using yet another LES code. And the first row, the first uh, uh, row of results is for a single turbine. And the second uh, row is for a um, farm. So several turbines in a row. <laughs> and regardless of the stability, we see that blue near the ground, a reduction of TKE near the ground, accompanied, of course, by a large enhancement of turbulence. But that's that's uh, uh, near the top. Um, the rotor tip. So again, if we look at the what the Wharf model, uh, we want to see if this is actually resolved. And if you have enough points below the rotor, it will. In fact, here we have the TKE added near the rotor top on the left. So a lot of TKE added because of the presence of the farms. But once you go to the surface, you see that the color switches from um, warm to cool colors. And that's because there is indeed a reduction of TKE at the surface. So at the surface, we're expecting reduction in wind speed as well as reduction of turbulence. So can we, do we see this in actual measurements? Um, can we see these effects in actual um, in an actual uh, setup? And again, I'm going to use the uh, Lewis turbine as as my um, I, I held a field campaign around there, and it shows you where we are. So Delaware, uh, okay, okay, I can't point, but um, the turbine is shown in the figure down there. Um, the way we set it up was that um, yeah, you can't really see where the turbine is. Let me see if I can go. This is where the location of the turbine is. We have a radiometer, a MET tower upstream of it. We have LIDARs and we have 15 surface flux stations um, uh, in the field behind it. At the end of the summer, the prevailing flow is actually southeaster, uh, northeasterly. And so the, the flux towers are in the wake of the turbine. And uh, th there's a heck of not, uh, a lot of measurements that, that we did on each of those sensors. And these are kind of some examples of the wakes that we detected. And uh, so some, some random days. And as you can see, the wake is pretty long. Uh, it meanders. It's not a straight cylinder, axis symmetric. It's, it's very meandering. And even in the course of a few hours, it can, it can be over different stations. So at, at the second at time one, it can be over station S1. At, at six hours later, it's over station S3 and things like that. So to quantify the effect of the wake um, really correctly, it's very important that you take out any other reasons that could cause it change in, let's say, wind speed. So just looking at a station um, before and after a wake hits, 
uh, it, it might be it might be too comp it might not be sufficient because there could be other reasons that cause that difference so the way we did it was we used the difference in differences approach basically we always compare two stations at the same time simultaneously and uh, one was under the wake and one was not so we do the measurement of that difference when one is under the wake and then we compare with the measurements when none of them is under the wake and by doing that difference in, dif in differences we are positive to isolate the effect of the turbine and so this is an example of how, how that works for wind speed on the left we looked at stations s s2 minus s1 and in, in, in green are the wind directions where none of them is under the wake. So they are basically, there's no difference really between the two. So all the dots are around zero. When there's no wake, they are pretty, they pretty much measure the same. But when S2 is under the wake, then there's that, um, oops, the difference becomes negative, which means S2 has a lower wind speed than S1, and that's due to the wake. And so we could uh, we could uh, look at the effect of stability, and it doesn't seem to impact it very much. So regardless of stability, we saw a reduction in wind speed. And the right um, figure is actually friction velocity, which we used as a proxy for turbulence. And we were very pleased to see that indeed also turbulence was negative when the wake hits uh, station S2, which means again that the wake causes a reduction in turbulence at the surface. We were also interested very much in um, a lot of other parameters, and I'm going to show you a bunch of results here. You don't even need to look at the numbers or anything, but blue means that the results are statistically significant and they are a reduction. So we found a statistically significant difference in wind speed when the wake hits. Same for uh, friction velocity. Always you see that blue in the table. A statistically significant reduction in heat flux, although heat flux is so fluctuating and very difficult to, to measure differences. But anyway, we, we could find some statistically significant uh, reduction. And the last one is actually temperature, and it's not blue, it's red, because there is a slight warming that is statistically significant. And so we were trying to figure out why, why that is. And first of all, we looked at some LES results and we were pleased to actually see the warming in stable conditions uh, also in, in the LES results. On the left for a single turbine and on the right from a farm, basically a row of turbines. And I'm almost emotional when I look at these results because it took so long to, to get them. But first of all, it's very important that you notice how there's a um, uh, bipolar distribution, basically. So wind turbines do not um, heat the atmosphere by any kind, they, they, they don't do that. So they just mix and move air masses up and down. So if you get warm in somewhere, it's because you get cool in somewhere else. You're taking warm air up or down. And so you're bringing it down, you're warming here, but you've got to cool it somewhere else. So it's very nice to see that we did see that. So every time you see warming at the ground in stable conditions, it tends to be accompanied by cooling aloft. So the net effect should be around zero because turbines do not cause a, uh, you know, a, a net effect. And uh, the more turbines you have, the more the warming and the cooling can be. So in a sense, the temperature effect is cumulative, whereas the wind speed deficit was not cumulative. So you see how the, there's more red uh, when there's a farm. But the last point is also that this warming, I have this beautiful figure that seems like there's a strong effect. We're talking about 0 0.1 degrees uh, Kelvin uh, of, of warming. So very hard to even measure. So it's not, a, you know, it, it is statistically significant and due to the turbine, but it's not large in magnitude. And when it's unstable, actually, uh, you can find maybe a little bit of cooling at the ground when you have enough turbines, the little blue blue shade there and a little bit of warming aloft but when the atmosphere is unstable um, the effects are very small insignificant so why do we have a reduction of tk near the ground and to spare you a lot of math the brief story is that if you focus at 
if you focus uh, if you focus on the difference between the blue profile which is the undisturbed wind speed profile and the red profile which is the typical bite that the, the turbine takes out takes out of the out of profile um, it reduces the shear near the ground and once you have reduced shear the tke production term is reduced and so you get a reduction of, of tke because of that uh, but what about the warming? Why do we get warming? And it, it took a long time to understand how I can get warming at the surface um, in stable conditions when my heat flux is actually reduced at the surface. That was like something must be wrong, but it wasn't. And the reason is that just knowing the sign of the heat flux uh, may or may not be sufficient. You need to know if the, the heat fluxes are actually converging or diverging at the area of interest. And so when you have a stable case like this, and we have the downward heat fluxes with this distribution, so strongest at the surface and weaker aloft, and you have an enhancement of TKE in the upper part of the rotor only, that means that the heat fluxes there are enhanced. So the, the arrows pointing down become larger uh, downstream in, in, the, in near the upper part of the rotor but near the ground, they're actually reduced. So what happens is that you have enhanced fluxes in the rotor area, you have reduced fluxes at the surface, you create a convergence below the rotor and that convergence is the reason for the warming. And it's also beautiful that vice versa, you get the divergence aloft because more, more heat fluxes into the rotor area mean that there's a divergence above the rotor and cooling in that region. Of course, when the atmosphere is unstable, it's all flipped and it's it's the other way around. And so we were actually able to verify this mechanism with vertex uh, um, on the Met Tower on a few occasions when the wake was the other way around. And it was interesting to see that uh, the black line represents the divergence and convergence. And, you know, it's 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 a positive di uh, positive divergence before the wake hits. And then in that gray area is when the wake comes and whoop, it flips signs, it becomes negative. So there's convergence and light warming. And then the wake leaves and the uh, uh, convergence <laughs> becomes positive again. It was really nice to see that in the, in, the result, in the observations. We looked at LES results, of course, to look for this. And I'm going to spare you the equation. Um, but the line that you need to look at is that red line, which is the change in the uh, convergence. So a positive change in the convergence means more warming and a negative change means cooling. And for the one turbine case and the row, we see exactly the maximum of that warming and cooling at the locations where we saw the warming and cooling indeed. So it looks like this divergence convergence mechanism is, is, is really key. And it also happens, but on a much smaller, of much smaller magnitude uh, for unstable cases. And then the big surprise, we looked at the results from the wharf simulations and it's the summertime, the atmosphere is stable. I'm expecting warming at the surface after 10 years of studying wakes, <laughs> everything was good. And I look at the results and it's like, what? That's slight cooling <laughs> caused by the wind farms offshore. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. The model is crazy, right? And so we're trying to see, but, but is everything else correct? And it's beautifully correct everywhere else. Everywhere else. So look at how above hub height, we found that blue, the cooling above the above hub height and below the rotor is indeed the warming due to the convergence that we had identified. But this warming for some reason doesn't get all the way down to the surface of the ocean. And we were struggling with understanding why that was until, oh, and, and by the way, there is a direct correlation between the, the, and again, this cooling I'm talking about is very, very small. It is like a tenth of a degree, but nonetheless, it's cooling. But it is clearly associated with location locations where the heat flux is actually being reduced. So a, reduced in ma a reduction in magnitude of the heat flux at the surface indeed should cause cooling. So that is a correct mechanism. The point is, why doesn't the convergence and divergence doesn't it dominate over this? And the reason is that basically these are ginormous, very tall wind turbines, taller than anything we have ever looked at before. 
And so on the left are the results from the simulations that I showed you, which are for the extreme size turbines that are planned for future development. They have a hub height of 120 meters. Actually, I think this is already too old. They're very, very tall, right? And you can see a cross section here in the vertical with the cooling aloft, the warming starting below hub hub and, and, and below the rotor, but it doesn't get all the way to the surface. So basically this divergence or convergence area remains elevated and at the surface we remain dominated by the reduction of the heat flux. By contrast, if you we redid the simulation for a conventional turbine with a hub height of 80 meters, which is what we've always been simulating, and at, in that case, we do see the warming reach the surface. So I guess this is good news that if the turbines are getting even taller, then maybe this warming and this, cool, this cooling is even further away from the surface and everything is going to be dominated by the heat fluxes being reduced at the surface. So in conclusion, I, I would like to emphasize the three impacts or effects that occur more or less all the time in order of, of certainty. Absolute certainty that the reduce, there will be reduced wind speed at the surface, which has already been taken for granted in many of the simulations of ocean processes and wind stresses from wind farms. That's check. Reduced turbulence in, 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 in my experience is in 90% of the cases. So sometimes in unstable conditions, you might not see this because it's already so turbulent. But reduced turbulence at the surface should be expected. And reduced heat fluxes uh, most of the times. This is the hardest one to actually quantify in the field. And if you're looking at surface temperature effects, which have not really been discussed much today, um, there are many factors that matter. As you hopefully were convinced, stability literally flips the sign of your temperature effect. So you can expect warming in stable conditions and actually cooling in unstable. So I cannot give you an answer, a definite answer. It really depends on the stability. And the divergence of the heat fluxes is the mechanism that seems to be very important to understand surface, surface effects. And turbine hub height has an, has an impact as well. And the turbines getting taller and taller probably is good news for effects on the ocean surface. I try to go as fast as I can to <laughs> make up for the time, but that's it. No, thank you. That's thank you. that's that's very interesting. Yeah, please. Hey, so, uh, so uh, I, I guess my, I have two questions. Uh, first one uh, about your last last slide, where you, where you uh, about the differences in size. Uh, were you were you only changing the hub height, or were you also changing the, changing the, the, uh, the diameter of the rotor? Also, the diameter. It was a completely different turbine. I know what you mean. Yes. Okay. And then the second one uh, is uh, in your simulations over over the ocean. Uh, 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 have you considered the effects of, of the of the ocean lower boundary layer feedback of that on on your wharf? No. So the, sur the sea surface temperature, anything about the ocean was held constant as actually not constant. It was we, we got the uh, initial conditions and the boundary conditions from whatever. I don't remember exactly, but uh, yeah, it was, we, there was no interaction, no feedback, no one way or two way, nothing. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Christina. Eileen, are you doing oh. the. Okay. Yep. Was it me? Yeah. I don't. Uh, know. Two related questions. Yeah. Um, does the uh, wind deficit at the surface scale with wind speed? Meaning, is it like a percent of the wind speed, or do you see that it's a constant deficit? And yeah. then my other question was: um, What was the other question? Well, let's go with that one first, yeah. and I'll remember the yeah. other. Yeah. Everything it, it scales. Pretty much everything scales with, with wind speed. I wanted to show actual values in the paper because of the threshold of detectability, because if it's below 0 0.5, it's almost impossible to detect anyway. But yeah, it scales. Okay. All and the wind speed deficit, they tend to be, have a Gaussian self-similarity shape, so it depends on the speed. And I remember my second question. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, yeah, right. Thanks, Doug. Um, <laughs> The, as the turbines get bigger, mm -hmm. do you exp you you presented that number of like four turbine lengths downstream where the where the surface deficit and winds happens? Is that something you would expect to be scaled based on turbine size, or as the turbines get bigger 
and the rotors get further from the ocean surface, are there other processes at play that might impact that? No, I expect that parameter to remain the same, but keep in mind, don't memorize four to five D because that's correct for a single turbine. Mm -hmm. When you're getting to a farm, it's actually even, even closer. And if you're thinking about how far downwind would a wake last, um, if you have a single turbine, it can be 20 diameters. A single turbine wake can be 20 diameters. But when you have a farm, and I don't know what the diameter of a farm is, but you might have some kind of typical length, maybe the, the width of the farm or the length of the farm, that wake is not going to go 20 times that length. It's more going to be like three to four times that length. Mm -hmm. so there's some very bizarre nonlinear processes that go on. Okay. You know, I don't okay. know who decides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I was going to say. Okay. Chin. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, I like your I like your results because uh, I after we run for you know wind effect, we worry about our results we get us wrong because we find you know surface wind you know we have ten meter winds change so small. You now even yeah. winter time the maximum zero zero point four meter per second the changes so the surface so we think oh everybody talk about the, the wind away so why we get it so small but your results are very clear sure that you see you know it's a surface effect is very really small yeah yeah so yeah that we find it's, a, it's an important it, it's a very important yeah we, it, we get a results we find it's so small so then we draw the circulation between the final circulation change a lot but definitely changes i'm saying but not change because uh, even winter time we change it like a zero point four meter per second, but the most of the wind in the winter time, seeing the winds at seven and the 10 meter per second. But then, uh, then that's an average wind in the, in the offshore region, but then it changes 0 0.4 meter per second, it's very small. Yeah. So we didn't find a circulation pattern changes. So I was, we was worried about it. We just go, go to check it, check it as we get it wrong or something. But so your results is uh, consistent. We feel so happy. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, you have to because be sure we are, that when we you are see a, the figure right? of a wind speed yeah. deficit, you need to ask at what height is yeah. this taken? Because everybody wants to show the strongest effects, right? But yeah. They are at 120 meters at, at the surface. Yeah, They're it's not a completely different story. Right? Second yeah. deficit, no way. Yes, nice. Yeah. I don't know, Eileen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Too many mics on, Richard, you're off your mic. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, can you say a couple words about how you modeled with your LES the rotor momentum extraction? Was this just a drag law or what did you do there? Oh. Yeah, we used actually three actuator lines, which means that we could uh, see the blades each blade was aligned with some 30 points, grid points on it. And then there was a very sophisticated way to um, incorporate the push of the wind as well as the rotation that would occur simultaneously. Yeah, I have a slide. Maybe I can show you later. Yeah, okay, thanks. Hey, Glenn, yeah. This is kind of a wacky <laughs> late afternoon question. <laughs> I'm scared. But but I, I'm amazed at how high these road heights are getting. Do people have to climb up to service that? And to the top elevator. of the tip. <laughs> oh my gosh, because I nearly fell off the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. <laughs> and that was only 60 meters. And I was afraid. So I can't even imagine going up that high. That's In fact, you would never be allowed to, to go alone. Yeah, oh, it has to be in pairs of two people yeah. oh, that, that with training and, and all, because if one passes out, the other yeah. has to save you. So, wow, yeah. pairs. They're not climbing, but they're elevators. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 okay. That makes it a little, little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, yeah, to, 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 to respond to it. <laughs> Still, you don't have to climb up. No, they have elevators. <laughs> no. Our turbine has an elevator too. <laughs> Uh, to, to respond to that remark, that, that, that that's also a good argument why there is now a lot of discussion on standardization um, and, and simply limiting uh, dimensions of the rotors and that, that also um, facilitates um, upscaling much better. And that, that's also very helpful for, for the installation contractors who have to develop a new ship for uh, projected rotor dimensions uh, in, in a couple of years and then they can use it to install at one wind farm and they need to new build new equipment already for the 
for the next generation blade. So there's a lot of discussion on standardization. That that was not my question, but I wanted to throw it in there. Um, did you also, when you were modeling the uh, wake effect, did you also model the uh, wake of the pile itself? No. Only only the rotor. No. Do, do you think that would impact some of your conclusions no. related to? So some of the NES results, not my own, but in the literature, have had that some have had the nacelle and some have not. And they have a strong impact very locally, but it vanishes between one and two diameters. So since wake effects are, you know, 20 diameters, it, it, yeah, it, it was not a, an important one. Okay, I mean, because in flows, we typically, I mean, you, you, you can see a wake up until 40 pile diameters in, in the water, but that's not, I know, that's not, I know. not the case with air. No. But think about it this way. So um, a, a pole or, or, you know, a foundation, doesn't actually take any energy away, right? It's just an obstacle with some drag. But a turbine rotor is a marvel that takes that energy away from the flow. And so, of course, behind it, there's such a reduction, such a difference in the, the wind speed deficit that compared to what a little pole, you know, pole can do, I mean, this rotor is sucking energy away. So I don't know if that helps. Any other questions? Okay, then I think- uh, I had a question. Uh, hi, this is Tom Patrick from Bohm. I was wondering um, about the, you saw some observational results about the wind wake from the wind tunnel and so forth that my understanding is most of that is over the land surface. So I was wondering how much do you think, or to what extent can you just extrapolate that to the marine uh, environment? Yeah, and uh, keep in mind also that most LES results are dry. So there's no moisture at all. So I, I expect that there would be some, some impacts from the fact that there's humidity and maybe even a phase condensation and things like that. But the nice thing about using stability as a parameter is that at least some of it should, should, should hold. Some of the results should hold because the atmosphere is stable or unstable or neutral, even in moist conditions. And so, you know, there will be differences in a, in a marine environment with moisture, but uh, I don't expect that the fundamental processes will be different. I just expect that maybe the magnitude will be uh, different. My results with the WARF model did include full physics and water vapor and, you know, everything. So those were included, but not the LES, which is what you were asking. I, I think you were asking about well, the I was thinking LES. Of like the surface, I was thinking more of like the surface waves, like the um, affecting the actual shape of the sea surface. Um, so you were thinking about whether the waves height could impact these results? Right. Yeah. Not dramatically, I would say, because to me that, that converts into a Z naught, you know, surface roughness kind of value. And there is not a ton of sensitivity to the results at hub height if you change the surface roughness. And the hub height is where the maximum deficit is and where everything kind of starts being exciting. So I don't expect that to be a large factor, but I, I it, it's, a, it's, it's an educated guess. Okay, thanks. I was gonna ask uh, similar questions regarding the the interaction at the surface. Mm -hmm. um, so between heat flux temperatures uh, and and any of the physical features, um, you measured all this in on land. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does that scale to or translate to mm -hmm. to the water? So it was over land, but it was basically at a marsh, and it was um, two hundred meters from the ocean. Let me see if I have a photo. Ah, yeah, so this is where the turbine is. Yeah. Um, and it actually flooded completely because we had a hurricane <laughs> during one, during a week of the simulation. So it was very, very, very moist conditions. Maybe not exactly as offshore, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the measurements. Has, yeah. I mean, there's trees and things, which... No, there should be... I mean, there are there are some some bushes yeah, here, so yeah. But you know, S one, S two, and S three, which were the ones that we focused on the most, um, were in a very very fetch free. I mean, it was very um, flat, and and it was almost flooded. I mean, I had to wear boots up to here to to go. It doesn't mean that it it extends you know directly, but it yeah. wasn't a dry environment. Just thinking about that between the with combination of that and the and the wave action on the water. Just almost never fly. 
Yeah. I've seen a couple of papers that um, showed a large impact of waves in very, very spe special conditions. But even that, I don't think it would reach, I think it maybe would reach like 50 to 60 meters above the ground, but never the hub heights that we have today. Oh, no, I wasn't thinking so much about the oh, hub okay. heights as, as the interactions with the surface. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. Well, we see it's pretty smooth, see it from the inside, even if that's laser, because we're there. Yeah. It's still there's no ones. No. It's from the inside. It's from the inside. Okay. Any other questions? I, I think we'll move on to our last set of presentations. I'm sorry. What, Josh? Yeah. Oh, I'm Richard. I. And I hesitate to ask this because it sounds like a really stupid question, but if if the turbines have trivial effect on the surface turbulence or speed, what's driving these far field effects that are coming out of the models? So the, that, that's, that's to anybody. Yeah, I mean the effects at hub height are not trivial. Um, you you see, I mean, I'm talking about it's, it's measurable. But it's at the surface. No, you're saying it doesn't seem like to be a, a, a significant. At the surface, yeah, yeah. I'm not, about, not, that's what I'm talking about. The surface. So, so it, that that's why I started my presentation saying that it's very important to have enough points to resolve these effects because if you only have one grid point below the rotor, you will not get this right. The TKE will reach the surface at the at the next time step just due to the diffusion processes alone, mm -hmm. basically. And so I'm I'm suspicious of, of many of the modern results that have been presented before precisely because of this. That's my point. In addition, many, many studies have used the version of the WARF model that has a bug in the TKE treatment. And so that impacts all the results. Um, yeah. And then most of the other uh, talks, I didn't know how the farm was parameterized. I didn't I didn't see any any details. And so I don't know. I don't know how that was done. So if you, for example, for TKE, if you put the maximum TKE instead of at the top of the rotor, you place it at hub height, you got a completely wrong result. So it's the devil is in the details. Could you use your microphone, please? I think it's significant that you show, uh, well, such so, so small effects, both on TKE, but also on speed reduction. Yep. So the, yep. the U star, Yep. which is the parameter we need, really. So I think that's really important that yep. we... Uh, I would like to see, uh, for example, the way we do it, we got the stability correction, all that stuff. Oh, that's right. How that translates You were back. using friends and right? Yes, yeah, how that yeah. translates back yep. to your yep. the results here. That could be really, really yep. interesting. And I know the results are similar to other researchers. I, I went to a conference last year and there yep. were similar results, so... But there are many who have very different results yep. as we just yep. discussed here, because... This makes nearly, uh, it reduces the impact considerably, if that's correct, mm -hmm. as far as I can see. We'll so see. maybe that's the solution to everything. <laughs> <laughs> Use a good parameterization. Yes, yeah. that's uh, yeah, And it uh, saves us the effort to incorporating wind effects. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, um, Remember, for developers, these wake effects are super important for power production. Yeah. So even if we were to find that they're negligible, which they're, you know, they, they probably are, we still need to get them right for power production, or we're going to overestimate the farm production yeah. big time. It's it's obvious maybe in, as a strong word <laughs> but we have gone a long way in terms of optimization of the layout and how we treat the wake effects in the optimization models and things like that okay any other comments so that's a, a good transition to hearing from uh, industry perspective on our committee's task and we have three presentations um, the first one will be from ruth perry and um, she is a Head of Regulatory Affairs for Offshore Wind Americas at Shell. So she joining online or, yeah, okay.
Can you hear me, Kelly? Yes, I hear you fine. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Give some thumbs up. And screen? Good. Yes, we have the slides. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, uh, just want to appreciate the committee taking an opportunity to have um, a developer's perspective brought into your work today. Um, just by background, um, I am a, a fiscal oceanographer myself, however, have not worked in the Northeast, did most of my work in the Gulf of Mexico. So, um, but with that said, I think very familiar with, with storm effects, hurricanes, um, eddies, mesoscale circulation. Um, and some of the topics we've been talking about. Um, I will say what I what we tried to do here is provide you a collective of our perspectives across um, the oceanography, particularly the physics and the biology, as, as well as the climate, and some of the things that, that we have to, I'll say, reconcile in the work that we do when developing these projects. Um, as we're not necessarily uh, scientists, but we do have scientists and we do have very capable support, um, such as you heard from the modeling groups that work on the private sector. Um, I know AKRF's in the room, BHI and some others. Um, and so you'll hear a little bit across some different aspects of this. Um, I think a lot you'll hear in my talk is um, a bit repetitive and I tried to give nod actually to a bunch of the people on the committee because obviously uh, you're the experts for a reason and much of your work has informed what we do from our, our side of the world. Um, and encourage uh, open and honest dialogue with some of the things we're gonna present. Um, and we can also talk about a little bit of, of what's coming in the future. Um, and like I said, I'm a physical oceanography myself, physical oceanographer myself, but I'm a, I'm a data person. I'm an observationalist. I'm not a modeler. Um, so a lot of what I talk about from the developer perspective is going to come from the observational information we can collect and how that we think is valid to informing opportunities, but also informing the regulatory process, which <clears throat> your study is going to help us navigate that. So I'm going to cover three topics that you see here. Um, and go a bit deeper into the physics as well. I wanted to start out with kind of the, the key points um, of where we think the study could really help um, inform developers as they move through the process. Um, and then I'll come a little, I'll come back to these at the end, but I wanted to put these up front. So I think everybody in the room knows this. Um, the National Academy's attempts to obtain authoritative, objective, and scientifically balanced answers to difficult questions of national importance. Um, most people in the room know that the administration has prioritized offshore wind. They've set a pretty ambitious target of 30 gigawatts by 2030 um, and 110 gigawatts by 2050. Those targets are really policy targets that will ideally results in an energy transformation where we have renewable energy in the domestic portfolio. Now, not to say that is um, at any means part of the study itself, but I think that's where it really underpins the national importance of this issue. It's, there is a movement to diversify our energy system, particularly utilizing the resources in the offshore, to address climate and other challenges that we have at a global scale related to energy. Um, in, our, in our view, we hope that the study can provide context that informs regulators on a path forward. There is um, some difficult decisions that have to happen and those decisions in turn, in part changes that we may have to make to our projects. And so this study is a key component, I, we believe in helping the regulators move forward on a path forward and helping us to determine what makes sense in terms of what these projects should look like, how they should develop. The study we believe will also inform scientists of better questions um, to study. I think that last conversation with Dr. Archer was a great one. 
um, as well as many themes throughout the day that we've heard in terms of, of models and scales of what's being considered in those models. And I'll come back to that one. And then lastly, inform developers how to improve our local modeling efforts. You heard from the modeling panel that we have to do assessments, um, both of that are project designed assessments. Those are intentionally constructed by the US regulatory framework. So it's not that we don't wanna extend that science beyond what we're looking at, but we have very clear mandates and regulatory requirements of what we have to provide to agencies so that they can meet their uh, requirements as regulators. We hope that the study can have an appropriate balance that informs future best available science approaches. The reason best available science is in, is in quotes here is, is that it's both a legal and regulatory term um, it's not a term that we would necessarily use in the academic community. And again, this goes back to that balance of how do regulators move forward these projects and improve these projects and, and balance the effects of those projects, utilizing the information that they have now, um, which is that best available science. What we wanted to highlight is a, is a few things that our industry can bring. We have to conduct multiple levels of studies, assessments, and monitoring. Those range across biology, physics, chemistry, uh, and geology, and we geology and geophysics. If I may, I know Doug's in the room as well. Um, and so we believe a lot of this data can, can help to inform how we can answer these difficult questions that the committee uh, will have to reconcile. <clears throat> Offshore wind developers recognize the extension and value of monitoring research beyond the local project level. I'll talk about this in a further slide. We do want to be responsible collaborators in this process and partly the reason that we're here today as well. Um, but we do want to, to know, and this is a theme, you, if you've ever heard me talk on the policy space, is our regulators are often governed by statutes to assess the impacts of a proposed project. Those are both localized and cumulative. But cumulative has a limit, um, and it certainly has a limit when we look at scientific design. Right, and this is not always a perfect system. Um, and so how do we balance uh, what's governed regulatorily with scientific design? And that is certainly a challenging problem. Permitting offshore wind is complex, nonlinear, has multiple scales, and it's, so it's much like ocean physics. That's kind of my cheeky piece. And you'll see uh, the table on the right I don't mean for you to read this. It's certainly not something we expect to get into the report at all, but I just want to point out that the, the permitting process for these projects, major infrastructure projects, is multiple years. Um, and over those years, the science, the modeling, the observations, all of that evolves into the best available science that regulators have to use. Um, and so that gets incorporated through the process. It's certainly non nonlinear and it's a very complex thing that this study will help to inform is how do we get to an output that makes sense for both the design of the projects and what the projects are designed to address, which is impacts to climate. Um, <clears throat> the inverted triangle, I want to point this out. I'm going to switch into talking about scales in a few minutes. I just want to keep in everybody's mind that the scales that developers are looking at are very focused on the local. And then our neighbors, which is the cumulative part under that regulatory context, up to the regional parts, when we talk about modeling, we have to extend that a bit out to look at some of the oceanographic, meteorological, and other effects that, that we have to bring into our assessments. Okay. <clears throat> and just covering high level, some of the partnerships, um, just for many of the folks in the room may not be aware of what's happening in the US now. And I know Laura will dive a little deeper into this with biology. We are doing quite a bit of data sharing. All of these projects are deploying oceanographic buoys. Most of those projects are, are feeding their, their oceanographic data through the IUS regional systems. Um, we intend to see that expand as more buoys are deployed with the new lease areas, but also buoys that'll be deployed to support the lifetime of these projects, which has about a five to seven year permitting time. And then we get into around a 30 to 35 year operational time and decommissioning. And we need those observations, not only 
to support the assessments we're talking about, but to support the safety of our operations. So the data has utility um, both from supporting the projects, also the work that the regulators have to do and the scientific community at large. We want to uh, honor that the best we can. Monitoring, um, we have to do what I'll call it applied monitoring. Um, and this is really looking at uh, the conditions before we build these projects, what happens as we're building the project during construction operations and eventually decommissioning. Um, so there is a lot of baseline data collection, but also more systematic routine data collection that happens in and around these farms. That again, generates significant amounts of biological data as well as physics um, and chemistry. Uh, that can be brought into government data sources through the regulatory process. And lastly, um, part of our good stewardship and where we're operating is we know that there's critical species, critical environments, and other ocean uses in those areas. So we do understand that, you know, contributing to the research base, understanding what's happening in the systems are important. In turn, identifying what happens in the systems helps us inform how to build better projects. And so there is a feedback loop there, and many of the developers contribute to a wide variety of research across the spectrum. Considerations, um, just the last thing I want to go, you know, before we overview the science from the physical perspective, the current state of hydrodynamics in a regional and local level. I added regional and local because, you know, listening today, um, following the work that the committee is doing, we've hit quite heavily on the regional scales and the global scales. So it'll sound a little repetitive when I when I give our overview, but I think what's really missing is those local scales. Um, and I know there's a few of the scientists in the room that we've worked with over the years. And what we're seeing from our industry data that we're collecting is the local variability, the perturbations, and just the dynamics, seasonal, interannual, day to day, on the shelf where we're operating, where these projects are going to be built, change pretty significantly. So, um, you know, we hope to see that the committee address this, address those scales. Um, and what we know about the current body of science perspective to those scales. And that the scales of influence and change um, are important here as you know, we look at European examples and then we look how the technology is evolving in the US, both in, in the turbine technologies, but how these wind farms are designed, that we comparatively fit development of those individual projects and cumulatively across the Mass Rhode Island when energy area into those scales of influence and change as appropriate. And ideally, I covered this, this repeat it, you know, informs regulators on a path forward that they can meet policy objectives, um, inform scientists to better questions to study as there's a significant amount of research that's being kicked off by Department of Energy, NOAA, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, among others, to continue to study uh, what happens as these uh, projects get built. Um, and inform developers how we can improve our local modeling um, that we feed into the regulatory process. Um, so scales matter. Um, you'll hear me say that multiple times. That is nothing new to the committee. So I'm not trying to necessarily offend anybody in the room. I think why I uh, hit this very hard is really to focus um, on that local level. And what do we know and not know at the local level in this region? That's particularly important to understanding what is happening in the biological system and the pump that's feeding that system all the way up to North Atlantic right whales. And what is that? How does the local uh, context change? Is it a tipping point, you know, depending on how many turbines are in the area, how those turbines are designed? For instance, um, we have a unique case study with Mass Rhode Island where all of those leases have a one by one nautical mile grid pattern. That's um, unique in this particular area compared to other areas. As we heard earlier, the technology in the US is also much different. But then again, the dynamics in the area is much different as well. And so thinking you know, global down to local is what's being discussed here today. 
But just want to remind everybody from a developer's perspective, we're really looking local up to regional and global. And so how the two you know, directions intertwine, we think is a really important component of, of what the committee can provide to study sponsors. Uh, base and circulation and currents, uh, nothing new here. We know if we're talking about a global level that there is a weakening of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. We heard this morning um, very well, strong presentation and data on the warming that's happening at the area, um, how those regional currents and circulation is changing as well as ascending warmer currents returning to the Atlantic. Um, and warmer waters intruding on the slopes of into Gulf of Maine and the Western Shelf region, as you see here. And what I want to point out when we get down here and my cursor, I can move it in our study area, which it doesn't look like there it is. When we get down here, we're actually seeing some of that warming too. And so overall, the uh, the bigger global regional picture is really that much of the forcing that's impacting the farms in this location is coming from the north and it's coming from the east. And we know the warnings there, they don't have to repeat that, um, just put up different graphics. When we break down into the regional circulation and currents, I want to note to everybody, you know, just follow this little yellow box. It's approximate to where the locations and sizes of the Mass Rhode Island wind energy areas are because we think as we're looking at this from the developer's perspective at a project level, we're trying to put our project in perspective of working upwards in those scales, not downwards. Um, and so the Shoals is a hydrodynamic system that's part of a larger regional circulation pattern, which we know is, has many changes in it. Um, and the regional net flow is expected towards um, the west, southwest of the city area. The symmetry has a strong influence on the hydrodynamics, um, and you can see the physical features and how all of those interplay. So as we start to drill down from a science modeling perspective, then we know that we have to include um, these factors and, and that what we're considering is happening in this box area. From our perspective, what we're starting to see in local circulation um, from our buoys that are in the lease areas. And I just want to remind uh, the committee that each lease developer deploys typically one to two buoys in their lease area. These buoys are designed to collect information about the lease area and not necessarily much wider than that. So usually the placement of those buoys is dependent on uh, the wind resource and what they're trying to assess from the wind resource. So again, it's not, it has a different application that the, the physics that's coming from that data is very valuable to when we're looking at the area. That data is still preliminary and being worked up. And um, Daniel Mendelson, who couldn't uh, be here today, but I believe is we're working with Kelly is potentially to bring him in so he can present some of the early data to the committee that you're seeing in the buoys. But um, there are other data that's available on Yerikus from the Equinor project, Beacon Wind, and some of that is in the early stages of being processed. Um, and so you won't see it today, but what I wanted to just cover is that we're seeing consistent patterns to what local studies for the area are showing, especially around tides and currents. Um, so tides are the predominant force for driving currents on the surface and the depth of these lease areas. What's interesting about this is um, if you compare some of the traditional knowledge from the sailing community or fishing community, they see this as well. And we also see a we see the rotary nature of tidal currents in the particular areas where these leases are, which you can see down at the bottom of this graphic. And obviously it's just going slightly north when you start getting into the channels of this area, we have a much different tidal forcing. And so what's interesting about this is typically the regional mesoscale models that we've seen will pick that up. But when you start getting into the more localized shelf areas, you start to lose that resolution. So we're seeing the resolution or, uh, at the local levels through our buoy data, 
but that tends to get filtered out when we start looking at regional models. This again just shows the dynamics of what's happening in the area. And all I wanted to do was point a couple of examples of showing that rotary nature of the currents um, and just to orient, my mouse keeps disappearing, Kelly, um, is we're looking at this area up there. So as you follow the evolution of it, you see that forcing that's coming from the directions that we heard about all of the, the off-shelf deeper dynamics, especially if the models you're picking up but you can see that that rotary nature is pretty persistent on the shelf where these lease areas are. This just shows um, a zoomed in diagram of that. And this essentially is exactly what we're seeing. The circular features lower um, is what we're seeing in our buoy data. And we hope to have that available um, at a time that can help inform the committee study because it is one of the only sources of localized data that's in this region. Um, and I just put the colors up there. This model doesn't cover it, but you can start, you can also see that same title, uh, current rotary trend um, in the bottom of these figures if you follow it through of what a day looks like. Um, and then I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, it was discussed today, but we also look at the local hydrodynamics around our particular structures. So the types of structures that were providing in our project design envelopes are what is modeled. And so while different developers may look at different technologies, there's a pretty consistent overlap in the size of our technologies. And we are doing and investigating the same amount of work that's happening um, as you've heard in the lit review, where we're looking at the turbulence and the flow and the changes around our particular structures. We're not only looking at this from the physics and the, and the biology of what's in the water column, but how the sediment dispersal and benthic habitats may be affected as well. Um, and I think many of the points around these two slides were raised. I won't read those. And the same here in terms of what happens when you have a stratified system um, and looking at the overall effect when we look at a range of impact. And that's what I really want to highlight here is when we're looking at uh, specifically individual projects, but then looking cumulatively at a local level, particularly across, across the wind energy area that BOEM has designated, we know that we're going to have um, the turbulent flow, we're going to have these changes on our individual turbines, but what is that kind of tipping balance of the impact against a broader ecosystem that is more forced by what's happening globally and regionally than what is happening at a local level? So we're trying to reconcile that as well through quite a bit of our monitoring and research, um, but we want to be partners in doing that with the scientific community as well as how can we collect the data and observations to really understand what that change in the system is. But based on the literature review and the comparative analysis to the technology that we are deploying, uh, we believe that there's an overall minor impact at a project local level when you look at effects on hydrodynamics. Um, so I'll leave this uh, back up as, as the closing, just to kind of come back to what we hope the study can do um, and really provide further insight on how we can improve the local modeling efforts, how the study can help define what we know in terms of best available science. And when I say the we, talking about the collective developer community, the academic community and, and government community, as well as other ocean users of the area, like I highlighted, you know, the sailing community, for instance, that knows what happens out at a local level, where we can really understand is what happening at a local level cumulatively going to impact what's happening at a regional level where we know that the regional forces that you've heard about today are really um, potentially more impactful to the biology as well as some of the global changes that are happening potentially more impactful to the biology than the structures themselves so we are trying to reconcile that question as well we want to be partners in, in moving that forward and we look forward to what the committee can help provide to the community on where the current state of knowledge and science is on that particular topic. 
Okay, thank you. Um, questions? And we're happy to take questions all at the end too, Eileen, if that's helpful to hear from everyone. Okay, if there's no questions right now, maybe make sure I don't miss anybody. Okay. Um, okay, so that's fine. We can hold questions until we get to the end if we want to do that. Okay, so next um, we're going to hear from um, from um, Seth Kaplan, and he is the North American Director of External Affairs for Ocean Winds, um, which is a global offshore wind joint venture between EDP Renewables and Energy and uh, overseeing governmental and regulatory policy. So, Seth, please go ahead. Thank you. Turning on the microphone is very helpful. Um, so let me just toss this up and start my video and kick it into uh, slideshow mode. There we go. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm who you want speaking towards the end uh, in that I'm going to be brief and uh, really trying to be responsive to what's been said. Uh, more than sort of presenting fresh material. Uh, I, I mean, I do have to say that uh, initially that having a first presentation uh, hitting on some of the, of the day, hitting on some of the same points that I intended to about the uh, question of the uh, putting uh, things into context in terms of the climate impact better than I could have presented it sort of uh, was a, a bracing and very positive experience in general. Um, so uh, my context for you know, what I'm going to be talking about here is that I spent 16 years at Conservation Law Foundation run and eventually running um, client, clean energy and climate change there, um, started off working more on the transportation and land use side, moving into energy and climate, and we say climate on the label. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, include and uh, collaborating with the oceans program there uh, on ocean protection. Um, and my goal here is indeed to kind of put things into context and talk about the big picture um, and tie it back to some of the, the, the excellent points that have been presented here. Uh, you know, listen, there are obviously enormous topics of a great importance that require lots of further study. And the, the purpose of this panel is indeed to dig into one of them. Um, and what we need to do is be very clear about what science, you know, what the regulators need to do, and they need good input and perspective from the scientific community is what science is ready for use in decision making and what science needs to progress further before it can be used in the decision making process of what do we know and what we don't know. And I was deeply heartened that that was sort of a theme of so many of the slides. Uh, from so many of the presenters about what we know, what we need to know, what we don't know yet. And that's a humility that is rare in our society these days. And uh, and I think it's a perspective from the scientific community that is, is greatly admirable. Um, you know, my perspective as somebody who worked, who has spent my career as an environmental advocate and then working in renewable energy and basically viewing it as implementing science. You know, I spent 10 years of my life beating my head against um, coal-fired power plants in New England, and they're gone, and I'm still here, so I guess I won. Um, but, you know, when I think about the, uh, the, the plant at Brayton Point, which used to, uh, when it was running full tilt, uh, put about a million gallons of heated water into Mount Hope Bay every day which is a body of water consisting of about 30 million gallons. Um, you know, it is not surprising that there was an enormous impact on the fish population there, which was very well documented by some great folks at Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. One thing I would note is that I heard an echo of that this morning, frankly, the discussion of the bluefish being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, the company that operated the Brayton Point power plant used to have a very successful fishing derby because all sorts of exotic species uh, could be found around the thermal outfalls from that power plant. And understanding that these projects, and we need to understand what are the context and what is the impact of our projects. 
And, uh, you know, we are not discharging, you know, wind farms do not discharge heated water, but of course we need to be mindful of our impacts, both positive and negative. Now, of course, the ultimate example of something we know a lot about is climate. Um, you know, I, I just can't help but note that, you know, very few people remember Eunice Foote, who in 1856 uh, published what is believed to be probably the first scientific note uh, about what we would now regard as climate science. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I mean, I, it, I, I think it's actually a really interesting thing for, uh, from an academic perspective to go back and look at what John Tyndall wrote um, shortly thereafter, or Svente Arrhenius wrote in 1896, a lot of the hypotheses, a lot of the thought about, you know, that this, there's the foundation upon which climate science rests is about the most solid thing in the world. And we have the IPCC reports are, the, in, in fact, the largest peer-reviewed scientific exercise in the history of humanity. And I think it's always important to acknowledge uh, Charlie Keeling, uh, you know, missing his children's birthdays as he uh, relentlessly maintained the uh, CO2 uh, observations on the top of Mauna Loa that give us the history of uh, that that underlie and the, the uh, data observations. I, I mean, all that we can do, hope to do as offshore wind developers in terms of this community is to be as good a partner as Keeling had in terms of helping to provide you with the data that you need since we are going to be present out there. Um, uh, you know, so I know it's a little, you know, uh, cheesy, but that's, 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 the, that's who we want to be. We want to be cognizant of your work. We want to be helpful in your work. We want to provide you with the data that you need. And, you know, I, I know that it is a little bit of a mildly extreme point to point out, but the difference between this body of science that goes back to uh, the mid 1800s and, you know, the emerging science, I mean, the really important stuff that you guys are working on is, is, is sharp, sharp. And obviously where the two things interconnect is in the science about the impacts of uh, global warming on uh, marine mammals. Um, you know, that this is a very important topic and we need to be very aware of how, uh, what role we can play as a, uh, as a, as an ocean user in terms of helping you all to get your arms around that and understand and, and have that play out in the conservation world. My takeaway here, and this is where my shred of hope is um, you know, I, I spent the last 20 odd years engaged mostly in New England and then getting into New York and into the rest of, uh, you know, and, and a little bit in Quebec and then the rest of the North America about uh, during that time, um, the energy transition we've already had is pretty remarkable that we used to run on coal. Uh, in New England, um, as is still the case in some other parts of the United States. And now we are on a day-to-day -day basis, generally running major uh, overwhelmingly a plurality on natural gas. This is a transition that has occurred. And the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, now, I mean, this is a very important point that these mandates about uh, offshore wind are not, we call them policy mandates, but they are driven by the science that, uh, you know, I, I got the citation down there to a really excellent piece in climate that uh, was used by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in formulating the 2050 climate roadmap. To be very blunt, here on the coasts, there are just not a lot of places we can use to make renewable energy, to make zero emissions power. And what we have is the offshore wind resource. You know, as somebody who has spent a couple of decades, for example, trying to help build wind farms in Maine, uh, the transmission issues there and uh, some of the, the, the issues that have prevented that from happening are a stark reminder that there are very, very few places here on the, in the heavily populated coasts of our country where we can build large scale onshore wind. Um, we're putting up a fair amount of solar. We need to put up more. We need to put a lot more, but um, 
there is increasing resistance and issues, some, you know, some legitimate about uh, displacement of agricultural land and such. And there is a limited amount of how much we can import. It's, it's, there's a reason why the little blue slice for imports is, is, is blue, uh, because that's Hydro-Quebec. Uh, and there's a limited amount of clean imports that we can from other sources because everybody is going to need a lot of clean power. We need this. We absolutely need this. And I would highlight uh, what I have on the right there about demand, that we need to roughly double our electric use as we convert our homes and offices and factories from direct burning of fossil fuels to electricity as we switch our transportation sector over to electric, the demand is going to rise. Um, and we need to be smart about it. The little gray area up at the top of that, uh, that bar is conversion loads. Those are flexible industrial loads, many of which don't exist right now. But what we need to do is to be able to have highly flexible use of electricity that can ramp up and down depending on when we have need. But at the end of the day, in order to reach our climate goals that are an output from that rigorous scientific enterprise that has been in progress since 1896 or so, in order to meet our goals, we need an enormous quantity of clean zero emissions generation. And the resource we have here on the coasts is overwhelmingly offshore wind. And we, we can't stint on it. We need on that as we hit the scales, we need to put on one side of the equation the absolute critical environmental need, societal need, resource protection need, species protection need, ecosystem protection need to actually build these things. That has to be part of the equation. So that's my plea, <laughs> not to get a little uh, over the top there. But one reality that people just don't are unfortunately are not aware of you know it's a, there's a the, the band talking heads once uh, said it's we live in the age of the dinosaurs you know because we run on gasoline and in new england and in most of the northeast on the cold nights of the year and the cold days of the year we burn oil to keep the lights on and it's a high carbon fuel and that is a reality. We need to avoid those high carbon moments when we are putting particulate matter and other things into the air during the burning of that, the, those fuels. We need the resources that are available during that time to kick in. And as many of you are extremely well aware, it's really windy offshore during those cold times in the wintertime. So the, one of the express purposes of the offshore wind mandates that the Northeastern states have adopted is because offshore wind is a winter peak coincident resource that can help us address this critical, critical uh, problem. So, I, you know, I know this is not the usual uh, stuff of a presentation at a, 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 at a committee like this, but I, I felt it was very important to say what uh, I could say that would have some value. And, uh, you know, it, and uh, so I put up there the future, which is a floating offshore wind turbine, uh, which is currently in commercial operation off of Portugal. And uh, we'll uh, make an offer to uh, uh, accept any floated questions uh, at the after after Laura has spoken. Okay, thank you. Um, Thought-provoking comments. Um, okay, so I think we'll go to our uh, final presentation here from Laura Morris here, and she's just recently joined Invenergy Energy, where she's the Director of Environmental Compliance and Permitting for East Coast Offshore Wind Projects. Thank you. Right Thank you. 
Um, hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Academy and the committee for um, inviting us today to, to speak. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's been uh, quite a learning uh, learning curve today and really enjoyed the presentations. So uh, my name is Laura Morris. I recently joined um, Invenergy actually on Tuesday. Um, and a little bit about Invenergy for folks who may not be familiar with Invenergy. They are a, a world leading um, renewable energy company. Um, they've developed uh, over 30 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy uh, through 200 projects, and there's uh, significantly more in the pipeline. We, um, as a company, have secured two offshore wind uh, lease areas, one on the East Coast, and it's um, you may have heard of Leading Light Wind, which is in the Mid Atlantic Bight, and then um, um, a lease area on the West Coast in Morro Bay. <clears throat> So a bit about myself. Some of the folks here um, know me well, but I, for those that, you, that don't, I'm actually a marine mammal biologist by training and spent several decades uh, working for NOAA and other organizations, um, supporting stock assessment surveys and various directed marine mammal surveys throughout U.S. and U.S. waters and uh, internationally, and spent um, a good 10 years doing aerial and shipboard surveys for North Atlantic right whales. And um, I remember <laughs> the one year when there actually was zero calves uh, that we sighted down in the southeast, and that was probably sad to say almost 20 years ago. So um, right whales certainly have, I've seen them go through a lot of change as have all the biologists that have been studying the species. In 2012, I uh, joined the energy industry, uh, first with Shell and, and then shifted to Orsted, uh, work since, and I've been in the offshore wind industry since 2017 and supporting multiple projects that are um, in development, um, including South Fork Wind, which is actually approaching build um, in the next uh, month or so. Um, I've been heavily involved in, in advancing um, data sharing agreements between the between industry um, and NOAA and other federal agencies, tearing off some of the work that Shell um, did when I actually uh, was working at Shell and Ruth um, has discussed and have been involved in initiating um, uh, quite a few million dollars in, in marine research, including Ecopan project that was um, involved Rutgers and, and several other institutions. I sit on um, a several um, research advisory uh, uh, committees, including um, the RWSC and the main offshore wind uh, research uh, committee. And, and, and many developers are heavily involved in these organizations. And so as, as Seth and Ruth has have indicated, you know, we take, take our stewardship uh, quite seriously. Um, I think it's worthwhile to highlight some of the investment that the offshore wind industry has made to date um, in right whale research. Um, this is an estimate of, of investment. It's likely a much larger number. And then if you consider investment in uh, the larger marine science field, we're probably talking a number that's already in excess of $100 million across the, the offshore wind um, industry. It's, it's pretty significant, and, and this number will continue to grow. Um, there's a range of studies that we have voluntarily funded to date, and then there's additional studies that Ruth has talked about, and, and we'd be happy to take questions on, on any of this um, in the Q&A period. And um, I think there's been some questions about data sharing, and I think there's there's this, this, this sense that there isn't uh, data being shared by offshore wind, but there certainly is. And I think it's just there's so much happening so quickly that it's hard to identify where the where the where those data are. Um, and we're happy to to try and uh, steer you to to where some of that information is. Um, this can't be done alone, and we have been building as an industry collaborations with many institutions. Uh, we have seen uh, the formation of two really key organizations, the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, as well as the Re Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, which respectively deal with wildlife and fishery science, and as well as oceanographic um, and, and, and other, other marine science topics, um, and they work uh, quite collaboratively. Um, and developers are, are heavily involved with that. Um, we are seeing significant state investments. I haven't listed, but there's millions of dollars that the states themselves are investing in, in directed research that probably many of you are familiar with or have benefited from. Um, and of course, you know, you're seeing a, a significant range of academic institutions that are um, becoming involved or have been involved in uh, directed research. And we certainly uh, intend and expect to see um, this list grow. This, by, this is by no means a comprehensive list. 
<clears throat> so for the task at hand, you know, one of one of the tasks that you're tackling is to evaluate the potential of the perturbations from uh, VTGs, wind turbine generators to potentially change ecosystem dynamics and how those could affect North Atlantic right whale prey availability near Nantucket Shoals. So the next few slides is nothing new. Um, I don't profess to be an ex expert on this. I'm a biologist, I'm a mammal field biologist, um, but you know, this is just a, you know, a, re a refresh of, of um, what we have, our, what you have already done talked about um, quite extensively um, today, but just revisiting um, some of these things. So obviously, you know, as we think about it as developers, you know, we recognize it's a very complex uh, biological and, and hydrodynamic system um, that we're trying to tease out. And as, as Ruth very, um, uh, very well explained that we're trying to look as well at, at the local level for, for our permits and regulatory processes that we're, we're going through. I'm not going to go into detail because obviously you're all uh, well familiar with this, this information already. Um, this is just a slide. You'll, you'll get this slide pack. Um, it was, um, uh, South Coast Wind was, was kind enough to, to share uh, some slides that their team is putting together. And I think this is just a nice, simple, uh, um, model of, um, what leads to successful foraging conditions for North Atlantic right whales. And you can look at it uh, more closely when you get, get the slides. Very, very simple uh, flow chart on, on the process, but I think very handy as well. Um, and then same here, you know, this is just a conceptual model of the annual cycle of co copepods. And as you're advancing the report, you know, I think it's a way to, to think about how is um, impacts from the wind farm leading to potential impacts to this, this cycle of, of copa, copepods and aggregation on Nantucket Shoals. From our understanding and, and our review of the literature to date, the best available science is that there is advection onto the Nantucket Shoals, which seems to be driven primarily from regional currents and tides, and that climate change has been well described today and has may have a significant effect on the regional circulation and current systems. And what we ask is, is that as you're progressing the report is to you know, please consider the strength of the relative forces of the existing, you know, area specific conditions and stressors that you've been describing versus any stressor that m may result from a wind, wind farm that you also have, have talked in brief about today. Um, I, you know, I have to, I want to take a higher level review and I really want to call out Aaron because, um, to, you know, to, to, I, I find the work that Erin and her co-authors have done has been really seminal work and really important to right whale conservation and really highlighting what's happening to the populations over, over the last several decades. I personally have witnessed it in my years of, of doing right whale work, seeing that, that shift of right whales from the Bay of Fundy up until the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And I, I remember 2017 very clearly when all those deaths started rolling in because right whale suddenly showed up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And it was a really difficult summer for biologists studying right whales because there was no, there didn't seem to be a way to stop it. But Canada ha has definitely responded. But I think the work that's done here to me really drives home that there are larger forces at play um, affecting the right whale population. And, and I hope as you're progressing the report that you can consider these. And of course, Erin obviously is here to, on the committee and can elaborate in detail about the great work that, that her and her co-authors have done. So other um, considerations, now I understand that your focus is really on hydrodynamics and not on these larger considerations, but I think it's relevant to point it out. I mean, there are elephants in the room. We can't, can't ignore these aspects about the population and that the primary, currently the primary uh, sources of mortality, direct mortality for North Atlantic right whales is entanglements and vessel strikes. And we can't ignore that. Um, and, and we're seeing as discussed a little bit today, there are newly identified aggregations um, that are being detected some from, from uh, and they may have been existing aggregations, but they're, they're maybe newly identified because of the work that's being done by funded, uh, by offshore wind funded, funded research. Uh, some of those is a winter detection uh, from the EcoPAM project that <clears throat> that Josh can talk about in more detail in your in your closed section uh, closed sessions, and of course we talked earlier this morning about the aggregation, the spring aggregation uh, just last month off of um, uh, it, it, 
uh, near the New York Shipping Channel, which was very interesting. And of course, we all know that there was the recent shift into the Gulf of St. Lawrence in, in, in uh, the, the late 2000 teens. <laughs> and so what is the relative importance of these areas? Um, and that leads to um, thoughts about the population consequence of disturbance models. And, and you have Doug uh, on, on the committee who can who has been heavily involved over the years in the, advancing these models. And I think it's really important to consider this because ultimately I think the, the question that, that Boehm is looking at is, is does perturbations at the local level to Nantucket Shoals ultimately affect the population? That's not the question you're here to answer, but, um, but I do think it's something to, to think about. <clears throat> Um, and I did want to highlight that we do do feel that we're bringing conservation benefit to the species. Um, offshore wind industry is bringing conservation benefit to the species. There's a lot of things that we are doing and can do to benefit, um, including reducing entanglements through supporting the fishing industry to shift to ropeless technology. This isn't happening, I will tell you, but but it's a real opportunity for the industries to work together and, and really bring some direct benefit to the population. Um, but what we are doing is a significant investment in uh, addressing vessel strike risk uh, through um, advancing a real-time listening network that, uh, frankly, wasn't there. Um, there, there. There was maybe one or two buoys, and now we have a chain of buoys along the eastern seaboard, largely funded um, by offshore wind developers. And we're advancing tools for detection. Um, automated uh, real-time detection and, and developing sighting sharing, which is important to, to help uh, uh, mitigate for direct impacts from, from offshore uh, users of, of all industries uh, when they're out, out at sea. Of course, um, we've had, uh, Seth went into detail about climate change and, and why of the renewable energy <laughs> transition is happening. So I need not uh, say more about that, but um, it is really important for us to, to get these wind farms built so we can at least try to abate the rate of, of climate change. And then um, as Ruth uh, detailed, um, you know, we, we are advancing a lot of, um, a lot of good science and, and then offshore wind industry is going to continue to trigger millions of dollars in, in research investments, including bringing you all to together to have this deep dive. I mean, this is very exciting. To, to see it is a real benefit um, ulti and ultimately a benefit to, to the right whale population. <clears throat> so uh, finally, um, I leave you with these thoughts and, and um, our request to the committee as you are advancing their report. And I think these are things you are, are already going to do, but I did want to reiterate these is to please consider interannual variability in the ecosystem, um, the influence of storm events, and, and of course, their yeah, potential increasing strengths where there's some indication as, as you described, Glenn, earlier today. Um, and of course, the influence of climate change, which of course Glenn described in detail this morning. Um, and then a consideration of the relative contribution of all the feeding areas that right whales are, are um, visiting and, and what that um, energy intake means to the population and the population's breeding success. I think as you heard, I was sort of trying to dig into a little bit about the, about the different uh, energetic uh, value of the different species of copepods. And I think that's a very important point. Um, to consider. And your recommendations will absolutely help the industry and all the stakeholders, RWSE, ROSA, the states, federal agencies, and prioritize, prioritizing and targeting funding for future offshore wind related research. It's going to be a really uh, key and valuable output from the report. And so I'm, you know, really excited to see that to, to consider, you know, for my company where we want to steer funding in the, in the future. And um, as developers, we're committed to this process. Um, as Ruth really eloquently uh, described, you know, we want to advance best available science. We support <laughs> science-based decision making, including this group, and contributing um, as best we can to your efforts. And we, you know, commit to retaining a focus on sustainability, our sustainability principles, and um, our stewardship of the environment that we operate in. So I want to thank everyone uh, for um, listening. Um, I hope this um, offers some some value to your efforts, um, and thank you for your time. And um, yeah, I think we're we're now ready to to take any questions from you all. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right, questions for any of the three speakers we just heard. Comments. 
Yes. Yeah, I guess I had a question for Seth. Um, it's about, you know, you showed these plans for 2050 looking quite far into the future. And offshore wind was a big part of the, the renewable strategy there. Do you have an idea of, say, at current turbine capacities, what that would mean for the area in terms of area on the shelf occupied by offshore wind farms? Or uh yeah, I mean, I think there, I mean, obviously there is some modeling behind that. Um that anticipates a significant amount of floating. Um, particularly, uh, you know, it would be in the Gulf of Maine, um, and then further down the Mid-Atlantic, and potentially even further out into the New York Bight, beyond the New York Bight. Um, it, yeah, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, and quite honestly, floating is progressing at an extremely rapid rate in terms of um, the, uh, you know, that traversing that same curve in terms of going uh, from, you know, in terms of the height and the number of megawatts produced. So it's a pretty speculative uh, business to be able to get into that. Um, I mean, obviously when you start getting beyond, you know, 2035, 2040, you're getting extremely speculative, but yeah, and you do, you will start thinking about as we're happening is happening on the land side about repowering. I mean, some of those earlier uh, Danish projects that were referred to earlier about horns revs. I mean, uh, and so they, I, I mean, when those first offshore wind farms, as some of our colleagues know better than I do, um, they were put out there with basically land-based turbines, and within about six months, they had just rusted up and seized. And um, it, it's only been in the last 24 years that the entire process of learning how to make an offshore turbine and something that can survive offshore has, has happened. So as is happening on the land side, we can expect a, it, it'll happen a lot slower than what's happened with those early Danish projects where they some of those have been repowered now five times some of the very early ones five six times but eventually you know as we get 20 year live you know 20 years after the initial building of these 20 30 years it's reasonable to expect repowering with more powerful turbines um, dr archer can lecture us all if she wants about the bets limit and uh the uh mathematical uh a ceiling on how much power you can extract from the air but it's it it's 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 hard to get there so i don't have the number for the turbines but yeah um and 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 also to be very honest when you start getting beyond like 2040 2045 there are a bunch of speculative other renewable technologies that could step into the breach but you know, I think we need to build plans today based upon what we know is is possible, and this is what we know is possible. Yeah, I, I can add it, with regards to development in in the U.S. Um, and Mary may want to want to speak to this, but there are um, several lease areas being considered. I'm uh, not lease areas. I'm sorry, areas being considered for for development in the New York Bight and along the West Coast in the Gulf of Mexico and West Coast Maine. Um, California, Oregon. Um, so there's a lot in the pipeline for BOEM that, that they can elaborate on to the committee. Um, with regards to, to um, innovation and, and, you know, where, how big turbines are going to, turbines are going to get. I was at a conference last week talking with some, some experts in this and uh, they've, heard numbers as big as 60 gigawatts i was shocked <laughs> i thought it was in the 20 to 25 range you know um and but 60 gigawatts is now now being discussed so it's it's amazing 60, uh, 60 megawatts so that's a 60 megawatt turbine yeah, you said gigawatt. i'm sorry megawatt i'm sorry <laughs> megawatts apologies <laughs> Um, but I, I, but, and one final thing in Europe, there is pretty aggressive gigawatt targets. I think it's 300 now. Yeah. That's what well, they recently One, one thing I can yeah. say is that I, mean, I, I try not to repeat numbers without them having in front of me. But one thing I can say is that when you look at the industry forecasts going out to like 2040, 2045, half, 
more than half of the uh, of the so gigawatts or megawatts are um, uh, floating. And right now we have no floating in here and we don't have any in the reg you know i mean golden state wind our project out in california and uh the lease area that you folks have out there is you know at the, we just got the lease and we're moving forward with it but you know that's going to be a number of years till there is it's going that's going to be a couple of generations behind the fixed bottom projects that that are under discussion here but that's that's the world we're talking about is that where where the where the norm will become floating. I think yeah, Ruth I was trying to say something. To a U.S. context, so I mean, we just consider I think about seventeen projects. I kind of see Mary behind there. I can't add them up. Let's just say fifteen to seventeen. They can get about an average of two gigawatts um, with the current state of technology, based on what NREL and and, and BOEM have calculated that of course has some variability across the projects and technology like Laura said and, and Seth said but if you assume 17 projects two gigawatts right uh, we're only at 34 gigawatts if we're talking about that 50 gigawatt uh, target you know if we're taking best available science that's here today um, but I think the other thing to recognize too is that may be what we want to build, but that may not be what comes out of the regulatory process, right? So there is um, currently not full lease utilization, um, just given micrositing challenges and some of the other things that, that we raised, whether that's species, habitats, ocean uses, or just technical constraints, water depth, sediment, et cetera, right? So all of those balances, you can assume that there's not full lease utilization, which keeps us under under some of those policy targets that we're talking about. And like Seth said, when you get into floating technology, um, or you consider regional nuances, whether you're in California or Gulf of Mexico, for instance, in terms of, of things we have to consider as we move away from the best available wind resource areas like we have in the Northeast um, and off California, when we get to Gulf of Mexico, we don't have great winds, we have good winds. Um, and so the technology has to change to utilize wind yields that may not be optimal where we have it in certain areas of US. Yeah, and to pick up a specific what Ruth was just talking about in terms of not full lease utilization, the decision to go with the one nautical mile by one nautical mile uniform grid in the Massachusetts wind energy area from a energy production standpoint was not optimal, but it was what was done in order to address a critical stakeholder issue. Um, you know, I, I, come, I was, I spent, you know, my time between CLF and offshore wind working for an onshore wind company that has an extremely large wind farm that you will have driven through if you've ever driven between Indianapolis and Chicago. And that has a uniform layout to address the concerns of that community. And, you know, we've done that, you know, in the renewables industry to address these local challenges, but you make compromises in order to address local conditions, and that reduces the amount of power you can produce, you know, there. I mean, I would just simply note that, you know, you know, the, the areas that have been flagged for concern by some, you know, uh, you know, with that is within the area that is being under discussion here, we're talking about swaths of space on the on that matrix of dots of where the where the where the turbines would go in the Massachusetts area. I mean we're talking that have been identified by some as of concern. We're talking 40, 50 turbines. And taking those out would make projects uneconomically viable and you know make a and take a real bite out of the the climate benefits of these projects so it's absolutely critical that the the work of a body like this and the, and the committee like this you know really help inform the regulators to make decisions based on as Ruth said, the best available science, and which is more of a legal standard than an academic one, I understand, and you know, really helping them to meet the legal standards about taking a hard look at impacts, but again, looking at the overall net environmental impact of projects and understanding that there are trade-offs 
you know, and it's not commercial trade-offs, it's environmental trade-offs for shrinking, uh, you know, projects in response to, um, you know, concerns that have been expressed. Doug, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Eileen. Um, <clears throat> great to have uh, the developers here. I think it's it's really good to keep the discussion um, well-rounded. I have uh, two things. One is, with respect to what Christina um presented and maybe this isn't necessary but is there any need to have data from the development side and the industrial production side in terms of the cascading effects throughout the wind farm to help us think about what that does to the surface of the ocean or do we have everything we need um, just thinking about data that the industry could provide that could help us um, either recommend modeling that or actually in uh, you know enveloping that into what we do do we need more data? <laughs> Doug, you're asking a, a data oceanographer. So if I'm putting my science hat on, Good. the answer is yes. Um, okay. And I think there are opportunities to collect that data through the regional entities that science entities that have been stood up that the de developers, um, academic community, government, NGO community are, are part of. One is focused on environment, uh, marine species minus fish, and the other one is focused on fish. Um, and along with um, the IUS associations who are really helping, as well as NROC, MAKO, MARCO, the regional ocean planning bodies, just trying to figure out what does that look like? Um, there's been a lot of work from the passive acoustic side, as you're aware, to try to figure out there's going to be passive acoustic monitoring. So how do we do the, the power analysis to make it meaningful passive acoustics information, right? So that we're not just collecting data for the sake of data. We haven't really encroached that around the physics. And I think there's a huge opportunity there because as we are developing the projects on our side, the engineers are going to be collecting data to look at the structures themselves. There's opportunity to figure out what is what are those data packages that we can integrate into the structures themselves or near and around the structures, including turbulence monitoring? But no one has sat down, I think, or brought together the right group to say, what are those data systems? What are those packages? How do we use turbines platform of opportunity and do this, the, the statistical analysis to uh, support how much data we need to collect, right? Because when we talk about, okay, Doug wants to put oxygen sensors, I'm just throwing something out there, or CTDs or, or whatever on 147 turbines, all of the turbines proposed in the South Coast area, that's, that's a bit hard to do, but that may not make scientific sense, right? Um, and so we have to sit down and look at the turbines platform of opportunities where they're located and how we can utilize those structures to collect the data that then in turn can answer the questions. So a bit yeah. of a stepwise process there, but I think um, I could speak at least from the three developers on the panel today, we're pretty amenable to doing that. We've certainly been pushing and supporting the entities to help us do that. Yeah, thanks Ruth. I'm, I'm My apologies. I didn't really explain that very well. What I what I was really interested in was the the, the physics data and the um, the turbulence data, the you know the data associated with the actual power generation and what that does to the downwind uh, effects, potential downwind effects on the oceanography. Sorry, I didn't. I, no, no, I, it's a good question. Um, I'm gonna have to put my developer hat back on. Um, yeah. Yes. But some of that data impacts the commercial sensitivity right. of the optimization of our equipment, right? So yep. I'll say similar to LIDAR data, right? So when we're talking about wind speed data on the buoys, four meters above surface, standard and monometer data, not a problem. But when we talk about the LIDAR data, looking at the wind resource profile all the way up through the structures in the atmospheric column, that is proprietary because that information is supporting our calculations of optimization and power delivery that then informs commercial applications like bids. Um, yes. So I think the answer is yes, and we can get to what that looks like in terms of how do we manage confidentiality um, to share that data with the academic community. 
if we start those conversations now, bringing in the engineering side, um, it's good because as you know, data sharing takes quite a bit to work through. Laura and I personally know this from many of our efforts, but I think it's yes. I'll just say that yes, but there's some commercial sensitivity with with doing it right away. Um, yep. And yeah, I want a conversation to have with Block Island and uh, Seavow as well, who do have structures out, right? So we can start collecting local localized data and, and build out, test test the application, the data sharing, test it out before we get to commercial scale in the water. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, part of it, it should have been, maybe I should have phrased it even differently again, and that is, you know, are there uh, data from, from Europe, right, that oh. could be used brought to bear on this question of what does that look like you know halfway through the wind farm and then you know beyond and then downstream i guess that's a, a, a different question and as you're going through the next few months of advancing the report mm -hmm. you know if you if you come up with a, a question or request for data then yep. developers can t take it back and see if they can get it there's no no guarantees but that is uh, all, all we can do is take what your request and, yeah. and carry that forward. Um, but I, again, I want to highlight what you all put in in recommendations in the end of this report for data gaps is, is really critical. I mean, we're going to look really closely at this to identify uh, funding uh, for voluntary funding. States will be looking at it and, you know, and how we, you know, collect data to fill in the gaps for future projects. Um, you know, I think the results the, the report will be really valuable. And I know we, we've we had, I've had a lot of conversations with, through Maracuse and, and Niracuse uh, about this topic. You know, when I was at Orsid for five years, everybody wanted data. I want, as Ruth suggested, people mentioned, people want to put sensor everything. And, and that's not reasonable nor uh, really achievable. Um, you know, ultimately, it's really we, we talked about this last week. It's really hard to get access to those those turbines because of liability, and and there's just not comfortable uh, engineers are just not comfortable. Their 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 energy generating devices that are critical to our to our energy energy infrastructure, and there's going to be sensitivities there. But that doesn't mean there isn't desire to to find ways to collect data that's that's of value and. Um, and I think the wind farms, personally, I think the wind farms can contribute significantly to advancing climate models, weather forecasting models, you know, obviously other environmental um, impact assessments. Um, but I think we have to think really carefully and strategically, as Ruth just described, like doing an analysis to figure out what, what sensors are needed, how many are needed, and, you know, what, 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 is that, what does that study look like? And I think we should think about that. I. I agree with what Ruth just suggested. Okay. I mean, I had one other yeah. thing if I can, and that yeah. is, uh, I, and I assume the answer to this is no, but if they're with the development of paired technology like hydrogen producing on on wind turbines, which I know is being contemplated, is, does that change what we're trying to do at all? And the answer is probably no, but I just wanted to, as long as we have the developers here, because that's going to change what's happening on the platforms and um, things like that. So. I'm not sure if that's a question for us. I don't know, Ruby. I, I'm not sure what you're asking. Yeah, I don't think anybody's that, actually yeah. really got into the design phase oh, in terms okay. of that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, just the raw guess would be that I think that uh, Dr. Archer's answer to the question about nacelles and towers having an impact on um, uh, the the modeling of wake probably figures into this, that like a great bulbous shape on the side of the thing to... Um, yeah, you're the expert uh, on the side of it to help convert to hydrogen theoretically, probably. Let me put a plug in. Um, there is a, a turbine research entity um, that's looking at blade technologies for hurricane and, and typhoon standards, Gulf wind technology. Um, Shameless Plug Shell is the corporate partner, developer partner into that. They're out of Louisiana, Doug. They are working um, with a couple entities uh, and Department of Energy. And so if it's a matter of, you know, sensor testing and validation before we go to the field, I think there are some emerging opportunities to do that because there are 
similar discussions of looking around instrumentation that's going to monitor fatigue and, and et cetera, right? So um, again, I think it's a possibility. There's It's probably early initial conversations that start happening now. And um, I can provide, I'll send Kelly a link um, if that's something that the committee would like to maybe identify is where these existing opportunities might lie to do testing for new data collection, right? That's specific for looking at local U.S. installations okay. um, as a future future endeavor. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Um, Aaron and then Josh. Uh, okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to commend the industry speakers in York for being really upfront about the potential positive benefits of the work that the wind industry wants to do. Um, I took a little break of, from the East Coast in Wales and did some work with oil and gas platforms off the coast of California. Um, and the impacts of decommissioning. And one of the things that we found is all of that structure in the water created really important habitat for threatened and commercial, commercially valuable rockfish species. So overall, you know, the net environmental impacts were complex, but this was a very clear benefit. I think that Laura brought up some really important points about ways that this can be positive, including expanding the Hui Bui Listening Network. Uh, it'd be fantastic to help along the transition to ropeless gear. Um, and, you know, my work is really showing that right whales and climate change is a bad mix. Obviously, wind is not an instant solution for that, but, you know, it's something that we have to think about. So I'm just, I'm excited for this committee to move forward with recommendations both to mitigate the negative impacts, but also to really seriously consider this opportunity to benefit the ecosystem and right whales specifically. So thank you for that direction. I really appreciate that. I just want to add to your California example and Milton Love's work is this is classic tried and true in the Gulf of Mexico as well. Um, and a long history of fishermen being partners in the data collection, right? And actually doing the monitoring and information uh, to support attraction versus production, right? And you can argue that there's positive, neutral, and negative benefits of both, but you know, if they're not necessarily in conflict and you get both, there's potential value there. And I think you're exactly right that the conversation always tends to always go negative. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you're seeing with the U.S. developers is we want to be partners in the science monitoring and research early is we know and understand that there could be negative impacts or effects, but there also may be neutral or even positive impacts and effects. And those are going to evolve over the timeline of these installations. So we want to we want to do we want the information that either we're required to do for a regulatory standard or that we want to do to be part of the community to have value and benefit when we have those conversations. So I really appreciate those comments and just wanted to add, I've been uh, up to my head in that debate for a long time with fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico and offshore platforms and, and um, even moving far out, a good example with the oil and gas community in that sense is we were in areas that the regulators and the resource managers never investigated. And we're able to provide the information and utilize fishermen who go out there 80, 100 miles offshore to bring that assemblage of information in to look at a very complex problem when you were talking about in, impacts and effects. And and I just like to add that, you know, we have we have a really grand opportunity here. I put up some dollar figures. This will be the biggest infusion of dollars for scientific research on the East Coast that the East Coast has probably ever seen. Um, and this will occur again in the Gulf and again um, on the West Coast. Maybe the Navy's invested more, but it's huge. It's a huge opportunity. And I don't wanna see it wasted. And I, when I worked for Shell in Alaska, um, we saw this rapid uptick and there was a lot of, um, you know, poor use of dollars. And, 
and um, and I think there were there's been some you know myopic focus on particular things like developing a passive acoustic monitoring network, and no discussion about oceanographic sampling, um, and we're developing an industry to respond to climate change. How can we ignore that? So I, I again, I really look forward to your recommendations um, to help steer the industry to broader sampling that will optimize the significant influx of dollars. <clears throat> That's encouraging. Yeah. Do yeah. um, you have a response to this or? I, I did want to follow up on Aaron's comment. Okay. I wanted okay. to say something very similar. I just wanted to follow up on, on Aaron's comment because I wanted to say something very similar uh, as one of my last recommendations was, I just didn't have the sensitivity about uh, the data sharing there. You know, and I was really, uh, you know, I certainly learned something very positive that, you know, there is a positive uh, attitude towards sharing that subsurface oceanographic data. And I just appreciate all three talks because I want to take them back to my students this summer. And understanding this larger scale context with offshore wind, we tend to look at it in the narrow sense of the problems, you know, but I certainly want to show, you know, several of those slides if they're shared with non-committee members uh, uh, to, you know, our informal seminar in the summer, because I think it's important for students in particular, uh, uh, you know, to see this larger context. Uh, a lot of times they're mostly reading newspaper articles, which are not always the most balanced uh, approaches to problems there. But no, I, I just want to appreciate uh, your perspectives on this. Yeah, thank you. And we're happy to talk to your students. Um, <laughs> there's an old expression in project development, never miss your flight home is the true bottom line. So uh, <laughs> I, I may quietly slip away here. Doug knows this well. He's always done a policy class um, and come in and, and given talks. I think Laura and I've done this quite a bit on the, the nexus between regulation, policy, and science, um, and, and how industry is kind of in the middle, right, balancing all of those things, as well as folks in the room from the agency side. So happy to do it. And I think, you know, we often get caught within the tags that follow our names, um, and so like Laura said, a huge influx of dollars, it shouldn't matter where those dollars are coming from. Um, it should be, it should matter how wisely we spend that uh, to do the science, to learn about more information because, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, no matter how the dollars have come, we have all the dollars in the world um, and we still can't answer all the questions. Um, and so it doesn't matter necessarily how many dollars are there, but how we use the dollars to move along these big, big things, whether it's to address climate and we require new infrastructure or it's to look at uh, improving seafood sustainability, which is a battle going on with aquaculture and natural resource, right? So there's a lot of good analogies, um, but yeah, we're happy to, to come on a traveling roadshow if that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I have a last comment. Can I have a last well, he, he's been waiting. Let him, yeah, make uh, maybe it's a little. Thank maybe. you for your patience. Ruth, I hear between the lines you also, you're looking maybe for a more efficient consenting process so to avoid this 10 year time scale or something. In Europe, that's, we identify that's the bottleneck now, that's the consenting. So, what we do is pushing to get kind of community consenting parts of the process. In Holland, we have, have data collected from all the developers. It's approved beforehand. So you can basically just tap into that database. We do it with environmental stuff, also collecting data in big public databases. So you avoid all this, uh, say, individual for each developer to do the repeat that process on and on again. And I think maybe that could also, what we do here, that could be start of it. All right. That's a really good comment. We we brought in experts that have been managing those data sets. Um, most of the information we have to do has to be turned in, has to go to the regulators first. There's usually time crunches and other challenges there. Um, however, since I'm not in the room, Bohm and Noah colleagues um, can't glare at me. But 
Um, we have been working with Boehm and NOAA, who both have extensive science and data management sides, right? If you talk about uh, all of the survey data we're collecting, for instance, the geophysical data, it's huge, huge data sets, right? So it's not, it's all quality control to the highest levels, to government standards, to industry standard, national, international standard. Um, but there's no capacity on the data management side for the government to serve that to the public, right? And so that is a different conversation, but we can't stop, unfortunately, from our perspective, the regulatory process to solve that. So we try to work with our government entities who can solve that, like NOAA IU's National Center for Environmental Intelligence and others, but, but it's been a systemic issue in the US where they haven't gotten research or operational funding to maintain data management systems to intake all of this data. So what's been done in Europe is a really novel approach and essentially setting it up in the bidding process and requiring the sustained funding source we don't have that in the US and we're kind of often having to piece that together. And when I say we, it's it's all the groups. Um, the developers are certainly at the table because we would rather have our data go and be utilized than sit on the on bone shelf um, and come out much later in the regulatory process. Um, but it's hard for us to balance how to do all of that while we're also, you know, in knee deep in a very complicated regulatory process that we have to move along to get the projects built. So we try to do it all, um, but we fortunately require some resources, um, even on our side, but government as well to get that over the over the line in the US. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Chen, you want a last comment? Okay, yeah, no, so. I feel like, you know, just follow the grants, comments, you know, I think it's showing data for them, you know, was the industry is really important. So we work in the industry. So they had, had, they had to sign the contract. So, you no, know, we've developed the wind model, developed the wind model. They have a tower for the offshore wind in New York Harbor. So we did a three months of simulation, the forecast. They compare very good for their observation, but we're not allowed to show people. So the data are not open. So then your other model are not able to use data to validate the model. So even we have a you know, wind resolving model, wind turbine resolving model with comparison, but comparison comes out very good, but we're not allowed to show because we signed the agreement. You're not allowed to open anything for public without the permission for company. That's why I think the showing data for industry really help in you know, a model development. Right. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's always a gut instinct for mm -hmm. industries. Um, it's, a, mm -hmm. you know, when they invest dollars in, mm -hmm. in anything, yeah. it's the gut instinct to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. It's 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 just what industries do. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, we are actively as offshore wind industry, many of us are working to change that. And, and I think as companies you know, companies are changing as well, but we have our other organizations. And I, you know, we are, for many years in the start of offshore wind industry, we were in the position of having to do the funding. And then all those questions come up internally where all those processes and standards happen and then what's happening with the data. But we didn't have an RWSC or a ROSA um, and, uh, and other organizations to, to push funds through where that that does no longer is an issue. The money goes in and then it's, and then the work is done. So, so I, you know, it, I, it will continue to be a topic of, of, of concern. And I think there are going to be data that um, is, is sensitive, like hub height data that we'll ha have to work through as an industry to find ways um, to leverage that data, but ensure that each developer's um, protected. <laughs> yeah, we make it sound optimal and, and perfect, like Laura said, but, you know, really, she and I work in a lot of the physics and biological data, and it, it takes years to kind of break down some of those silos. Um, but committees, committees like this, I know the Ocean Studies Board has taken this on as well. Um, government is trying to work it out and support industry and how we can do it. Um, but it's it's not perfect. Um, and like Laura said, there's a lot of considerations. And 
And there's, you know, honestly, there's been a lot of instances too where industry has been burned putting data out, or it comes with the perception that it's industry data, so it is not good. Um, and it it shows only what industry wants. So there is a push and pull that's created that kind of knee-jerk reaction that Laura speaks to, that initial knee-jerk reaction, because there is a push and pull where we deal with a lot of perception bias with, with the work and contribution that we do and the people that we fund uh, to help support us. But there is a lot of data though that is being shared. So Ruth highlighted um, some of the South Coast and I believe Atlantic Shores, but anyways, there, there, are, there are some, um, uh, yeah, there's some uh, oceanographic data. Yeah, when I was at Orsted, all the EcoPAM data was already fed into to NOAA and and, um, and all the the acoustic data, real time acoustic data is made available. So there's there's a lot of studies that actually it's actually sitting with the researchers themselves, and you know it's it's up to them to disseminate the data after they've you know finished their their research. <clears throat> Okay, this, this is a wonderful discussion, and it could probably go on for another couple of hours. But in the interest of time, <laughs> I think we'll have closed the um, the meeting for today. And before I do that, I want to thank everyone for the participation, the wonderful presentations. Um, thank uh, our online audience for hanging in there and um, for their uh, questions and participation as well. Um, also, I'd like to thank Kelly and Safa for organizing this very good workshop or meeting today. So thank you all. And uh, I'm sure as the committee begins to write its report or continues writing the report, we'll be coming back to all of you with probably questions and um, ask, uh, ask for additional input. So thank you all very much. It was the most flawless meeting ever. The organization was great. The Zoom worked. This was like unbelievable.